Chapter 14 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 14. The Baltimore Nominations. Though the compact voting body of the South had retired from the Charleston Convention, her animating spirit yet remained in the numbers and determination of the anti-Douglas debates. When on Tuesday morning, May 1st, the eighth day, the convention once more met, the Douglas men, with a view to making the most of the dilemma, resolved to force the nomination of their favorite. But there was a lion in the path. Usage and tradition had consecrated the two-thirds rule. Charles E. Stewart of Michigan tried vainly to obtain the liberal interpretation that this meant two-thirds of the votes given. But Chairman Cushing ruled remorselessly against him, and at the instant of John B. Howard of Tennessee, the convention voted, 141 to 112, that no person should be declared nominated who did not receive two-thirds of all the votes the full convention was entitled to cast. This sealed the fate of Douglas. The Electoral College numbered 303. 202 votes, therefore, were necessary to a choice. Voting for candidates was begun and continued throughout all the next day, Wednesday, May 2nd. Fifty-seven ballots were taken in all. Douglas received 145 and a half on the first, and on several subsequent ballots, his strength rose to 152 and a half. The other votes were scattered among eight different candidates with no near approach to agreement. The deadlock having become unmistakable and irremediable, and the nomination of Douglas under existing conditions impossible, all parties finally consented to an adjournment, especially as it was evident that unless this were done, the sessions would come to an end by mere disintegration. Therefore, on the tenth day, May 3rd, the Charleston Convention formally adjourned, having previously resolved to reassemble on the 18th of June in the city of Baltimore, with a recommendation that the several states make provision to fill the vacancies in their delegations. Mr. Yancey and his seceders had meanwhile organized another convention in St. Andrew's Hall. Their business was, of course, to report substantially the platform rejected by the Douglas men, and for the rejection of which they had retired. Mr. Yancey then explained to them that the adoption of this platform was all the action they proposed to take until the rump democracy should make their nomination, when, he said, it may be our privilege to endorse the nominee or our duty to proceed to make a nomination. Other seceders were more impatient and desired that something be done forthwith. But as the sessions were continued to the second and third day, their overflowing zeal found a safety valve in their speeches. Mr. Yancey's program prevailed and they also adjourned to meet again in Richmond on the 11th of June. At the time of the disruption, rumors were current in Charleston that the movement, if not prompted, was at least encouraged and sustained by telegrams from leading senators and representatives then at their congressional duties in Washington. As the day for reassembling in Baltimore drew near, the main fact was abundantly proved by the publication of an address signed by Jefferson Davis, Toombs, Iverson, Slidell, Benjamin, Mason, and some 14 others in which they undertook to point out a path to union and harmony in the Democratic Party. They recited the withdrawal of eight states at Charleston and endorsed the step without qualification. We cannot refrain, said the address, from expressing our admiration and approval of this lofty manifestation of adherence to principle, rising superior to all considerations of expediency, to all trammels of party, and looking with an eye single to the defense of the constitutional rights of the states. 
They then alleged that the other Democratic states remained in the convention only to make a further effort to secure some satisfactory recognition of sound principles, declaring, however, their determination also to withdraw if their just expectations should be disappointed. The address then urged that the seceders should defer their meeting at Richmond, but that they should come to Baltimore and endeavor to effect a reconciliation of differences on a basis of principle. If the Baltimore Convention should adopt a satisfactory platform of principles, and their votes might help secure it, then cause of dissension would have ceased. On the other hand, continued the address, if the Convention on Reassembling at Baltimore shall disappoint the just expectations of the remaining Democratic states, their delegations cannot fail to withdraw and unite with the eight states which have adjourned to Richmond. The address in another paragraph explained that the 17 Democratic states which had voted at Charleston for the seceders' platform, united with Pennsylvania alone, comprise a majority of the entire electoral vote of the United States able to elect the Democratic nominees against the combined opposition of all the remaining states. This was a shrewd and crafty appeal. Under an apparent plea for harmony lurked an insidious invitation to Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky, California, Oregon, and Pennsylvania to join the seceders, reconstruct the Democratic Party, cut off all the popular sovereignty recusants, and secure perpetual ascendancy in national politics through the consolidated South. The signers of this address forgetting their own constant accusation of sectionalism against the Republicans, pretended to see no impropriety in proposing this purely selfish and sectional alliance. If it succeeded, their triumph in the Union was irresistible and permanent. If it failed, it served to unite the South for secession and a slave confederacy. If any Democrat harbored a doubt that the proposed reconciliation meant simply a reunion on the Davis-Yancey platform, the doubt was soon removed. In the Senate of the United States, Jefferson Davis was pressing to a vote his caucus resolutions, submitted in February to serve as a model for the Charleston platform, and this brought on a final discussion between himself and Douglas. Davis had begun the debate on the 7th of May by a savage onslaught on squatter sovereignty, a fallacy, he said, fraught with mischief more deadly than the fatal upas, because it spread its poison over the whole Union. Douglas took up the gauntlet and, replying on May 15th and 16th, said he could not recognize the right of a caucus of the Senate or the House to prescribe new tests for the Democratic Party. Senators were not chosen for the purpose of making platforms. That was the duty of the Charleston Convention, and it had decided in his favor, platform organization, and least of all the individual, by giving him a majority of 50 votes over all the other candidates combined. He reprobated the ANSI movement as leading to dissolution and a Southern Confederacy. The party rejected this caucus platform. Should the majority, he asked, surrender to the minority? Davis replying on the 17th, contended that Douglas had, on the Kansas policy of the administration, put himself outside the Democratic organization. He desired no divided flag for the party. He preferred that the senator's banner should lie in its silken folds to feed the moth. But if it impatiently rustles to be unfurled in opposition to ours, we will plant our own on every hill. Douglas retorted and again attacked the caucus dictation. Why, he asked, are all the great measures for the public good made to give place to the emergency of passing some abstract resolutions on the subject of politics to reverse the Democratic platform under the supposition that the representatives of the people are men of weak nerve who are going to be frightened by the thunders of the Senate chamber? Davis rejoined, that they wanted a new article in the creed because they could not get an honest construction of the platform as it stood. 
If you have been beaten on a rickety, double-constructed platform, kick it to pieces and lay one broad and strong on which men can stand. We want nothing more than a simple declaration that Negro slaves are property, and we want the recognition of the obligation of the federal government to protect that property like all other. A somewhat restrained undertone of personal temper had been running through the debate, and Jefferson Davis could not resist an expression of contempt for his opponent. The fact is, said he, I have a declining respect for platforms. I would sooner have an honest man on any sort of a rickety platform that you could construct than to have a man I did not trust on the best platform which could be made. Douglas promptly called attention to the inconsistency of Davis's method of forcing his resolutions with one breath and avowing his indifference to a platform with another, especially as Yancey and his own followers had seceded on the platform and not on the man but he did not press his adversary to the wall, as he might have done, on the insincerity which Davis's sneer exposed. He was hampered by his own attitude as a candidate. Douglas, who had received 150 votes at Charleston and who expected the whole of at Baltimore, could not let his tongue wag as freely as Davis, who had received only one vote and a half at Charleston and could count on none at Baltimore else he might have denounced him on the score of patriotism. For Jefferson Davis, like Yancey, only not so constantly, and like so many others of that secession coterie, blew hot and cold about disunion as occasion demanded. The same debate of May 17 furnished an instructive example. In the beginning of the day's discussion, Davis indulged in a repetition of the old alarm cry. And so, sir, when we declare our tenacious adherence to the Union, it is the Union of the Constitution. If the compact between the states is to be trampled into the dust, if anarchy is to be substituted for the usurpation which threatened the government at an earlier period, if the Union is to become powerless for the purposes for which it was established, and we are vainly to appeal to it for protection, then, sir, conscious of the rectitude of our course and self-reliant within ourselves, we look beyond the confines of the Union for the maintenance of our rights. But after Douglas had made a damaging exposure of Yancey's disunion intrigues, which had come to light, and had charged their animus on the Charleston seceders, Davis changed his tone. He said there were not more than 75 men in the lodge of the Southern Leagues, he did not think the Union was in danger from them. I have great confidence, said he, in the strength of the Union. Every now and then I hear that it is about to tumble to pieces, that somebody is going to introduce a new plank into the platform, and if he does, the Union must tumble down, until at last I begin to think it is such a rickety old platform that it is impossible to prop it up. But then I bring my own judgment to bear, instead of relying on witnesses, and I come to the conclusion that the Union is strong and safe, strong in its power, as well as in the affections of the people. The debate made it very plain that it was not reconciliation, but domination which the South wanted. So in due time, May 25th, the Jefferson Davis resolutions affirming the property theory and the protection doctrine were passed by a large majority of the Democratic senators. When the Charleston Convention proper reassembled at Baltimore, it was seen that the program laid out by Jefferson Davis and others in their published address had been adopted. The seceders had met at Richmond, taken a recess, and now appeared at Baltimore making application for readmission. But some of the states that withdrew at Charleston had sent contesting delegations and it resolved itself into tangled rivalry and quarrel of platforms, candidates, and delegations all combined. For four days, a furious debate raged in the convention during the day, while rival mass meetings in the streets at night called each other disorganizers, bolters, traitors, disunionists, and abolitionists. When Douglas, before a test vote was reached, 
sent a dispatch suggesting that the party and the country might be saved by dropping his name and uniting upon some other candidate, his followers suppressed the dispatch. On the fifth day at Baltimore, the Democratic National Convention underwent its second crisis and suffered its second disruption. This time, the secession was somewhat broadened. Chairman Cushing resigned his seat, and Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and California withdrew wholly or in part to join the states which had gone out at Charleston. For the time, the disunion extremists were keeping their scheme too well masked for us to establish clearly its historical record. But the signs and footprints of their underplot are evident. Here at Baltimore, as at Charleston, and as on every critical occasion, Mr. Yancey was conspicuously present. Here, as elsewhere, he was no doubt persistently intriguing for disunion in secret while ostentatiously denying disunion purposes in public. But little remained to do after the disruption at Baltimore, and that little was quickly done. The fragments of the original convention continued their session in the Front Street Theater, where they had met, and on the first ballot nominated Stephen A. Douglas for president by an almost unanimous vote. The seceders organized under the chairmanship of Caleb Cushing in Maryland Institute Hall, and also by a nearly unanimous ballot nominated as their candidate for president, John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. Then Mr. Yancey, who in a street mass meeting had declared that he was neither for the union per se, nor for disunion per se, but for the Constitution, announced that the democracy, the Constitution, and through them, the were yet safe. A month prior to the reassembling of the Charleston rumps above described, Baltimore had already witnessed another presidential convention and nomination, calling itself peculiarly national, in contradistinction to the sectional character which it charged upon the Democratic and Republican parties alike. This was a third party, made up mainly of former Whigs whose long-cherished party antagonisms kept them aloof from the Democrats in the South and the Republicans in the North. In the South, they had been men whose moderate anti-slavery feelings were outraged by the repeal of the Missouri Compromise and the Lecompton Trick. In the North, they were those whose traditions and affiliations revolted at the extreme utterances of avowed abolitionists. In both regions, many of them had embraced know-nothingism more as an alternative than from original choice. The Whig party was dissolved. Know-nothingism had utterly failed. Their only resource was to form a new party. In the various states they had, since the defeat of Fillmore in 1856, held together a minority organization under names differing in separate localities. All these various factions and fragments sent delegations to Baltimore, where they united themselves under the designation of the Constitutional Union Party. They proposed to take a middle course between Democrats and Republicans, and to allay sectional strife by ignoring the slavery question. Delegates of this party, regular and irregular, from some 22 states, convened at Baltimore on the 9th of May. John J. Crittenden of Kentucky called the meeting to order, and Washington Hunt of New York was made temporary and permanent chairman. On Thursday, May 10th, they adopted as their platform a resolution declaring in substance that they would recognize no other political principle than the constitution of the country, the union of the states, and the enforcement of the laws. They had no reasonable hope of direct success at the polls in November, but they had a clear possibility of defeating a popular choice and throwing the election into the House of Representatives. And in that case, their nominee might stand on high vantage ground as a compromise candidate. This possibility gave some zest to the rivalry among their several aspirants. On their second ballot, 
a slight preponderance of votes indicated John Bell of Tennessee as the favorite, and the convention made his nomination unanimous. Mr. Bell had many qualities desirable in a candidate for president. He was a statesman of ripe experience and of fair, if not brilliant, fame. Though from the South, his course on the slavery question had been so moderate as to make him reasonably acceptable to the North on his mere personal record. He had opposed the repeal of the Missouri Compromise and the Lecompton Outrage. But upon this platform of ignoring the political strife of six consecutive years, in which he had himself taken such vigorous part, he and his followers were, of course, but as grain between the upper and nether millstones, Edward Everett, one of the most eminent statesmen and scholars of New England, was nominated for vice president. This party becomes historic, not through what it accomplished, but by reason of what a portion of it failed to perform. Within one year from these pledges to the Constitution, the Union, and the enforcement of the laws, Mr. Bell and most of his Southern adherents in the seceding states were banded with others in open rebellion. On the other hand, Mr. Everett and most of the Northern members, together with many noble exceptions in the border slave states, like Mr. Crittenden of Kentucky, kept the faith announced in their platform, and with patriotic devotion supported the government in the war to maintain the Union. End of chapter 14. Read by Sheila Blunt. Chapter 15. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 15. The Chicago Convention. In recognition of the growing power and importance of the Great West, the Republican National Convention was called to meet in Chicago on the 16th of May. The former presidential canvass, though resulting in the defeat of Fremont, had nevertheless shown the remarkable popular strength of the Republican Party in the country at large. Since then, its double victory in Congress against Lecompton and at the congressional elections over the representatives who supported Lecompton gave it confidence and aggressive activity. But now it received a new inspiration and impetus from the Charleston disruption. Former possibility was suddenly changed to strong probability of success in the coming presidential election. Delegates were not only quickened with a new zeal for their principles, the growing chances spurred them to fresh efforts in behalf of their favorite candidates. Those who had been prominently named were diverse in antecedents and varied in locality, each, however, presenting some strong point of popular interest. Seward of New York, a Whig of preeminent fame, Chase of Ohio, a talented and zealous anti-slavery Democrat, an original founder of the new party, Dayton of New Jersey, an old Whig high in personal worth and political service, Cameron of Pennsylvania, a former Democrat, now the undisputed leader of an influential tariff state, Bates of Missouri, an able and popular anti-slavery Whig from a slave state, and last, but by no means least in popular estimation, Lincoln of Illinois. The idea of making Lincoln a presidential candidate had occurred to the minds of many during his growing fame. The principle of natural selection plays no unimportant part in the politics of the United States. There are always hundreds of newspapers ready to nail to the masthead the name of any individual which begins to appear frequently in dispatches and editorials. A few months after the close of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and long before the Ohio speeches and the Cooper Institute address, a warm personal friend, the editor of an Illinois newspaper, 
wrote him an invitation to lecture, and added in his letter, I would like to have a talk with you on political matters, as to the policy of announcing your name for the presidency while you are in our city. My partner and myself are about addressing the Republican editors of the state on the subject of a simultaneous announcement of your name for the presidency. To this, Lincoln replied, As to the other matter you kindly mention, I must in candor say I do not think myself fit for the presidency. I certainly am flattered and gratified that some partial friends think of me in that connection, but I really think it best for our cause that no concerted effort such as you suggest should be made. A much more hopeful ambition filled his mind. Notwithstanding his recent defeat, he did not think that his personal contest with Douglas was yet finished. He had the faith and the patience to wait six years for a chance to repeat his political tournament with the little giant. From his letter quoted in a previous chapter, we know he had resolved to fight in the ranks in 1860. From another, we know how generously he kept faith with other Republican aspirants. If Trumbull and I were candidates for the same office, you would have a right to prefer him, and I should not blame you for it but all my acquaintance with you induces me to believe you would not pretend to be for me while really for him. But I do not understand Trumbull and myself to be rivals. You know I am pledged not to enter a struggle with him for the seat in the Senate now occupied by him, and yet I would rather have a full term in the Senate than in the presidency. This spirit of fairness in politics is also shown by the following letter written apparently in response to a suggestion that Cameron and Lincoln might form a popular presidential ticket. Yours of the 24th, ultimate, was forwarded to me from Chicago. It certainly is important to secure Pennsylvania for the Republicans in the next presidential contest, but not unimportant to also secure Illinois. As to the ticket you name. I shall be heartily for it after it shall have been fairly nominated by a Republican National Convention, and I cannot be committed to it before. For my single self, I have enlisted for the permanent success of the Republican cause, and for this object I shall labor faithfully in the ranks, unless, as I think not probable, the judgment of the party shall assign me a different position. If the Republicans of the great state of Pennsylvania shall present Mr. Cameron as their candidate for the presidency. Such an endorsement of his fitness for the place could scarcely be deemed insufficient. Still, as I would not like the public to know, so I would not like myself to know, I had entered a combination with any man to the prejudice of all others whose friends, respectively, may consider them preferable. Not long after these letters, at some date near the middle of the winter, 1859-60, to 60, the leaders of the Republican Party of Illinois met at Springfield, the capital of the state, and in a more pressing and formal manner requested him to permit them to use his name as a presidential candidate, more with the idea of securing his nomination for vice president than with any further expectation. To this he now consented, his own characteristic language, however, plainly reveals that he believed this would be useful to him in his future senatorial aspirations solely, and that he built no hopes whatever on national preferment. A quarrel was going on among rival aspirants to the Illinois governorship, and Lincoln had written a letter to relieve a friend from the imputation of treachery to him in the recent senatorial contest. This act of justice was now used to his disadvantage in the scramble for the Illinois presidential delegates. And he wrote as follows. I am not in a position where it would hurt much for me not to be nominated on the national ticket, but I am where it would hurt some for me not to get the Illinois delegates. What I expected when I wrote the letter to Messrs. Dole and others is now happening. Your discomfited assailants are more bitter against me, and they will, for revenge upon me, lay to the Bates' egg in the South, 
and to the Seward egg in the north, and go far towards squeezing me out in the middle with nothing. Can you not help me a little in this matter in your end of the vineyard? The extra vigilance of his friends thus invoked, it turned out that the Illinois Republicans sent a delegation to the Chicago Convention full of personal devotion to Lincoln and composed of men of the highest standing and of consummate political ability. And their enthusiastic efforts in his behalf among the delegations from other states contributed largely to the final result. The political campaign had now so far taken shape that its elements and chances could be calculated with more than usual accuracy. The Charleston Convention had been disrupted on the 30th of April and adjourned on May 3rd. The nomination of John Bell by the Constitutional Union Party occurred on May 10th. The Chicago Convention met on May 16th, and while there was at that date great uncertainty as to whom the deserved fragments in, of the Democratic Party would finally nominate, little doubt existed that both the Douglas and Buchanan wings would have candidates in the field. With their opponents thus divided, the plain policy of the Republicans was to find a candidate on whom a thorough and hearty union of all the elements of the opposition could be secured. The party was constituted of somewhat heterogeneous material. A lingering antagonism remained between former Whigs and Democrats, protectionists, and free traders, foreign-born citizens, and know-nothings. Only on a single point were all thus far agreed, opposition to the extension of slavery. But little calculation was needed to show that at the November polls, four doubtful states would decide the presidential contest. Buchanan had been elected in 1856 by the vote of all the slave states, save Maryland, with the help of the free states of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois, and California. Change the first four, or even the first three of these free states to the Republican side, and they, with the Fremont states of 1856, would elect the president against all the others combined. The congressional elections of 1858 demonstrated that such a change was possible. But besides this, Pennsylvania and Indiana were, like Ohio, known as October states because they held elections for state officers in that month, and they would at that early date give such an indication of sentiment as would forecast their November vote for president and exert a powerful, perhaps a decisive, influence on the whole canvas. What candidate could most easily carry New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Illinois became therefore the vital question among the Chicago delegates and especially among the delegates from the four pivotal states themselves. William H. Seward of New York was naturally the leading candidate. He had been longest in public life and was highest in official rank. He had been governor of the greatest state of the Union and had nearly completed a second term of service in the United States Senate. Once a prominent Whig, his antecedents coincided with those of the bulk of the Republican Party. His experience ran through two great agitations of the slavery question. He had taken important part in the Senate discussions, which ended in the compromise measures of 1850 and in the new contest growing out of the Nebraska bill his voice had been heard in every debate. He was not only firm in his anti-slavery convictions, but decided in his utterances. Discussing the admission of California, he proclaimed the Higher Law Doctrine in 1850. Reviewing Dred Scott and Lecompton, he announced the Irrepressible Conflict in 1858. He had tact as well as talent. He was a consummate politician as well as a profound statesman. Such a leader could not fail of a strong following and his supporters came to Chicago in such numbers and of such prominence and character as seemed to make his nomination a foregone conclusion. 
the delegation from New York, headed by William M. Everts, worked and voted throughout as a unit for him, not merely to carry out their constituents' wishes, but with a personal zeal that omitted no exertion or sacrifice. They showed a want of tact, however, in carrying their street demonstrations for their favorite to excess. They crowded together at the Richmond House, making that hotel the Seward headquarters. With too much ostentation, they marched every day to the convention with music and banners. And when mention was made of doubtful states, their more headlong members talked together too much of the campaign funds they intended to raise. All this occasioned a reaction, a certain mental protest among both Eastern and Western delegates against what have come to be characterized as machine methods. The positive elements in Seward's character and career had developed, as always happens, strong antagonisms. One of the earliest symptoms among the delegates at Chicago was the existence of a strong undercurrent of opposition to his nomination. This opposition was as yet latent and scattered here and there among many state delegations, but very intense, silently watching its opportunity and ready to combine upon any of the other candidates. The opposition soon made a discovery that of all the names mentioned, Lincoln's was the only one offering any chance for such a combination. It needed only the slightest comparison of notes to show that Dayton had no strength save the New Jersey vote. Chase, little outside of the Ohio delegation, Cameron, none but that of Pennsylvania, and that Bates had only his Missouri friends and a few in border slave states, which could cast no electoral vote for the Republicans. The policy of the anti-Seward delegates was therefore quickly developed to use Lincoln's popularity as a means to defeat Seward. The credit of the nomination is claimed by many men and by several delegations, but every such claim is wholly fictitious. Lincoln was chosen not by personal intrigue, but through political necessity. The Republican Party was a purely defensive organization. The South had created the crisis, which the new party was compelled to overcome. The ascendancy of the free states, not the personal fortunes of Seward, hung in the balance. Political victory at the ballot box, or a transformation of the institutions of government, was the immediate alternative before the free states. Victory could be secured only by help of the electoral votes of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Illinois. It was therefore a simple problem. What candidate could carry these states? None could answer this question so well as their own delegates, and these, when interrogated, still further reduced the problem by the reply that Seward certainly could not. These four states lay on the borderland next to the South and to slavery. Institutions inevitably mold public sentiment, and a certain tenderness towards the property of neighbors and friends infected their people. They shrunk from the reproach of being abolitionized. They would vote for a conservative Republican, but Seward and radicalism and higher law would bring them inevitable defeat. Who then could carry these doubtful pivotal states? The second branch of the question also found its ready answer. The contest in these states would be not against a territorial slave code, but against popular sovereignty, not with Buchanan's candidate, but with Douglas. And for Douglas, there was only a single antagonist, tried and true, Abraham Lincoln. Such, we may reasonably infer, was the substance of the discussion and argument which ran through the caucus room of the delegates day and night during the 16th and 17th of May. Meanwhile, the Seward men were not idle, Having the large New York delegation to begin with, and counting the many positive committals from other states, their strength and organization seemed impregnable. The opposing delegations, each still nursing the chances of its own candidate, 
hesitated to give any positive promises to each other. At midnight of May 17th, Horace Greeley, one of Seward's strongest opponents, and perhaps better informed than any other single delegate, telegraphed his conclusion that the opposition to Governor Seward cannot concentrate on any candidate and that he will be nominated. Chicago was already a city of a hundred thousand souls, thirty to forty thousand visitors, full of life, hope, ambition, most of them from the progressive group of encircling northwestern states, and strung to the highest tension of political excitement had come to attend the convention. Charleston had shown a great party in the ebb tide of disintegration, tainted by the spirit of disunion. Chicago exhibited a great party springing to life and power, every motive and force compelling cooperation and growth. The rush and spirit of the great city, and the enthusiasm and hope of its visitors, blended and reacted upon each other as if by laws of chemical affinity. Something of the freshness and sweep of the prairie winds exhilarated the delegates and animated the convention. No building in the city of Chicago at that time contained a hall with sufficient room for the sittings of the great assemblage. A temporary frame structure, which the Committee of Arrangements christened the Wigwam, was therefore designated and erected for this special use. It was said to be large enough to hold 10,000 persons, and whether or not that estimate was entirely accurate, a prodigious concourse certainly gathered each day within its walls. The first day session, May 16th, demonstrated the successful adaptation of the structure to its uses. Participants and spectators alike were delighted with the ease of ingress and egress, the comfortable division of space, the perfection of its acoustic qualities. Every celebrity could be seen, every speech could be heard. The routine of organization, the choice of officers and committees, and the presentation of credentials were full of variety and zest. Governor Edwin D. Morgan of New York, as chairman of the National Republican Committee, called the convention to order, and when he presented the historic name of David Wilmot of Pennsylvania for temporary chairman, the faith of the audience in the judgment of the managers was already won. The report of the Committee on Organization in the afternoon made George Ashman of Massachusetts a most skillful parliamentarian, ready in decision and felicitous in his phrases, the permanent presiding officer. One thing was immediately and specially manifest. An overflowing heartiness and deep feeling pervaded the whole house. No need of a clack, no room for sham demonstration here. The galleries were as watchful and earnest as the platform. There was something genuine, elemental, uncontrollable in the moods and manifestations of the vast audience. Seats and standing room were always packed in advance, and as the delegates entered by their own separate doors, the crowd easily distinguished the chief actors. Blair, Giddings, Greeley, Everts, Kelly, Wilmot, Schurz, and others were greeted with spontaneous applause, which, rising at some one point, grew and rolled from side to side and corner to corner of the immense building brightening the eyes and quickening the breath of every inmate. With the second day's proceedings, the interest of delegates and spectators was visibly increased, first by some sharp shooting speeches about credentials, and secondly by the main event of the day, the report from the platform committee. Much difficulty was expected on this score but a little time had smoothed the way with almost magical effect. The great outpouring of delegates and people, the self-evident success of the gathering, the harmonious, almost joyous beginning of the deliberations in the first day session were more convincing than logic in solidifying the party. These were the premonitions of success. Before such signs of victory, all spirit of faction was fused into a generous glow of emulation. The eager convention would have accepted a weak or defective platform. 
The committee, on the contrary, reported one framed with remarkable skill. It is only needful to recapitulate its chief points. It denounced disunion, Lecomptonism, the property theory, the dogma that the Constitution carries slavery to territories, the reopening of the slave trade, the popular sovereignty and non-intervention fallacies, and denied the authority of Congress, of a territorial legislature, or of any individuals to give legal existence to slavery in any territory of the United States. It opposed any change in the naturalization laws. It recommended an adjustment of import duties to encourage the industrial interests of the whole country. It advocated the immediate admission of Kansas, free homesteads to actual settlers, river and harbor improvements of a national character, and a railroad to the Pacific Ocean. Bold on points of common agreement, it was unusually successful in avoiding points of controversy among its followers, or offering points for criticism to its enemies. It is not surprising that Charleston and Chicago should furnish many striking contrasts. At the Charleston Convention, the principal personal incident was a long and frank speech from one Galden, a Savannah slave trader, in advocacy of the reopening of the African slave trade. In the Chicago Convention, the exact and extreme opposite of such a theme created one of the most interesting of the debates. The platform had been read and received with tremendous cheers. When Mr. Giddings of Ohio, who was everywhere eager to insist upon what he designated as the primal truths of the Declaration of Independence, moved to amend the first resolution by incorporating in it the phrase which announces the right of all men to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The convention was impatient to adopt the platform without change. Several delegates urged objections, one of them pertinently observing that there were also many other truths enunciated in the Declaration of Independence. Mr. President, said he, I believe in the Ten Commandments, but I do not want them in a political platform. Mr. Giddings' amendment was voted down, and the anti-slavery veteran, feeling himself wounded in his most cherished philosophy, rose and walked out of the convention. Personal friends grieved that he should feel offended and doubly sorry that the general harmony should be marred by even a single dissent, followed Mr. Giddings and sought to change his purpose. While thus persuading him, the discussion had passed to the second resolution, when George William Curtis of New York seized the chance to renew substantially Mr. Giddings' amendment. There were new objections, but Mr. Curtis swept them away with a captivating burst of oratory. I have to ask this convention, said he, whether they are prepared to go upon the record before the country as voting down the words of the Declaration of Independence. I rise simply to ask gentlemen to think well before, upon the free prairies of the West, in the summer of 1860, they dare to wince and quail before the assertions of the men of Philadelphia in 1776, before they dare to shrink from repeating the words that these great men enunciated. This was a strong appeal, and took the convention by storm, wrote a recording journalist, a new vote formally embodied this portion of the Declaration of Independence in the Republican platform, and Mr. Giddings, overjoyed at his triumph, had already returned to his seat when the platform as a whole was adopted with repeated and renewed shouts of applause that seemed to shake the wigwam. The third day of the convention, Friday, May 18th, found the doors besieged by an excited multitude. The preliminary business was disposed of. The platform was made, and everyone knew the balloting would begin. The New York delegation felt assured of Seward's triumph and made an effort to have its march to the convention with banners and music, unusually full and imposing. It proved a costly display, for while the New York irregulars were parading the streets, the Illinoisians were filling the wigwam. When the Seward procession arrived, 
there was little room left except the reserved seats for the delegates. New York deceived itself in another respect. It counted on the full New England strength, whereas more than half of it had already resolved to cast its vote elsewhere. This defection in advance virtually ensured Seward's defeat. New York and the extreme Northwest were not sufficiently strong to nominate him, and in the nature of things he could not hope for much help from the conservative middle and border states. But this calculation could not as yet be so accurately made. Caucusing was active up to the very hour when the convention met, and many delegations went to the wigwam with no definite program beyond the first ballot. What pen shall adequately describe this vast audience of 10,000 souls, the low wave-like roar of its ordinary conversation, the rolling cheers that greeted the entrance of popular favorites, the solemn hush which fell upon it during the opening prayer? There was just enough of some unexpected preliminary wrangle and delay to arouse the full impatience of both convention and spectator. But at length, the names of candidates were announced. This ceremony was still in its simplicity. The more recent custom of short dramatic speeches from conspicuous and popular orators to serve as electrifying preludes had not yet been invented. I take the liberty, said Mr. Everts of New York, to name as a candidate to be nominated by this convention for the office of President of the United States, William H. Seward. I desire, followed Mr. Judd, on behalf of the delegation from Illinois to put in nomination as a candidate for President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln of Illinois. Then came the usual succession of possible and alternative aspirants who were to be complimented by the first votes of their states. William L. Dayton, Simon Cameron, Salmon P. Chase, Edward Bates, Jacob Colomer, John McLean. The fifteen minutes required by this formality had already indisputably marked out and set apart the real contestants. The complimentary statesmen were lustily cheered by their respective state delegations, but at the names of Seward and Lincoln, the whole wigwam seemed to respond together. There is something irresistibly exciting in the united voice of a great crowd. For a moment, the struggle appeared to resolve itself into a contest of throats and lungs. Indiana seconded the nomination of Lincoln, and the applause was deafening. Michigan seconded the nomination of Seward. The New York delegation rose en masse, waved their hats, and joined the galleries in a shout which doubled the volume of any yet given. Then a portion of the Ohio delegates once more seconded Lincoln and his adherents, feeling themselves put upon their mettle, made an effort. I thought the Seward yell could not be surpassed, wrote a spectator, but the Lincoln boys were clearly ahead, and feeling their victory, as there was a lull in the storm, took deep breaths all round and gave a concerted shriek that was positively awful and accompanied it with stamping that made every plank and pillar in the building quiver. The tumult gradually died away, and balloting began. Here we may note another contrast. The Charleston Convention was reactionary and exclusive. It followed the two-thirds rule. The Chicago Convention was progressive and liberal. It adopted majority rule. Liberal even beyond this, it admitted the territories and border slave states containing only a minority or fraction of Republican sentiment to seats and to votes. It was throwing a dragnet for success. Under different circumstances, these sentimental delegations might have become powerful in intrigue, but dominated as they were by deeper political forces, they afforded no distinct advantage to either candidate. Though it was not expected to be decisive, the first ballot foreshadowed accurately the final result. The complimentary candidates received the tribute of admiration from their respective states. Vermont voted for Calamer and New Jersey for Dayton, each solid. Pennsylvania's compliment to Cameron was shorn of six votes, four of which went at once for Lincoln. 
Ohio divided her complement, 34 for Chase, 4 for McLean, and at once gave Lincoln her remaining eight votes. Missouri voted solid for her candidate. Bates, who also received a scattering tribute from other delegations. But all these compliments were of little avail to their recipients, for far above each tower the aggregates of the leading candidates. Seward, 173.5. Lincoln, 102. In the groundswell of suppressed excitement which pervaded the convention, there was no time to analyze this vote. Nevertheless, delegates and spectators felt the full force of its premonition. To all who desired the defeat of Seward, it pointed out the winning man with unerring certainty. Another little wrangle over some disputed and protesting delegate made the audience almost furious at the delay, and call the roll sounded from a thousand throats. A second ballot was begun at last, and obeying a force as sure as the law of gravitation, the former complimentary votes came rushing to Lincoln. The whole ten votes of Colomer, 44 from Cameron, 6 from Chase and McLean, were now cast for him, followed by a scatter of additions along the roll call. In this ballot, Lincoln gained 79 votes, Seward only 11. The faces of the New York delegation whitened as the balloting progressed and the torrent of Lincoln's popularity became a river. The result of the second ballot was Seward, 184.5, Lincoln, 181, scattering, 99.5. When the vote of Lincoln was announced, there was tremendous burst of applause, which the chairman prudently but with difficulty controlled and silenced. The third ballot was begun amid a breathless suspense. Hundreds of pencils kept pace with the roll call and nervously marked the changes on their tally sheets. The Lincoln figures steadily grew. Votes came to him from all the other candidates, four and a half from Seward, two from Cameron, 13 from Bates, 18 from Chase, nine from Dayton, three from McLean, one from Clay. Lincoln had gained fifty and a half. Seward had lost four and a half. Long before the official tellers footed up their columns, spectators and delegates rapidly made the reckoning and knew the result. Lincoln, 231 and a half. Seward, 180. Counting the scattered votes, 465 ballots had been cast and 233 were necessary to a choice. Only one and a half votes more were needed to make a nomination. A profound stillness suddenly fell upon the wigwam. The men ceased to talk and the ladies to flutter their fans. One could distinctly hear the scratching of pencils and the ticking of telegraph instruments on the reporters' tables. No announcement had been made by the chair. Changes were in order, and it was only a question of seconds who should speak first. While everyone was leaning forward in intense expectancy, David K. Carter sprang upon his chair and reported a change of four Ohio votes from Chase to Lincoln. There was a moment's pause. A teller waved his tally sheet toward the skylight and shouted a name, and then the boom of a cannon on the roof of the wigwam announced the nomination to the crowds in the streets, where shouts and salutes took up and spread the news. In the convention, the Lincoln River now became an inundation. Amid the wildest hurrahs, delegation after delegation changed its vote to the victor. A graceful custom prevails in orderly American conventions that the chairman of the vanquished delegation is first to greet the nominee with a short address of party fealty and promise of party support. Mr. Everts, the spokesman for New York, essayed promptly to perform this courteous office but was delayed while by the enthusiasm and confusion. The din at length subsided 
and the presiding officer announced that on the third ballot Abraham Lincoln of Illinois received 364 votes and is selected as your candidate for President of the United States. Then Mr. Everts, in a voice of unconcealed emotion, but with admirable dignity and touching eloquence, speaking for Seward and for New York, moved to make the nomination unanimous. The interest in a national convention usually ceases with the announcement of the principal nomination. It was only afterwards that the delegates realized how fortunate a selection they made by adding Hannibal Hamlin of Maine to the ticket as candidate for vice president. Mr. Hamlin was already distinguished in public service. He was born in 1809 and became a lawyer by profession. He served many years in the Maine legislature and four years as a representative in Congress. In 1848, he was chosen to fill a vacancy in the United States Senate and in 1851 was re-elected for a full term. When in 1856... The Cincinnati Convention endorsed the repeal of the Missouri Compromise, which he had opposed. Mr. Hamlin formally withdrew from the Democratic Party. In November of that year, the Republicans elected him governor of Maine, and in January 1857, re-elected him United States Senator. For the moment, the chief self-congratulation of the convention was that by the nomination of Lincoln it had secured the doubtful vote of the conservative states. Or rather, perhaps, might it be said that it was hardly the work of the delegates. It was the concurrent product of popular wisdom. Political evolution had with scientific precision wrought the survival of the fittest. The delegates leaving Chicago on the various homeward-bound railroad trains that night saw that already the enthusiasm of the convention was transferred from the wigwam to the country. At every station, where there was a village, until after two o'clock, there were tar barrels burning, drums beating, boys carrying rails, and guns great and small banging away. The weary passengers were allowed no rest, but plagued by the thundering of the cannon, the clamor of drums, the glare of bonfires, and the whooping of boys, who were delighted with the idea of a candidate for the presidency who 30 years before split rails on the Sangamon River, classic stream, now and forevermore, and whose neighbors named him Honest. This is the end of Chapter 15. Recorded by Sheila Blunt. Chapter 16 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 16. Lincoln Elected. Thus, the presidential canvass in the United States for the year 1860 began with the very unusual condition of four considerable parties, and four different tickets for president and vice president. In the order of popular strength, as afterwards shown, they were, first, the Republican Party, which at the Chicago Convention had nominated as its candidate for president Abraham Lincoln of Illinois, and for Vice President Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. Its animating spirit was a belief and declaration that the institution of slavery was wrong in morals and detrimental to society. Its avowed policy was to restrict slavery to its present limits in the states where it existed by virtue of local constitutions and laws. Second, the Douglas Wing of the Democratic Party, which at Baltimore nominated Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois for president, and whose candidate for vice president was Herschel V. Johnson of Georgia. It declared indifference as to the moral right or wrong of slavery, and indifference to its restriction or extension. Its avowed policy was to permit the people of a territory to decide whether they would prevent or establish slavery, and it further proposed to abide by the decisions of the Supreme Court on all questions of constitutional law growing out of it. Third, 
the Buchanan wing of the Democratic Party, which at Baltimore nominated John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky for president and Joseph Lane of Oregon for vice president. Its animating spirit was a belief and declaration that slavery was morally right and politically beneficial. Its avowed policy was the extension of slavery into territories and the creation of new slave states whereby it might protect and perpetuate itself by a preponderance or at least a constant equality of political power, especially in the Senate of the United States. As one means to this end, it proposed the immediate acquisition of the island of Cuba. Fourth, the Constitutional Party, which at its convention in Baltimore nominated John Bell of Tennessee for president and Edward Everett of Massachusetts for vice president. It professed to ignore the question of slavery and declared that it would recognize no political principle other than the constitution of the country, the union of the states, and the enforcement of the laws. The first, most striking feature of the four-sided presidential canvas which now began was the personal pledge by every one of the candidates of devotion to the Union. Each of the factions was in some form charging disunion motives or tendencies upon all or part of the others, but each indignantly denied the allegation as to itself. To leave no possible doubt, the written letters of acceptance of each of the candidates emphasized the point. Lincoln invoked the inviolability of the Constitution and the perpetual union, harmony, and prosperity of all. Douglas made his pledge broad and full. The federal union, he wrote, must be preserved. The Constitution must be maintained, inviolate in all parts. Every right guaranteed by the Constitution must be protected in law in all cases where legislation is necessary to its enjoyment. The judicial authority, as provided in the Constitution, must be sustained, and its decisions implicitly obeyed and faithfully executed. The laws must be administered, in the constituted authorities upheld, and all unlawful resistance to these things must be put down with the firmness, impartiality, and fidelity. The Constitution and the equality of the states, wrote Breckinridge, these are symbols of everlasting union. Let these be the rallying cries of the people. Bell declared that if elected, all his ability, strength of will, and official influence should be employed for the maintenance of the Constitution and the Union against all opposing influences and tendencies. Even President Buchanan, in a little campaign speech from the portico of the executive mansion, hastened to purge himself of the imputation of suspicion or fear on this point. He declared that neither of the Democratic conventions was regular, and therefore every Democrat was at liberty to vote as he thought proper. For himself, he preferred Beckenridge. The Democratic Party, when divided for the moment, has always closed up its ranks and become more powerful even from defeat. It will never die whilst the Constitution and the Union survive. It will live to protect and defend both. No progress was made, however, toward a reunion of the Democratic Party. The Buchanan faction everywhere waged unrelenting war on Douglas, both in public discussion and in the use of official patronage. The contest was made with equal obstinacy and bitterness in the northern and southern states. Douglas, on his part, was not slow to retaliate. He immediately entered on an extensive campaign tour and made speeches at many of the principal cities of the northern states, and a few in the slave states. Everywhere, he stigmatized the Beckenridge wing of the democracy as an extremist and disunion faction, charging that it was as obnoxious and dangerous as the Republicans. Whatever be his errors, it must be recorded to his lasting renown that he boldly declared for maintaining the Union by force. At Norfolk, Virginia, the question was put to him in writing. I answer emphatically, replied Douglas, that it is the duty of the President of the United States and all others in authority under him to enforce the laws of the United States passed by Congress, and as the courts expound them, and I, as in duty bound by my oath of fidelity to the Constitution, would do all in my power to aid the government of the United States in maintaining the supremacy of the laws against all resistance to them. 
come from what quarter it might. In other words, I think the president, whoever he may be, should treat all attempts, Douglas, to break up the Union by resistance to the laws as old Hickory treated the nullifiers in 1832. All parties entered upon the political canvas with considerable spirit, but the chances of the Republicans were so manifestly superior that their enthusiasm easily outran that of all of their competitors. The character and antecedents of Mr. Lincoln appealed directly to the sympathy and favor of the popular masses of the northern states. As pioneer, farm laborer, flat boatman, and frontier politician, they saw in him a true representative of their early, if not their present, condition. As the successful lawyer, legislator, and public debater in questions of high statesmanship, he was the admired ideal of their own aspirations. While the Illinois State Republican Convention was in session at Decatur, May 10th, about a week before the Chicago Convention, the balloting for state officers was interrupted by the announcement made with much mystery that an old citizen of Macon County had something to present to the convention. When curiosity had been sufficiently aroused, John Hanks, Lincoln's fellow pioneer and a neighbor of Hanks, were suddenly marched into the convention, each bearing upright an old fence rail and displaying a banner with an inscription to the effect that these were two rails from the identical lot of 3,000 which, when a pioneer boy, Lincoln had helped to cut and split to enclose his father's first farm in Illinois in 1830. These emblems of his handiwork were received by the convention with deafening shouts as a prelude to unanimous resolution recommending him for president. Later, these rails were sent to Chicago. There, during the sittings of the National Republican Convention, they stood in the hotel parlor at the Illinois headquarters, lighted up by tapers and trimmed with flowers by enthusiastic ladies. Their history and campaign incidents were duly paraded in the newspapers, and throughout the Union, Lincoln's ancient and local sobriquet of Honest Old Abe was supplemented by the national epithet of the Illinois Bail Splitter. Of many peculiarities of the campaign, one feature deserves special mention. Political clubs for parades and personal campaign work were no novelty now. However, the expedience of a cheap yet striking uniform and a half-military organization were tried with marked success. When Lincoln made his New England trip immediately after the Cooper Institute speech, a score or two of active Republicans in the city of Hartford appeared in close and orderly ranks, wearing each a cap and large cape of oil cloth, and bearing over their shoulders a long staff, on the end of which blazed a brilliant torchlight. This first wide-awake club, as it called itself, marching with sol soldierly step in military music, escorted Mr. Lincoln on the evening of March 5th from the hall where he addressed the people to his hotel. The device was so simple and yet so strikingly effective that it immediately became the pattern for other cities. After the campaign opened, there was scarcely a county or village in the north without its organized and drilled association of wide awakes, immensely captivating to the popular eye and forming everywhere a vigilant corpse to spread the fame of and solicit votes for the Republican presidential candidate. On several occasions, 20 to 30,000 wide awakes met in the larger cities and marched in monster torchlight processions through the principal streets. His nominations also made necessary some slight changes in Mr. Lincoln's daily life. His law practice was transferred entirely to his partner, and instead of the small dingy office so long occupied by him, he was now given use of the governor's room in the state house, which was not needed for official business during the absence of the legislature. This also was a room of modest proportions, with scanty and plain furniture, here Mr. Lincoln, attended only by his private secretary, Mr. Nicolet, passed the long summer days of the campaign, receiving the constant stream of visitors anxious to look upon a real presidential candidate. There was free access to him. Not even an usher stood at the door. Anyone might knock and enter. His immediate personal friends from the Sangamon County in central Illinois 
availed themselves largely of this opportunity. With men who had known him in field and forest, he talked over the incidents of their common pioneer experience with unaffected sympathy and interest, as though he were yet the flat boatsman, surveyor, or village lawyer of the early days. The letters which came to him by the hundreds, the newspapers, and the conversation of friends kept him sufficiently informed of the progress of the campaign, in which personally he took a very slight part. He made no addresses, wrote no public letters, held no conferences. Political leaders several times came to make such campaign speeches at the Republican wigwam in Springfield, but beyond a few casual interviews on such occasions, the great presidential canvass went on with scarcely a private suggestion or touch of actual direction from the Republican candidate. It is perhaps worthwhile to record Lincoln's expression on one point, which adds testimony to his general consistency in political action. The rise of the Know-Nothing, or the American Party, in the 1854-5, which was only a renewal of the Native American Party of 1844, has been elsewhere mentioned. As a national organization, the new faction ceased with the defeat of Fillmore and Donelson in 1856. Its fragments nonetheless held together in many places in the form of local minorities, which sometimes made themselves felt in contests for members of the legislature and county officers. And citizens of foreign birth continued to be justly apprehensive for its avowed jealousy and secret machinery. It was easy to allege that any prominent candidate belonged to the Know-Nothing Party and attended the secret Know-Nothing Lodges, and Lincoln, in the state senatorial and now again in the presidential campaign, suffered his full share of these newspaper accusations. While we have already mentioned that in the campaign of 1844 he put on record, by public resolutions in Springfield, his disapprobation of and opposition to Native Americanism. In the later campaigns, while he did not allow his attention to be diverted from the slavery discussion, his disapproval of know-nothingism was quite as decided and public. Thus, he wrote in a private letter, dated October 30th, 1858, I understand the story is still being told and insisted upon that I have been a know-nothing. I repeat what I stated in a public speech at Meridosia, that I am not nor have ever been connected with the party called the Know-Nothing Party, or party calling themselves the American Party. Certainly no man of truth, and I believe no man of good character for truth, can be found to say, on his own knowledge, that I ever was connected with that party. So also in the summer of 1860, when his candidacy for president did not permit his writing public letters, he wrote in a confidential note to a friend, Yours of the 20th is received. I suppose as good or even better men than I may have been in American or know-nothing lodges, but, in point of fact, I was never in one, at Quincy or elsewhere. And now a word of caution. Our adversaries think they can gain a point if they could force me to openly deny the charge, by which some degree of offense would be given to the Americans. For this reason, it must not publicly appear that I am paying any attention to the charge. His position on the main question involved was already sufficiently understood, for in his elsewhere quoted letter of May 17, 1859, he had declared himself against the adoption by Illinois, or any other place where he had a right to oppose it, of the recent Massachusetts constitutional provision restricting foreign-born citizens in the right of suffrage. It is well to repeat this broad philosophical principle which guided him to the conclusion Understanding the spirit of our institutions to aim at the elevation of men, I am opposed to whatever tends to degrade them. As the campaign progressed, the chances of the result underwent an important fluctuation, involving some degree of uncertainty. The democratic disruption, in the presence of four tickets in the field, rendered it possible that some very narrow plurality in one or more of the states might turn the scale of victory. Calculating politicians especially those belonging to the party hitherto in power, and who had enjoyed the benefits of its extensive federal patronage, seized eagerly upon this possibility as a means of prolonging their official tenure, and showed themselves not unwilling to sacrifice the principles of the general contest to the mere 
material, and local advantage which success would bring them. Accordingly, in several states, and more notably in the great state of New York, there was begun a quiet but unremitting effort to bring about a coalition, or a fusion as it was termed, of the warring democratic factions, on the basis of a division of the spoils which such a combination might hope to secure. Nor did the effort stop there. If the union of the two factions created the probability, the union of three seemed to ensure certainty, and the negotiations for a coalition, therefore, extended to the adherents of Bell and Everett. Amid the sharp contest of ideas and principles which divided the country, such an arrangement was by no means easy. Yet, in a large voting population, there is always a percentage of party followers on whom the obligations of party creeds sit lightly. Gradually, from talk of individuals and speculations of newspapers, the intrigue proceeded to a coquetting between rival conventions. Here the formal proceedings encountered too much protest and indignation, and the scheme was handed over to standing committees, who could deliberate and bargain in secret. It must be stated to the credit of Douglas that he publicly rejected any alliance not based on his principle of non-intervention. But the committees and managers cared little for the disavowal. In due time, they perfected their agreement that the New York electoral ticket, numbering 35, should be made up of adherence to the three different factions in the following proportion. Douglas, 18. Bell, 10. Breckenridge, 7. This agreement was carried out, and the fusion ticket, thus constituted, was voted for at the presidential election by the combined opponents of Lincoln. In Pennsylvania, notwithstanding that Douglas disapproved the scheme, an agreement or movement of fusion also took place. But in this case, it did not become complete and was not altogether carried out by the parties to it, as in New York. The electoral ticket had been nominated by the usual Democratic State Convention prior to the Charleston disruption, and as it turned out, about one-third of these nominees were favorable to Douglas. After the disruption, the Douglas men also formed a straight or Douglas electoral ticket in order to unite the two wings at the October state election. The executive committee of the original convention recommended that the electors first nominated should vote for Douglas if his election were possible, if not, should vote for Breckenridge. A subsequent resolution recommended that the electors should vote for either Douglas or Breckenridge, as the preponderance of Douglas or Breckenridge votes in the state might indicate. On some implied agreement of this character, not clearly defined or made public, the Douglas, Breckenridge, and Bell factions voted together for governor in October. Being beaten by a considerable majority at that election, the impulse to fusion was greatly weakened. Finally, the original Democratic State Committee rescinded all its resolutions of fusion, and the Douglas State Committee withdrew its straight Douglas ticket. This action left in the field the original electoral ticket nominated by the Democratic State Convention at Reading, prior to the Charleston Convention, untrammeled by any instructions or agreements. It was nevertheless a fusion ticket in part because nine of the candidates, one-third of the whole number, were pledged to Douglas. What share or promise the Bell faction had in it was not made public. At the presidential election it was voted for by a large number of fusionists, but a portion of the Douglas men voted straight for Douglas, and a portion of the Bell men straight for Bell. In New Jersey, also, a definite fusion agreement was reached between the Bell, Breckenridge, and Douglas factions. An electoral ticket was formed composed of two adherents of Bell, two of Breckenridge, and three of Douglas. This was the only state in which the fusion movement produced any result in the election. It turned out that a considerable faction of the Douglas voters refused to be transferred by the agreement which their local managers had entered into. They would not vote for the two Bell men and the two Breckenridge men on the fusion ticket, but ran a straight Douglas ticket, adopting the three electors on the fusion ticket. By this turn of the canvas, the three Douglas electors whose names were on both tickets were chosen, but the remainder of the fusion ticket was defeated, giving Lincoln four electoral votes out of the seven in New Jersey. Some slight efforts toward fusion were made in two or three other states, but accomplished nothing worthy of note and would have had no influence on the result, even if it had been consummated. All these efforts to avert or postpone the grave political change which was impending were of no avail. In the long six years' agitation, popular intelligence had ripened to conviction and determination. 
Every voter substantially understood the several phases of the great slavery issue, its abstract morality, its economic influence on society, the intrigue of the administration and the Senate to make Kansas a slave state, the judicial status of slavery as expounded in the Dred Scott decision, the validity and the effort of the fugitive slave law, the question of the balance of political power as involved in the choice between slavery extension and slavery restriction, and thus beyond even this, the issue so clearly presented by Lincoln whether the states ultimately should become all slave or all free. In the whole history of American polities, the voters of the United States never pronounced a more deliberate judgment than that which they recorded upon these grave questions at the presidential election in November 1860. From much doubt and uncertainty at its beginnings, the campaign swept onward through the summer months, first to a probability, then to an assurance of Republican success. In September, the state of Maine elected a Republican governor by 18,000 majority. In October, the pivotal states gave decisive Republican majorities. Pennsylvania, 32,000 for governor. Indiana, nearly 10,000 for governor. And Ohio, 12,000 for state ticket. And 27,000 on congressmen. Politicians generally conceded that the vote in these states clearly foreshadowed Lincoln's election. The prophecy not only proved correct, but the tide of popular conviction and enthusiasm, rising still higher, carried to his support other states which were yet considered uncertain. The presidential election occurred on November 6, 1860. In 17 of the free states, namely Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Vermont, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, California, and Oregon, all the Lincoln electors were chosen. In one of the free states, New Jersey, the choice resulted in four electors for Lincoln and three for Douglas, as already explained. This assured Lincoln of the votes of 180 presidential electors, or a majority of the 57 in the whole electoral college. The 15 slave states were divided between the other three candidates, 11 of them, Alabama, Arkansas, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Texas, chose Breckinridge electors, 72 in all. Three of them, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia, chose Bell electors, 39 in all, and one of them, Missouri, Douglas electors nine in number, which, together with the three he received in the free state of New Jersey, gave him twelve in all, the aggregate of all the electors opposed to Lincoln being 123. The will of the people, as expressed in this popular vote, was in due time carried into execution. As the law prescribes, the presidential electors met in their several states on the 5th of December and cast their official votes according to the above enumeration and on the 13th of February, 1861, the Congress of the United States in joint session made the official count and declared that Abraham Lincoln, having received a majority of the votes of presidential electors, was duly elected President of the United States for four years, beginning on March 4th, 1861. One feature of the result must not be omitted. Many careless observers felt at the time that the success of Lincoln was due entirely to the fact of there having been three opposing candidates in the field, or in other words, to the dissensions of the Democratic Party, which divided its vote between Breckinridge and Douglas. What merely moral strength the Democratic Party would have gained had it remained united, it's impossible to estimate. Such a supposition can only be based on the absence of the extreme Southern doctrines concerning slavery. Given the presence of those doctrines in the canvas, no hypothesis can furnish a result different from that which occurred. In the contest, upon the questions as they existed, the victory of Lincoln was certain. If all the votes given to all the opposing candidates had been concentrated and cast in a fusion ticket, as was wholly or partly done in five states, the result would have been changed nowhere except in New Jersey, California, and Oregon. Lincoln would still have received but 11 fewer or 169 electoral votes, majority of 35 in the entire electoral college. It was a contest of ideas, not of persons or parties. 
The choice was not only free, but distinct and definite. The voter was not, as sometimes happens, compelled to an imperfect or partial expression of his will. The four platforms and candidates offered him an unusual variety of modes of political action. Among them, the voters, by undisputed constitutional majorities, in orderly, legal, and unquestioned proceedings, chose the candidate whose platform pronounced the final popular verdict that slavery should not be extended, and whose election unchangeably transferred the balance of power to the free states. End of chapter 16. Chapter 17 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 17. Beginnings of Rebellion. Disunion was not a fungus of recent growth in American politics. Talk of disunion, threats of disunion, accusations of intentions of disunion, lie scattered rather plentifully through the political literature of the country from the very formation of the government. In fact, the present Constitution of the United States was strenuously opposed by large political factions, and, it may almost be said, succeeded by only a hair's breadth. That original opposition perpetuated itself in some degree in the form of doubts of its duration and prophecies of its failure. The same dissatisfaction and restlessness resulted in early and important amendments, but these did not satisfy all dissenters and doubters. Immediate and profound conflict of opinion sprang up over the administration and policy of the new government. Active political parties and hot discussion arose, the one side proclaiming that it was too strong, the other asserting that it was too weak to endure. Before public opinion was well consolidated, the War of 1812 produced new complaints and new opposition, out of which grew the famous Hartford Convention. It has been charged and denied that this was a movement of disunion and rebellion. The exact fact is not important in our day. It is enough that it was a sign of deep political unrest and of shallow public faith. Passing by lesser manifestations of the same character, we come to the eventful nullification proceedings in South Carolina in the year 1832. Here was a formal legislative repudiation of federal authority, with a reserved threat of forcible resistance. At this point disunion was in full flower, and the terms nullification, succession, treason, rebellion, revolution, coercion, constitute the current political vocabulary. Take up a political speech of that period, change the names and dates, and the reader can easily imagine himself among the angry controversies of the winter of 1860. Nullification was half throttled by Jackson's proclamation, half quieted by Clay's compromise, but from that time forward the phraseology and spirit of disunion became constant factors in congressional debate and legislation. In 1850 it broke out to an extent and with an intensity never before reached. This time it enveloped the whole country, and many of the wisest and best statesmen believed a civil war at hand. The compromise measures of 1850 finally subdued the storm, but not till the serious beginning of a succession movement had been developed and put down, both by the general condemnation of the whole country and the direct vote of a union majority in the localities where it took rise. Among these compromise acts of 1850 was the admission of California as a free state. The gold discoveries had suddenly filled it with population, making the usual probation as a territory altogether needless. A considerable part of the state lay south of the line of 36 degrees 30 minutes, and the pro-slavery extremists had demanded that it should be divided into two states, one to be a free and the other to be a slave state, in order to preserve the political balance between the sections in the United States Senate. This being refused, they not only violently opposed the compromise measures, but organized a movement for resistance in South Carolina, Georgia, and Mississippi, demanding redress, and threatening succession if it were not accorded. A popular contest on this issue followed in 1851 in these states, in which the ultra-succession party was signally overthrown. It submitted sullenly to its defeat, leaving, as always before, a considerable faction unsatisfied and implacable, only awaiting a new opportunity to start a new disturbance. This new opportunity arose in the slavery agitation, beginning with the repeal of the Missouri Compromise in 1854 and ending with the election of Lincoln. 
During this six years' controversy, disunion was kept in the background because the pro-slavery party had continual and sanguine hope of ultimate triumph. It did not despair of success until the actual election of Lincoln on the 6th of November, 1860. Consequently, even in the southern states, as a rule, disunion was frowned upon till near the end of the presidential campaign, and only paraded as an evil to be feared, not as a thing to be desired. This aspect, however, was superficial. Under the surface, a small but determined disunion conspiracy was actively at work. It has left few historical traces, but in 1856 distinct evidence begins to crop out. There was a possibility, though not a probability, that Fremont might be elected president, and this contingency the conspirators proposed to utilize by beginning a rebellion. A letter from the governor of Virginia to the governors of Maryland and other states is sufficient proof of such an intent, even without the evidence of later history. Richmond, Virginia, September 15, 1856. Dear Sir, Events are approaching which address themselves to your responsibilities and to mine as chief executives of slaveholding states. Contingencies may soon happen which would require preparation for the worst of evils to the people. Ought we not to admonish ourselves by joint counsel of the extraordinary duties which may devolve on us from the dangers which so palpably threaten our common peace and safety? When, how, or to what extent may we act, separately or unitedly, to ward off dangers if we can, to meet them most effectually if we must? I propose that, as early as convenient, the governors of Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, Mississippi, and Tennessee shall assemble at Raleigh, North Carolina, for the purpose generally of consultation upon the state of the country, upon the best means of preserving its peace, and especially of protecting the honor and interests of the slaveholding states. I have addressed the states only having democratic executives for obvious reasons. This should be done as early as possible before the presidential election, and I would suggest Monday the 13th of October next. Will you please give me an early answer and oblige? Yours most truly and respectfully, Henry A. Wise, His Excellency Thomas W. Legon, Governor of Maryland. If any explanation were needed of the evident purpose of this letter, or of the proposed meeting, it may be found in the following from Senator Mason of Virginia to Jefferson Davis of Mississippi, who is at the time Secretary of War under President Pierce. Selma, near Winchester, Virginia, September 30, 1856. My dear sir, I have a letter from Wise of the 27th, full of spirit. He says the governors of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Louisiana have already agreed to rendezvous at Raleigh, and others will, this in your most private ear. He says, further, that he had officially requested you to exchange with Virginia, on fair terms of difference, percussion for flint muskets. I don't know the usage or power of the department in such cases, but if it can be done, even by liberal construction, I hope you will accede. Was there not an appropriation at the last session for converting flint into percussion arms? If so, would it not furnish good reason for extending such facilities to the states? Virginia probably has more arms than the other southern states, and would divide, in case of need. In a letter yesterday to a committee in South Carolina, I give it as my judgment in the event of Fremont's election the South should not pause, but proceed at once to immediate, absolute, and eternal separation. So am I a candidate for the first halter. Wise says his accounts from Philadelphia are cheering for old Buck in Pennsylvania. I hope they be not delusive. Vale et salute. Sick. Colonel Davis. In these letters we have an exact counterpart of the later and successful efforts of these identical conspirators, co-jointedly with others, to initiate rebellion. When the senatorial campaign of 1858 between Lincoln and Douglas was at its height, there was printed in the public journals of the southern states the following extraordinary letter, which at once challenged the attention of the whole reading public of the country, and became known by the universal stigma of the Scarlet Letter. In light of after events, it was both a revelation and a prophecy. Montgomery, June 15, 1858. Dear Sir, Your kind favor of the 15th is received. I heartily agree with you that 
no general movement can be made that will clean out the Augean stable. If the democracy were overthrown, it would result in giving place to a greater and hungrier swarm of flies. The remedy of the South is not in such a process. It is in a diligent organization of her true men for prompt resistance to the next aggression. It must come in the nature of things. No national party can save us. No sectional party can ever do it. But if we could do, as our fathers did, organize committees of safety all over the cotton states, it is only in them that we can hope for any effective movement, we shall fire the southern heart, instruct the southern mind, give courage to each other, and at the proper moment, by one organized concerted action, we can precipitate the cotton states into a revolution. The idea has been shadowed forth in the South by Mr. Ruffin, has been taken up and recommended in the Advertiser, published at Montgomery, Alabama, under the name of League of United Southerners, who, keeping up their old party relations on all other questions, will hold the Southern issue paramount and will influence parties, legislatures, and statesmen. I have no time to enlarge, but to suggest merely. In haste, yours, etc., William L. Yancey, to James Slaughter, Esquire. The writer of this scarlet letter had long been known to the country as a prominent politician of Alabama, affiliated with the Democratic Party, having once represented a district of that state in Congress, and of late years the most active, pronounced, and conspicuous disunionist in the South. In so far as this publication concerned himself, it was no surprise to the public, but the project of an organized conspiracy had never before been broached with such matter-of-fact confidence. An almost universal condemnation by the public press reassured the startled country that the author of this revolutionary epistle was one of the confirmed fire-eaters who were known and admitted to exist in the South, but whose numbers, it was alleged, were too insignificant to excite the most distant apprehension. The letter was everywhere copied, its author denounced, and his proposal to precipitate the cotton states into a revolution held up to public execration. Mr. Yancey immediately printed a statement deploring the betrayal of personal confidence in its publication, and to modify the obnoxious declaration by a long and labored argument. But in the course of this explanation he furnished additional proof of the deep conspiracy disclosed by the Scarlet Letter. He made mention of a well-considered Southern policy, a policy which has been digested and understood and approved by the ablest men in Virginia, as you yourselves must be aware, to the effect that, while the cotton states should begin rebellion, Virginia and the other border states should remain in the Union, where, by their position and their counsels, they would form a protecting barrier to the proposed separation. In the event of the movement being successful, he continued, in time Virginia and the other border states that desire it could join the Southern Confederacy. Less than ordinary uncertainty hung over the final issue of the presidential campaign of 1860. To popular apprehension, the election of Lincoln became more and more probable. The active competition for votes by four presidential tickets greatly increased his chances of success, and the verdict of the October elections appeared to all sagacious politicians to render his choice a practical certainty. Sanguine partisans, however, clung tenaciously to their favorites, and continued to hope against hope and work against fate. This circumstance produced a deplorable result in the South. Under the shadow of impending defeat, the Democrats of the cotton states made the final months of the canvass quite as much a threat against Lincoln as a plea for Breckinridge. This preaching of succession seemed to shallow minds, harmless election booncomb. But when the contingency finally arrived, and the choice of Lincoln became a real event, they found themselves already in a measure pledged to resistance. They had vowed they would never submit and now, with many, the mere pride of consistency moved them to adhere to an ill-considered declaration. The sting of defeat intensified their resentment, and in this irritated frame of mind, the succession demagogues among them lured them on skillfully into the rising tide of revolution. In proportion to her numbers, the state of South Carolina furnished the largest contingent to the faction of active conspirators, and to her, by common consent, were accorded the dangers and honors of leadership. Such conspiracies work in secret, only fragmentary proofs of their efforts ever come to light. Though probably only one of the many early agencies in organizing the rebellion, the following circular reveals in a startling light what labor and system were employed to fire the southern heart after the November election. Charleston, November 19, 1860, Executive Chamber, 
the 1860 Association. In September last, several gentlemen of Charleston met to confer in reference to the position of the South in the event of the accession of Mr. Lincoln and the Republican Party to power. This informal meeting was the origin of the organization known in this community as the 1860 Association. The objects of the association are, first, to conduct a correspondence with leading men in the South and by an interchange of information and views prepare the slave states to meet the impending crisis. Second, to prepare, print, and distribute in the slave states tracts, pamphlets, etc., designed to awaken them to a conviction of their danger and to urge the necessity of resisting northern and federal aggression. Third, to inquire into the defenses of the state and to collect and arrange information which may aid the legislature to establish promptly an effective military organization. To effect these objects, a brief and simple constitution was adopted, created a president, a secretary, and treasurer, and an executive committee specially charged with conducting the business of the association. 164,000 pamphlets have been published, and demands for further supplies are received from every quarter. The association is now passing several of them through a second and third edition. The conventions in several of the southern states will soon be elected. The North is preparing to soothe and conciliate the South by disclaimers and overtures. The success of this policy would be disastrous to the cause of the Southern Union and independence, and it is necessary to resist and defeat it. The Association is preparing pamphlets with this special object. Funds are necessary to enable it to act promptly. The 1860 Association is laboring for the South and asks your aid. I am, very respectfully, your obedient servant, Robert N. Gordon. Chairman of the Executive Committee. The half-public endeavors of the 1860 Association to create public sentiment were vigorously seconded by the efforts of high official personages to set on foot concerted official action in aid of disunion. In this also, with becoming expressions of modesty, South Carolina took the initiative. On the 5th of October, Governor Gist wrote the following confidential letter, which he dispatched by a secret agent to his colleagues, the several governors of the cotton states, whom the bearer, General S. R. Gist, visited in turn during that month of October. The responses to this inquiry given by the executives of the other cotton states were not all that so ardent a disunionist could have wished, but were yet sufficient to prompt him to a further advance. Executive Department, Unionville, South Carolina, October 5, 1860. His Excellency Governor Moore. Dear Sir, the general probability, nay almost certainty, of Abraham Lincoln's election to the presidency renders it important that there should be a full and free interchange of opinion between the executives of the southern, and more especially the cotton states, and while I unreservedly give you my views and the probable action of my state, I shall be much pleased to hear from you, that there may be concert of action which is so essential to success. Although I will consider your communication confidential, and wish you so to consider mine, so far as publishing in the newspapers is concerned, yet the information, of course, will be of no service to me unless I can submit it to reliable and leading men in consultation for the safety of our state and the South, and will only use it in this way. It is the desire of South Carolina that some other state should take the lead, or at least move simultaneously with her. She will unquestionably call a convention as soon as it is ascertained that a majority of the electors will support Lincoln. If a single state secedes, she will follow her. If no other state takes the lead, South Carolina will secede, in my opinion, alone. If she has any assurance that she will be soon followed by another or other states, otherwise it is doubtful. If you decide to call a convention upon the election of a majority of electors favorable to Lincoln, I desire to know the day you propose for the meeting, that we may call our convention to meet the same day, if possible. If your state will propose any other remedy, please inform me what it will probably be, and any other information you will be pleased to give me. With great respect and consideration, I am yours, etc. William H. Gist, Governor Thomas O. Moore. Executive Department, Raleigh, North Carolina, October 18, 1860. Dear Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your favor of the 5th, which reached me on the 12th instant. In compliance with your request, I will give as accurately as it is in my power to do the views and feelings of the people of North Carolina upon the important subject of your communication. 
Political differences and party strife have run so high in this state for some years past, and particularly during the last nine months, that anything like unanimity upon any question of a public nature could scarcely be expected, and such is the case with the one under consideration. Our people are very far from being agreed as to what action the state should take in the event of Lincoln's election to the presidency. Some favor submission, some resistance, and others still would await the course of events that might follow. Many argue that he would be powerless for evil with a minority party in the Senate, and perhaps in the House of Representatives also, while others say, and doubtless with entire sincerity, that the placing of the power of the federal government in his hands would prove a fatal blow to the institution of Negro slavery in this country. None of our public speakers, I believe, have taken the ground before the people that the election of Lincoln would, of itself, be a cause of succession. Many have said it would not, while others have spoken equivocally. Upon the whole, I am decidedly of opinion that a majority of our people would not consider the occurrence of the event referred to as a sufficient ground for dissolving the union of the states, for which reason I do not suppose that our legislature, which will meet on the 19th proximate, will take any steps in that direction, such, for instance, as the calling of a convention. Thus, sir, I have given you what I conceive to be the sentiment of our people upon the subject of your letter, and I give it as an existing fact, without comment as to whether the majority be in error or not. My own opinions, as an individual, are of little moment. It will be sufficient to say that as a state's rights man, believing in the sovereignty and reserved powers of the states, I will conform my action to the action of North Carolina, whatever that may be. To this general observation, I will make but a single qualification. It is this. I could not in any event assent to, or give my aid to, a political enforcement of the monstrous doctrine of coercion. I do not for a moment think that North Carolina would become a party to the enforcement of this doctrine, and will not therefore do her the injustice of placing her in that position, even though hypothetically. With much respect, I have the honor to be your obedient servant, John W. Ellis. His Excellency, William H. Gist, Governor of South Carolina. Alexandria, Louisiana, 26th October, 1860. His Excellency, Governor Gist. Dear Sir, Your favor of the fifth instant was received a few days ago at this place. I regret my inability to consult with as many of our leading citizens as I wished, but I will not delay in replying any longer. You will, of course, consider my letter as private, except for use in consultation with friends. I shall not call a convention in this estate if Lincoln is elected, because I have no power or authority to do so. I infer from your letter that an authority has been vested in you by your legislature to call a convention in a specified contingency. Our legislature has taken no action of that or any similar kind. That body will meet in regular annual session about the middle of January, but it is not improbable that I may consider it necessary to convene it at an earlier day if the complexion of the Electoral College shall indicate the election of Lincoln. Even if that deplorable event shall be the result of the coming election, I shall not advise the secession of my state, and I will add that I do not think the people of Louisiana will ultimately decide in favor of that course. I shall recommend that Louisiana meet her sister slaveholding states in council to consult as to the proper course to be pursued, and to endeavor to effect a complete harmony of action. I fear that this harmony of action, so desirable in so grave an emergency, cannot be effected. Some of the cotton states will pursue a more radical policy than will be palatable to the border states, but this only increases the necessity of convening the consultative body of which I have spoken. I believe in the right of secession for just cause, of which the sovereignty must itself be the judge. If, therefore, the general government shall attempt to coerce a state and forcibly attempt the exercise of this right, I should certainly sustain the state in such a contest. There has never been any indication made by Louisiana, or by any public body within her limits, of her probable course in the event of an election of a black Republican president, and she is totally unprepared for any warlike measures. Her arsenals are empty, while some of her sister states have been preparing for an emergency, which I fear is now imminent, she has been negligent in this important matter. If coming events should render necessary the convocation of the Southern Convention, 
I shall endeavor to compose the representation of Louisiana of her ablest and most prudent men, if the power shall be vested in me to appoint them. However, I presume the legislature will adopt some other course in the appointments. The recommendations of such a body assembled in such a crisis must necessarily carry great weight, and if subsequently ratified and adopted by each state, by proper authority, will present the South in united and harmonious action. I have the honor to be your Excellency's obedient servant, Thomas O. Moore. Macon, October 26th, 1860. His Excellency Governor Gist. Dear Sir, Your letter of October 5th was handed me by General Gist. Having but few moments to reply, I write this more to acknowledge its receipt than to reply to its contents. Our friends in this state are willing to do anything they may have the power to do to prevent the state from passing under the black Republican yoke. Our people know this and seem to approve such sentiments, yet I do not believe Mississippi can move alone. I will call our legislature in extra session as soon as it is known that the black Republicans have carried the election. I expect Mississippi will ask, a council of the southern states, and if that council advise secession, Mississippi will go with them. If any state moves, I think Mississippi will go with her. I will write at length from Jackson. Yours respectfully, John J. Pettis. Executive Department, Milledgeville, Georgia, October 31, 1860. His Excellency, W. H. Gist. Dear Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your favor by the hand of General Grist, with whom I have had free interchange of opinions. In the event of the election of Mr. Lincoln to the presidency, I have no doubt that Georgia will determine her actions by a convention of the people, which will probably be held before the fourth day of March next. Her legislature, which convenes here next Wednesday, will have to determine on the time when the convention shall be held. My opinion is that the people of Georgia will, in case of the election of Lincoln, decide to meet all the southern states in convention and take common action for the protection of the rights of all. Events not yet foreseen may change their course and might lead to action on the part of Georgia without waiting for all the southern states, if it should be found necessary to her safety. I have handed General Gist a copy of my message on our federal relations, which will be sent to our legislature on the first day of the session. I send only the forms from the press, as it is just being put in type. I may make some immaterial alterations before it is completed. If your state remains in the Union, I should be pleased that she would adopt such retaliatory measures as I recommend in the message, or others which you may determine to be more appropriate. I think Georgia will pass retaliatory laws similar to those I recommend, should Lincoln be defeated. Should this question be submitted to the people of Georgia, whether they would go out of the Union on Lincoln's election, without regard to the action of other states, my opinion is that they would determine to wait for an overt act. The action of other states may greatly influence the action of the people of this state. This letter is not intended for publication in the newspapers, and it has been very hastily prepared. I have the honor to be your Excellency's obedient servant, Joseph E. Brown. Executive Department, Montgomery, Alabama, October 25, 1860. His Excellency W. H. Gist. Dear Sir, Your letter of the 5th instant was handed me a few days since by General Gist. I fully concur with you in the opinion that Lincoln will be elected president, and that a full and free interchange of opinion between the executives of the southern states, and especially of the cotton states, should be had as to what ought to be done, and what will be done by them to protect the interest and honor of the slaveholding states in the event he should be elected. My opinion is that the election of Lincoln alone is not sufficient cause for a dissolution of the Union, but that fact, when taken in connection with the avowed objects and intentions of the party whose candidate he is, and the overt acts already committed by that party in nullifying the Fugitive Slave Law and the enactment of personal liberty bills in many of the non-slaveholding states, with other acts of like kind, is sufficient cause for dissolving every tie which binds the Southern states to the Union. It is my opinion that Alabama will not secede alone, but if two or more states will cooperate with her, she will secede with them, or if South Carolina or any other southern state should go out alone, and the federal government should attempt to use force against her, Alabama will immediately rally to her rescue. 
The opinions above expressed are predicated upon observation and consultation with a number of our most distinguished statesmen. The opinion thus expressed is not intended as a positive assurance, but is my best impression as to what will be the course of Alabama. Should Lincoln be elected, I shall certainly call a convention under the provisions of the resolutions of the last General Assembly of the State. The convention cannot be convened earlier than the first Monday in February next, and I have fixed upon that day in my own mind. The vote of the electors will be cast for president on the fifth day of December, after which it will require a few days to ascertain the result. Thirty days' notice will have to be given after that day upon which the delegates to the convention will be elected, and the convention is required to convene in two weeks after the election. This is not a matter of discretion with me, but is fixed by law. I regret that earlier action cannot be had, as it may be a matter of much importance that all states that may determine to withdraw from the Union should act before the expiration of Mr. Buchanan's term of service. The facts and opinions herein communicated you are at liberty to make known to those with whom you may choose to confer, but they are not to be published in the newspapers. I have had a full and free conversation with General Gist, the substance of which is contained in this letter. He will, however, give it to you in more detail. It is my opinion that all the states that may determine to take action upon the election of Lincoln should call a convention as soon as practicable after the result is known. With great respect, your obedient servant, B. Moore. Executive Department, November ninth, 1860. His Excellency, Governor Gist. Dear Sir, your communication of the 5th Ultimo reached me per last mail under cover from General States Rights Gist, with an explanatory note from that gentleman in relation to the subject matters thereof. The mode employed by Your Excellency to collect authoritatively the views of several of the executives of the Southern States as to their plan of action in the event of the election of Lincoln commends itself warmly to my judgment. Concert of action can alone be arrived at by full and free interchange of opinion before the executives of the cotton states, by whom it is confidentially expected that the ball will be put in motion. We are in the midst of grave events, and I have industriously sought to learn the public mind in this state in the event of the election of Lincoln, and am proud to say Florida is ready to wheel into line with the gallant Palmetto State or any other cotton state or states, in any course which she or they may in their judgment think proper to adopt, looking to the vindication and maintenance of the rights, interest, honor, and safety of the South. Florida may be unwilling to subject herself to the charge of temerity or immodesty by leading off, but will most assuredly cooperate with or follow the lead of any single cotton state which may succeed. Whatever doubts I may have entertained upon this subject have been entirely dissipated by the recent elections in this state. Florida will most unquestionably call a convention as soon as it is ascertained that a majority of the electors favor the election of Lincoln, to meet most likely upon a day to be suggested by some other state. I leave today for the capital, and will write you soon after my arrival, but would be pleased in the meantime to hear from you at your earliest convenience. If there is sufficient manliness at the South to strike for our rights, honor, and safety, in God's name let it be done before the inauguration of Lincoln. With high regard, I am yours, etc. M. S. Perry, direct to Tallahassee. P. S. I have written General Gist at Union C. H. Two agencies have thus far been described as engaging in the work of fomenting the rebellion. The first, the secret societies of individuals, like the 1860 Association, designed to excite the masses and create public sentiment. The second, a secret league of Southern governors and other state functionaries whose mission it became to employ the governmental machinery of states in furtherance of the plot. These, though formidable and dangerous, would probably have failed, either singly or combined, had they not been assisted by a third of still greater efficacy and certainty. This was nothing less than a conspiracy in the very bosom of the National Administration at Washington, embracing many United States Senators, Representatives in Congress, three members of the President's Cabinet, and numerous subordinate officials, in the several executive departments. The special work which this powerful central cabal undertook by common consent and successfully accomplished was to divert federal arms and forts to the use of the rebellion, and to protect and shield the revolt from any adverse influence or preventative or destructive action of the general government. End of chapter 17
Chapter Eighteen of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Two, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Eighteen: The Cabinet Cabal. Very soon after the effort to unite the cotton state governors in the revolutionary plot, we find the local conspiracy at Charleston in communication with the central secession cabal in Washington. James Buchanan of Pennsylvania was still president of the United States, and his cabinet consisted of the following members. Lewis Cass of Michigan, Secretary of State. Howell Cobb of Georgia, Secretary of the Treasury. John B. Floyd of Virginia, Secretary of War. Isaac Tusi of Connecticut, Secretary of the Navy. Jacob Thompson of Mississippi, Secretary of the Interior, Joseph Holt of Kentucky, Postmaster General, and Jeremiah S. Black of Pennsylvania, Attorney General. It was in and about this cabinet that the central cabal formed itself. Even if we could know in detail the successive steps that led to the establishment of this intercourse, which so quickly became both semi-official and confidential, it could add nothing to the force of the principal fact that the conspiracy was in its earliest stages efficient in perverting the resources and instrumentalities of the government of the united states to its destruction that a united states senator a secretary of war an assistant secretary of state and no doubt sundry minor functionaries were already then from six to eight weeks before any pretense of secession with malice aforethought organizing armed resistance to the constitution and laws they had sworn to support stands forth in the following correspondence too plainly to be misunderstood as a fitting preface to this correspondence a few short paragraphs may be quoted from the private diary of the secretary of war from which longer and more important extracts appear in a subsequent chapter those at present quoted are designed more specially to show the names of the persons composing the primary group of this central cabal and the time and place of their early consultations and activity extracts from floyd's diary November 8, 1860. I had a long conversation today with General Lane, the candidate for vice president on the ticket with Mr. Breckinridge. He was grave and extremely earnest, said that resistance to the anti-slavery feeling of the North was hopeless, and that nothing was left to the South but resistance or dishonor, that if the South failed to act with promptness and decision in vindication of her rights, she would have to make up her mind to give up first her honor and then her slaves. He thought disunion inevitable and said when the hour came that his services could be useful, he would offer them unhesitatingly to the South. I called to see the President this evening, but found him at the State Department engaged upon his message, and did not see him. Miss Lane returned last evening from Philadelphia, where she has been for some time on a visit. Mr. W. H. Truscott, Assistant Secretary of State, called to see me this evening, and conversed at length upon the condition of things in South Carolina, of which state he is a native. He expressed no sort of doubt whatever of his state separating from the Union. He brought me a letter from Mr. Drayton, the agent of the state, proposing to buy 10,000 muskets for the use of the state. November 10. Beach, Thompson, and Cobb came over with me from Cabinet and stayed, taking informally a family dinner. The party was free and communicative. Tusi would not stay for dinner. Mr. Pickens, late minister to Russia, came in after dinner with Mr. Truscott, assistant secretary of state, and sat an hour talking about the distracted state of public feeling at the South. He seemed to think the time had come for decisive measures to be taken by the South. November 11th. I spent an hour at the President's, where I met Thompson, Robert McGraw, and some others. We sat around the tea table and discussed the disunion movements of the South. This seems to be the absorbing topic everywhere. November 12th. Dispatched the ordinary business of the department. Dined at five o'clock. Mr. Pickens, late minister to Russia, Mr. Trescott, Mr. Secretary Thompson, Mr. McGraw, Mr. Brown, editor of the Constitution, were of the party. The chief topic of discussion was, as usual, the excitement in the South. The belief seemed to be that disunion was inevitable. Pickens, usually very cool and conservative, was excited and warm. My own conservatism seems in these discussions to be unusual and almost misplaced. W. H. Trescott to E. Barnwell Rett, Washington, November 1, 1860. Dear Rett, I received your letter this morning. As to my views or opinions of the administration, I can, of course, say nothing. 
as to mr cobb's views he is willing that i should communicate them to you in order that they may aid you in forming your own judgment but you will understand that this is confidential that is neither mr cobb nor myself must be quoted as the source of your information i will not dwell on this as you will on a moment's reflection see the embarrassment which might be produced by any unauthorized statement of his opinions i will only add by way of preface that after the very fullest and freest conversations with him i feel sure of his earnestness singleness of purpose and resolution in the whole matter mr cobb believes that the time is come for resistance that upon the election of lincoln georgia ought to succeed from the union and that she will do so that georgia and every other state should as far as secession act for herself resuming her delegated powers and thus put herself in position to consult with other sovereign states who take the same ground after the secession is effected then will be the time to consult but he is of the opinion most strongly that whatever action is resolved on should be consummated on the fourth of march not before that while the action determined on should be decisive and irrevocable its initial point should be on the fourth of march he is opposed to any southern convention merely for the purpose of consultation if a southern convention is held it must be of delegates empowered to act whose action is at once binding on the states they represent but he desires me to impress upon you his conviction that any attempt to precipitate the actual issue upon this administration will be most mischievous calculated to produce differences of opinion and destroy unanimity he thinks it of great importance that the cotton crop should go forward at once and that the money should be in the hands of the people that the cry of popular distress shall not be heard at the outset of this move my own opinion is that it would be well to have a discreet man one who knows the value of silence who can listen wisely present in milledgeville at the meeting of the state legislature as there will be there an outside gathering of the very ablest men of the state and the next point that you should at the earliest possible day of the session of our own legislature elect a man as governor whose name and character will conciliate as well as give confidence to all the men of the state if we do act i really think this half the battle a man upon whose temper the state can rely i say nothing about a convention as i understand on all hands that that is a fixed fact and i have confined myself to answering your question i will be much obliged to you if you will write me soon and fully from columbia it is impossible to write you with constant interruption of the office and as you may want cobb's opinions not mine i send this to you yours w h t thomas f drayton to governor gist charleston third november eighteen sixty on the twenty second of last month i was in washington and called upon the secretary at war in company with senator wigfall of texas to make inquiries as to the efficiency and price of certain muskets belonging to the united states which had been altered by the ordnance department from flint to percussion they will shoot for two hundred yards as well as any smooth bored gun in the service and if rifled will be effective at five hundred yards but if the conical ball will be made lighter by enlarging the hollow at the base of the cone the effective range may be increased to seven hundred yards should your excellency give a favorable consideration to the above i can have the whole of what i have stated authenticated by the board of ordnance officers who inspected and reported to the secretary at war upon these muskets if ten thousand or more of these muskets are purchased the price will be two dollars each for less quantity the charge will be two fifty each if a portion or all of them are to be rifled the secretary says he will have it done for the additional cost of one dollar per barrel as this interview with mr secretary floyd was both semi-official and confidential your excellency will readily see the necessity should this matter be pursued further of appointing an agent to negotiate with him rather than conduct the negotiation directly between the state and the department i unhesitatingly advise purchasing several thousand of them there are many other important facts in connection with the above that i could disclose but will reserve them for some other occasion that i may give them verbally as soon as i can find a day to wait upon your excellency in columbia the state of texas has engaged twenty thousand of these muskets and the state of kentucky purchased several thousand last summer thomas f drayton to governor gist charleston sixth november eighteen sixty i have only within a few hours received yours of the fifth instant authorizing me to purchase from the war department at washington ten thousand rifles of pattern and price indicated in my letter to your excellency of the third instant i accept the appointment and will discharge the duty assigned to the best of my ability and with the least possible delay 
for I feel that the past and present agitation are ruinous to our peace and prosperity, and that our only remedy is to break up with dispatch the present Confederacy and construct a new and better one. I will communicate with Mr. Secretary Floyd tonight and have the rifles put in preparation so as to have them for use at an early day. I would wish that my agency in this transaction be kept private until I reach Washington, or indeed, till I write to say the arms are on their way to Columbia. Thomas F. Drayton to Governor Gist, Charleston, 8th November, 1860. I have just received your letter of the 7th instant, and I think I can render you all the information you desire without resorting to any agent. If my ability can only be made to keep pace with my zeal, I hope yet to render some service to the dear old state of South Carolina. Thomas F. Drayton to Governor Gist, Charleston, 16th November, 1860. I have been most reluctantly detained here by an accidental fall, and also by business of an urgent kind associated with the railroad. My absence from Washington, however, has not delayed the execution of your order for the rifles. The Secretary of War has had the preparation of them in hand for some time. When I write to you from Washington, had I not better address you through your private secretary? Please address me at Washington to the care of William H. Truscott, Esquire. I will give strict attention to your letter of the seventh instant, and hope to furnish you with much of the information you desire, for I am quite sensible of the importance of knowing the views and policy of the President at this juncture. Thomas F. Drayton to Governor Gist, Washington, 19th November, 1860. I called this morning upon the Secretary of War to make arrangements for the immediate transmission of my rifles to Columbia, but much to my astonishment he informed me that since he had looked over the report of small firearms, now enclosed, that he found he had labored under an error in stating to me that the 10,000 rifles I had engaged were ready for delivery when called for by me. He said he could have them rifled, but it would take three or four months to execute the contract, but suggested that we should purchase the 10,000 smooth-board muskets instead as a more efficient arm, particularly if large-sized buckshot should be used, which, put up in wire case capable of containing 12 of them, would go spitefully through an inch plank at 200 yards. I was much astonished at the result of my interview with Governor Floyd today, for he had not only informed me that the rifles would be ready for me on my arrival, but told Mr. Trescott so likewise, and that if I had been in Washington last Saturday I could have got them. If you will be satisfied with the smooth-board muskets, like the specimen forwarded to you, I will purchase them. Better do this, although not the best pattern, than be without arms at a crisis like the present. Colonel Benjamin Huger can give you much information about these muskets. This is derived not only from Mr. Floyd, but also from General J. E. Johnston, Quartermaster General, who was President of the Ordnance Board who had these muskets changed from flint to percussion, and also from smoothbore to rifle, and he says that for our purposes the smoothboard musket is preferable to the altered rifle. The why I cannot explain today. I also send you a letter from Mr. Trescott in reply to certain inquiries from me, I am unable to make any comments upon them, nor to add other facts, which I will forward you more leisurely tomorrow. W. H. Trescott to Thomas F. Drayton, Washington, November 19, 1860. Private, confidential. My dear Drayton, it is difficult to reply specifically to your inquiries, partly because I do not believe that the exact course of the administration has yet been determined on, and partly because my knowledge, or rather my inference, of its intentions is derived from intercourse with its members, which I am bound to consider confidential. I do not regard it of serious importance to you to know the individual opinions of either the President or the Cabinet. No action of any sort will be taken until the message has been sent indicating the opinions of the Executive, and that message, whatever it be, will find our legislature in session and the Convention on the point of meeting. I think it likely that the President will state forcibly that he considers the grievances of the South, that he will add that he does not think, if the right of secession existed, it would be wise policy for the State to adopt, and that he does not think the right to secede does exist, and then refer the whole matter to Congress. What he will do when the State does secede, he has not said, and I do not know, nor any man, I believe. He will do, as we will, what he believes to be his duty, and that duty, I suppose, will be discharged in full view of the consequences following any line of action that may be determined on. But I think that, as long as Cobb and Thompson retain seats in the Cabinet, 
you may feel confident that no action has been taken which seriously affects the position of any southern state. I think that I may safely rely upon my knowledge of what will be done, and you may rely upon my resignation as soon as that knowledge satisfies me of any move in a direction positively injurious to us, or altering the present condition of things to our disadvantage. When you pass through on Wednesday, however, I will speak to you more fully. Yours, W. H. T. Thomas F. Drayton to Governor Gist, Washington, 19th November, 1860. Mr. Buchanan, while he can discover no authority under the Constitution to justify secession by a state, on the other hand he can find no power to coerce one to return after the right of secession has been exercised. He will not allow entry or clearance of a vessel except through the Custom House to be established as soon as secession is declared, upon the deck of a man of war off the harbor of Charleston. He will enforce the collection of duties, not by navy, but by a revenue cutter, as our collector now would do if his authority was resisted. I will write you more fully when I return from New York, where I go tomorrow at daylight at the suggestion of the Secretary of War, who deems it important that I should go there to make arrangements for shipping the arms, should you still want them, from that point instead of the city. Do send a copy of the list of arms at the arsenals to H. R. Lawton, Milledgeville, Georgia. I am getting some smooth-board muskets for Georgia, like the specimen I sent you. Thomas F. Drayton to Governor Gist, Washington, 23rd November, 1860. I arrived here at 6 a.m. from New York, where I had gone at the suggestion of Mr. Floyd to engage Mr. G. B. Lamar, President of the Bank of the Republic, to make an offer to the Secretary for such a number of muskets as we might require. The Secretary of War was reluctant to dispose of them to me, preferring the intermediate agency. Mr. Lamar has consented to act accordingly, and today the Secretary has written to the commanding officer at Watervillette Arsenal to deliver five or ten thousand muskets, altered from flint to percussion, to Mr. Lamar's order. Mr. Lamar will pay the United States paymaster for them, and rely upon the State to repay him. I have been most fortunate in having been enabled to meet the payments for the arms through Mr. L., for I feel satisfied that without his intervention we could not have effected the purchase at this time. I expect to return at daylight tomorrow to New York, for I am very anxious about getting possession of the arms at Watervillette, and forward them to Charleston. The cabinet may break up at any moment, on differences of opinion with the President as to the rights of secession, and a new Secretary of War might stop the muskets going south, if not already on their way when he comes into office. I will write you again by the next mail. The impression here and elsewhere among many southern men is that our senators have been precipitate in resigning. They think that their resignations should have been tendered from their seats after they had announced to the Senate that the state had seceded. Occupying their seats up to this period would have kept them in communication with senators from the South, and assisted very powerfully in shaping to our advantage coming events. If any further quotation be necessary to show the audacity with which at least three secretaries and one assistant secretary of Mr. Buchanan's cabinet engaged in flagrant conspiracy in the early stages of rebellion, it may be found in an interview of Senator Klingman with the Secretary of the Interior, which the former has recorded in his speeches and writings as an interesting reminiscence. It may be doubted whether Secretary Thompson correctly reported the President as wishing him success in his North Carolina mission, but the Secretary is, of course, a competent witness to his own declarations and acts. About the middle of December 1860, I had occasion to see the Secretary of the Interior on some official business. On my entering the room, Mr. Thompson said to me, Clingman, I am glad you have called, for I intended presently to go up to the Senate to see you. I have been appointed a commissioner by the State of Mississippi to go down to North Carolina to get your state to secede, and I wish to talk with you about your legislature before I start down in the morning to Raleigh, and to learn what you think of my chance of success. I said to him, I did not know that you had resigned. He answered, Oh, no, I have not resigned. Then, I replied, I suppose you resign in the morning? No, he answered, I do not intend to resign, for Mr. Buchanan wished us all to hold on, and go out with him on the 4th of March. But, said I, does Mr. Buchanan know for what purpose you are going to North Carolina? Certainly, he said, he knows my object. Being surprised by this statement, I told Mr. Thompson that Mr. Buchanan was probably so much perplexed by his situation that he had not fully considered the matter, and that, as he was already involved in difficulty, we ought not to add to his burdens, 
and then suggested to Mr. Thompson that he had better see Mr. Buchanan again, and by way of inducing him to think the matter over, mention what I had been saying to him. Mr. Thompson said, Well, I can do so, but I think he fully understands it. In the evening I met Mr. Thompson at a small social party, and as soon as I had approached him, he said, I knew I could not be mistaken. I told Mr. Buchanan all you said, and he told me that he wished me to go, and hoped I might succeed. I could not help exclaiming, Was there ever before any potentate who sent out his own cabinet ministers to excite an insurrection against his government? The fact that Mr. Thompson did go on the errand, and had a public reception before the legislature, and returned to his position in the cabinet is known, but this incident serves to recall it. To this sketch of the cabinet cabal, it is necessary to add the testimony of his participation by one who, from first to last, was a principal and controlling actor. Jefferson Davis records that, in November 1860, after the result of the presidential election was known, the governor of Mississippi, having issued his proclamation convoking a special session of the legislature to consider the propriety of calling a convention, invited the senators and representatives of the state in Congress to meet him for consultation as to the character of the message he should send to the legislature when assembled. While engaged in this consultation with the governor just referred to, a telegraphic message was handed to me from two members of Mr. Buchanan's cabinet, urging me to proceed immediately to Washington. This dispatch was laid before the governor and the members of Congress from the state who were in conference with him, and it was decided that I should comply with the summons. On arrival at Washington, I found, as had been anticipated, that my presence there was desired on account of the influence which it was supposed I might exercise with the President, Mr. Buchanan, in relation to his forthcoming message to Congress. On paying my respects to the President, he told me that he had finished the rough draft of his message, but that it was still open to revision and amendment, and that he would like to read it to me. He did so, and very kindly accepted all the modifications which I suggested. The message was, however, afterwards somewhat changed. The documents we have presented, though they manifestly form but the merest fragment of the secret correspondence, which passed between the chief conspirators, and of the written evidence recorded by them in various forms, then and afterwards, we have a substantial unmasking of the combined occult influences which presided over the initiatory steps of the great American rebellion. Its central council, the master wheel of its machinery, and the connecting relation which caused all its subordinate parts to move in harmonious accord. With the same mind to dictate a secession message to a legislature and a non-coercion message to Congress, to assemble insurrectionary troops to seize federal forts and withhold government troops from their protection, to incite governors to rebellion and overawe a weak president to a virtual abdication of his rightful authority, History need not wonder at the surprising unity and early success of the conspiracy against the Union. End of chapter 18。Chapter 19 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Laszlo Beauregard. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. From the Ballot to the Bullet. The secret circular of Governor Gist of South Carolina, heretofore quoted, inaugurated a great American rebellion a full month before a single ballot had been cast for Abraham Lincoln. This was but repeating, in a bolder form, the action taken by Governor Wise of Virginia during the Fremont campaign four years before. But, instead, as in that case, of confining himself to a proposed consultation among slave state executives, Governor Gist proceeded almost immediately to a public and official revolutionary act. On the 12th of October, 1860, he issued his proclamation convening the legislature of South Carolina into extra session to appoint electors of president and vice president and also that they may, if advisable, take action for the safety and protection of the state. There was no external peril menacing either the commonwealth or its humblest citizen, but the significance of the phrase was soon apparent. A caucus of prominent South Carolina leaders is said to have been held on October 25th at the residence of Senator Hammond. Their deliberations remain secret, but the determination arrived at appears clearly enough in the official action of Governor Gist, 
who was present, and who doubtless carried out the plans of the assemblage. When the legislature met on November 5th, the day before the presidential election, the governor sent him his opening message, advocating both secession and insurrection in direct and undisguised language. He recommended that in the event of Lincoln's election, a convention should immediately be called, that the state should secede from the Federal Union, and, if in the exercise of arbitrary power and forgetful of the lessons of history, the government of the United States should attempt coercion, it will be our solemn duty to meet force by force. To this end, he recommended a reorganization of the militia and the raising and drilling an army of 10,000 volunteers. He placed the prospects of such a revolution in a most hopeful and encouraging light. The indication for many of the southern states, said he, justify the conclusion that the secession of South Carolina will immediately be followed, if not adopted simultaneously, by them, and ultimately, by the entire South. The long-desired cooperation of the other states having similar institutions, for which the state has been waiting, seems to be near at hand, and, if we are true to ourselves, will soon be realized. Governor Gist's justification of this movement, as attempted, was, in his own language, the strong probability of the election to the presidency of a sectional candidate by a party committed to the support of measures, which, if carried out, will inevitably destroy our equality in the Union, and ultimately reduce the southern states to mere provinces of a consolidated despotism to be governed by a fixed majority in Congress hostile to our institutions. This campaign declamation, used throughout the whole South with great skill and success to fire the southern heart, was wholly defective as a serious argument. As to the alleged destruction of equality, the North proposed to deny to the slave states no single right claimed by the free states. The talk about provinces of a consolidated despotism to be governed by a fixed majority was, in itself, an absurd contradiction in terms, which repudiated the fundamental idea of republican government. The acknowledgment that any danger from anti-slavery measures was only in the future negatived its validity as a present grievance. Hostility to our institutions was expressly disavowed by full constitutional recognition of slavery under state authority. The charge of sectionalism came with a bad grace from a state whose newspapers boasted that none but the Breckinridge ticket was tolerated within her borders, and whose elsewhere obsolete institution of choosing presidential electors by the legislature instead of by the people, combined with such a dwarfed and crippled public sentiment, made it practically impossible for a single vote to be cast for either Lincoln or Douglas or Bell, a condition mathematically four times as sectional as that of any state of the North. Finally, the avowed determination to secede because a presidential election was about to be legally gained by one of the three opposing parties, after she had freely and fully joined in the contest, was an indulgence of caprice utterly incompatible with any form of government whatever. There is no need here to enter upon a discussion of the many causes which had given to the public opinion of South Carolina so radical and determined a tone in favor of disunion. Maintaining persistence and gradually gathering strength almost continuously since the nullification furor of 1832, it had become something more than a sentiment among its devotees. It had grown into a species of cult or party religion, for the existence of which no better reason can be assigned than it sprang from a blind hero worship locally accorded to John C. Calhoun one of the prominent figures of American political history. As a representative in Congress, Secretary of War under President Monroe, Vice President of the United States under President John Quincy Adams, for many years United States Senator from South Carolina, and the radical champion of states' rights, nullification, and slavery, his brilliant fame was the pride, but his false theories became the ruin of his state and section. Governor Gist and his secession coadjutors had evidently still a lingering hope that the election might, by some unforeseen contingency, result in the choice of Breckinridge. On no other hypothesis can we account for the fact that on the 6th of November, when northern ballots were falling in such an ample shower for Lincoln, the South Carolina legislature, with due decorum and statute regularity, appointed presidential electors for the state, and formally instructed them to vote for Breckinridge and Lane. The dawn of November 7th dispelled these hopes. The strong probability had become a stubborn fact. When the certain news of Lincoln's election finally came, it was hailed with joy and acclamation by both the leaders and people of South Carolina. They had at length their much coveted pretext for disunion, and they now put into the enterprise a degree of earnestness, frankness, courage, and persistency worthy of a better cause. Public opinion, so long prepared, responded with enthusiasm to the plans and calls of the leaders. 
manifestations of disloyalty became universal. Political clubs were transformed into military companies. Drill rooms and armories were alive with nightly meetings. Sermons, agricultural addresses, and speeches at railroad banquets were only so many secession harangues. The state became filled with volunteer organizations of Minutemen. The legislature, remaining in extra session, and cheered and urged on by repeated popular demonstrations and the inflamed speeches of the highest state officials, proceeded without delay to carry out the governor's program. In fact, the members needed no great incitement. They had been freshly chosen within the preceding month, many of them on the well-understood resistance issue. Their election took place on the 8th and 9th days of October, 1860. Since there was but one party in South Carolina, there could be no party drill, but the tyrannical and intolerant public sentiment usurped its place and functions. On the 16 different tickets prayed in one of the Charleston newspapers, the names of the most pronounced disunionists were the most frequent and conspicuous. Southern rights at all hazards was the substance of many mottos, and the palmetto and rattlesnake were favorite emblems. There was neither mistaking nor avoiding the strong undercurrent of treason and rebellion here manifested, and the governor's proclamation had doubtless been largely based upon it. The first day session of the legislature, November 5th, developed one of the important preparatory steps of the long-expected revolution. The legislature of 1859 had appropriated a military contingent fund of $100,000 to be drawn and accounted for as directed by the legislature. The appropriation had been allowed to remain untouched. It was now proposed to place this sum at the control of the governor to be expended in obtaining improved small arms, in purchasing a field battery of rifled cannon, in providing accoutrements, and in furnishing an additional supply of tents, and a resolution to that effect was passed two days later. The chief measure of the session, however, was a bill to provide for calling the proposed state convention, which it was well understood would adopt an ordinance of secession. There was scarcely a ripple of opposition to the measure. One or two members still pleaded for delay, to secure the cooperation of Georgia, but dared not record a vote against the prevailing mania. The chairman of the proper committee, on November 10th, reported an act calling a convention for the purpose of taking into consideration the dangers incident to the position of the state in the Federal Union, which unanimously became a law on November 13th. The extra session adjourned to meet again in regular annual session on the 26th. Meanwhile, public excitement had been kept at fever heat by all manner of popular demonstrations. The two United States Senators and the principal Federal officials resigned their offices with a public flourish of their insubordinate zeal. An enthusiastic ratification meeting was given to the returning members of the legislature. To give still further emphasis to the general movement, a grand mass meeting was held at Charleston on the 17th of November. The streets were filled with the excited multitude. Gaily dressed ladies crowded balconies and windows, and zealous mothers decorated their children with revolutionary badges. There was a brisk trade in firearms and gunpowder. The leading merchants and prominent men of the city came forth and seated themselves on platforms to witness and countenance a formal ceremony of insurrection. A white flag bearing a palmetto tree and the legend Animus Opibusque Parati, one of the mottos on the state seal, was, after solemn prayer, displayed from a pole of Carolina pine. Music, salutes, and huzzas filled the air. Speeches were addressed to citizens of the Southern Republic. Orations and processions completed the day and illuminations and bonfires occupied the night. The preparations were without stint. The proceedings and ceremonies were conducted with spirit and abandon. And yet there was a skeleton at the feast. The federal flag, invisible among the city banners, and absent from the gay bunting and decorations of the harbor shipping, still floated far down the bay over a faithful commander and loyal garrison in Fort Moultrie. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty, Major Anderson. President Buchanan and his administration could not, if they would, shut their eyes to the treasonable utterances and preparations at Charleston and elsewhere in the South. But so far, neither the speeches, nor bonfires, nor palmetto flags, nor even the cessation message of Governor Gist, 
or the Convention Bill of the South Carolina Legislature, constituted a statutory offense. For twelve years, the threat of disunion had been, in the mouths of the Southern slavery extremists and their Northern allies, the most potent and formidable weapon of national politics. It was declaimed on the stump, elaborated in congressional speeches, set out in national platforms, and paraded as a solemn warning in executive messages. Mr. Buchanan had profited by the disunion cry both as a politician and functionary, and now when disunion came in a practical and undisguised shape, he was, to a degree, powerless to oppose it, because he was disarmed by his own words and his own acts. The disunionists were his partisans, his friends, and confidential counselors. They constituted a remnant of the once proud and successful party, which, by his compliance and cooperation in their interest, he had disrupted and defeated. Their program hitherto had been the policy upon which he had staked the success or failure of his administration, so that, in addition to every other tie, he was bound to them by the common sorrow of political disaster. Being in such intimate relations and intercourse with the leaders of the Breckinridge wing of the Democratic Party during the progress of the presidential canvass, and that party being made up so exclusively of the extreme Southern Democrats, the President must have had constant information of the progress and development of the disunion sentiment and purpose in the South. He was not restricted, as the other parties and the general public were to imperfect reports and doubtful rumors current in the newspapers. But in addition, there now came to him an official warning, which it was a grave error to disregard. On October 29th, one week before the election, the veteran Lieutenant General Winfield Scott, General-in-Chief of the Army, communicated to him in writing his serious apprehensions of coming danger, and suggested such precautions as were then in the power of the administration. Beginning life as a farmer's boy, collegian, and law student, General Scott from choice became a soldier, devoting himself to the higher aims of the profession of arms, and in a brilliant career of half a century had achieved worldwide renown as a great military captain. In the United States, however, the military is subordinated to the civic ambition, and Scott all his life retained a strong leaning to diplomacy and statesmanship and on several important occasions gave his country valuable service in essentially civic functions. He had been the unsuccessful presidential candidate of the Whig Party in 1852, a circumstance which no doubt greatly increased his personal attention to current politics then and afterwards. As the first military officer of the nation, he was also the watchful guardian of the public peace. The impending rebellion was not to him, as it was to the nation at large, a new event in politics. Many men were indeed aware, through tradition and history, that it was but the Calhoun nullification treason revived and pushed to a bolder extreme. To General Scott, it was almost literally the repetition of an old experience. A generation before, he was himself a prominent actor in opposing the nullification plot. About the 4th of November, 1832, Upon special summons, he was taken into a confidential interview by President Jackson, who, after asking Scott's military views upon the threatened rebellion of the nullifiers in Charleston Harbor, by oral orders charged him with the duty of enforcing the laws and maintaining the supremacy of the Union, the President placing at his orders the troops and vessels necessary for this purpose. Scott accepted the trust and went to Charleston, and while humoring the nullification quixotism existing there, he executed the purpose of his mission by strengthening the defenses and reinforcing the federal forts. His task was accomplished with the utmost delicacy, but with firmness. The rebellion was indeed abandoned upon pretense of compromise, but had a conflict occurred, at that time the flag of the Union would probably not have been the first to be lowered in defeat. It was therefore most fitting that in these new complications, Lieutenant General Scott should officially admonish President Buchanan. He addressed to him a paper entitled, Views Suggested by the Imminent Danger, October 29, 1860, of a Disruption of the Union by the Cessation of One or More of the Southern States, and also certain supplementary memoranda the day after to the Secretary of War, the two forming in reality but a single document. General Scott was at this time residing in New York City, and the missives were probably 24 hours in reaching Washington. 
this letter of the commander of the American armies written at such a crisis and full of serious faults, and is a curious illustration of the temper of the times, showing as it does that even in the mind of the first soldier of the Republic, the foundations of political faith were crumbling away. The superficial and speculative theories of Scott the politician stand out in unfavorable contrast to the practical advice of Scott the soldier. Once break the Union by political madness, reasoned Scott the politician, and any attempt to restore it by military force would establish despotism and create anarchy. A lesser evil than this would be to form four new confederacies out of the fragments of the old, and on this theme he theorizes respecting affinities and boundaries and the folly of secession. The advice of Scott the soldier was wiser and more opportune. The prospect of Lincoln's election, he says, causes threats of secession. There is danger that certain forts of national value and importance, six totally destitute of troops, and three having only feeble and insufficient garrisons, may be seized by insurgents. In my opinion, all these works should be immediately so garrisoned as to make any attempt to take any one of them, by surprise, or coup de main, ridiculous. There were five companies of regulars within reach, available for this service. This plan was provisional only. It eschewed the idea of invading a seceded state, and he suggested the collection of custom duties outside of the cities. Eight to ten states on the verge of insurrection, nine principal sea coast forts within their boundaries, absolutely at the mercy of the first handful of street rabble that might collect, and only about four hundred men, scattered in five different and distant cities, available to reinforce them. It was a startling exhibit of national danger, from one professionally competent to judge and officially entitled to advise. His timely and patriotic counsel, President Buchanan treated with indifference and neglect. From the impractical nature of the views in their strange and inconsistent character, the President dismissed them from his mind without further consideration. Such is Mr. Buchanan's own confession. He indulges in the excuse that to have then attempted to put these five companies in all or part of these nine forts would have been a confession of weakness instead of an exhibition of imposing and overpowering strength. None of the cotton states had made the first movement towards secession. Even South Carolina was then performing all of her relative duties, though most reluctantly, to the government, etc. To have attempted such a military operation with so feeble a force and the presidential election impending would have been an invitation to collapse in secession. Indeed, if this whole American army, consisting then of only 16,000 men, had been within reach, they would have been scarcely sufficient for this purpose. The error of this reasoning was well shown by General Scott in a newspaper controversy which subsequently ensued. He pointed out that of the nine forts enumerated by him, six, namely, Forts Moultrie and Sumner in Charleston Harbor, Forts Pickens and McRae in Pensacola Harbor, and Forts Jackson and St. Philip guarding the Mississippi below New Orleans were twin forts on opposite sides of a channel whose strength was more than doubled by their very position and their ability to employ cross and flanking fire in mutual support and defense. These works, together with the three others mentioned by General Scott, namely Fort Morgan in Mobile Harbor, Fort Pulaski below Savannah and Fortress Monroe at Hampton Roads were all, because of their situation at vital points, not merely works of local defense, but of the highest strategical value. The reinforcements advised would surely have enabled the government to hold them until further defensive measures could have been arranged, and the effect of such possession on the incipient insurrection may be well imagined when we remember the formidable armaments afterwards employed in the reduction of such of them as were permitted, without an effort on the part of President Buchanan to prevent it to be occupied by the insurgents. But the warning to the administration that the southern forts were in danger came not alone from General Scott. Two of the works mentioned by him as of prime importance were Forts Moultrie and Sumter in Charleston Harbor. There had been a third fort there, Castle Pickney, in a better condition of repair and preparation than either of the former, and much nearer the city. Had it been properly occupied and manned, its guns alone would have been sufficient to control Charleston. 
but there was only an ordnance sergeant in Castle Pickney, only an ordnance sergeant in Fort Sumter, and a partial garrison in Fort Moultrie. Both Sumter and Moultrie were greatly, in Castle Pickney, slightly out of repair. In the summer of 1860, Congress made an appropriation for these works, and the engineer captain, who had been in charge for two years, had indeed been ordered to begin and prosecute repairs in the two forts. Captain J.G. Foster, the engineer to whom this duty was confided, was of New England birth and a loyal and devoted soldier. He began work on the 12th of September, and not foreseeing the consequences involved, employed in the different works between two and three hundred men, partly hired in Charleston, partly in Baltimore. There were in the several forts not only the cannon to arm them, but also considerable quantities of ammunition and other government property, and aware of the hum of secession preparation which began to fill the air at Charleston, Captain Foster in October asked the Ordnance Bureau in Washington for 40 muskets, with which to arm 20 workmen in Fort Sumter and 20 in Castle Pickney. If, wrote the Chief of Ordnance to the Secretary of War, the measure should on being communicated meet the concurrence of the commanding officer of the troops in the harbor, I recommend that I may be authorized to issue 40 muskets to the engineer officer. Upon this recommendation, Secretary of War Floyd wrote the word approved. Under the usual routine of peaceful times, the questions went by mail to Colonel Gardner, then commander of the harbor. It is expedient to issue 40 muskets to Captain Foster? Is it proper to place arms in the hands of hired workmen? Is it expedient to do so? To this, Colonel Gardner replied, under date of November 5th, that, repeating what he had already written, his fears were not of any attack on the works authorized by the city or state, but there was danger of such an attempt from the sudden tumultuary force, and that while in such an event forty muskets would be desirable, he felt constrained to say that the only proper precaution, that which has no objection, is to fill these two companies with drilled recruits, say fifty men at once, and send two companies from Old Point Comfort to occupy, respectively, Fort Sumter and Castle Pickney. His answer and recommendation were both businesslike and soldierly, and contained no indications that justify any suspicion of his loyalty or judgment. Meanwhile, on the heels of his official call for reinforcements came a still more urgent one. It is alleged, on the one hand, that complaints of the inefficiency of Colonel Gardner had reached Washington, and that, in consequence thereof, either the Secretary of War or the President sent for specific information in regard to it. Major Fitz John Porter, then Assistant Adjutant General, on duty in the War Department, went in person to Charleston and made the examination. There are, on the other hand, several vague allegations by the insurgents to the substantial effect that this call for reinforcements was Colonel Gardner's real offense, leaving the implication that Major Fitz John Porter's inspection was purposely instituted to find reasons for removing the colonel, and thus frustrating the obligation to send him additional troops. The order for Major Porter's visit was made on November 6th. He returned to Washington and made an oral statement, and on the 11th of November wrote out his report for the department in due form. According to this report, while Colonel Gardner had been remiss in a few minor details, he had in reality been vigilant, loyal, and efficient in main and important matters. He had foreseen the coming danger, had advised the government, and called for reinforcements, had recommended not only strengthening the garrison of Moultrie, but the effective occupation of both Sumter and Castle Pickney, and had made an effort, in good faith, to remove the public arms and goods from their exposed situation in the arsenal in the city of Charleston, to the security of the fort. Though Southern in feeling and pro-slavery in sentiment, he was true to his oath and his flag, and had he been properly encouraged and supported by his government, would evidently have merited no reproach for inefficiency or indifference. But the fatal entanglement of Buchanan's administration with the slavery extremists had the double effect of weakening loyalty in army officers and building up rebellion among the southern people. 
Instead of heeding the advice of Colonel Gardner to reinforce the forts, it removed him from command, and within two months the president submitted silently to the taunt of the South Carolina rebel commissioners that it was in punishment for his loyal effort to save the government property. Whatever the motive may have been, the government was now fully warned as early as November 11th, a week before the first secession jubilee in Charleston in more than a month before the passage of the secession ordinance of the imminence of the insurrection and danger to the forts. General Scott had warned it, Colonel Gardner had warned it, and now again Major Porter, its special and confidential agent, had not only repeated that warning, but his report had been made the basis of government discussion in the change of commanders. The action of the government was unusually prompt. On November 11th, as we have seen, Major Porter made his written report, and on the 13th he delivered to Major Robert Anderson in New York the order to take command of the forts and forces in Charleston Harbor. Major Anderson, suitably qualified by meritorious service, age, and rank, was deemed especially acceptable for the position, because he was a Kentuckian by birth and related by marriage to a prominent family of Georgia. Such sympathies as might influence him were supposed to be with the South, and his appointment would not, therefore, grate harshly on the susceptibilities of the Charlestonians. The statement, many times repeated, that he owned a plantation in the South is incorrect. He never owned a plantation in Georgia or anywhere else. On the death of his father, he came into possession of a small number of slaves. These he liberated as soon as the proper papers could be executed and sent to him at his distant post, and he always afterwards helped them when they were in need and applied to him. The Army headquarters being then in New York, Major Anderson, on the same day, called on General Scott, and in conversation with the veteran general-in-chief, learned that Army affairs were being carried on at Washington by Secretary Floyd without consulting him. Under these circumstances, Scott did not deem himself authorized to interfere, even by suggestion. Nevertheless, the whole Charleston question seems to have been fully discussed, and the relative strength of the forts and the possible necessity of occupying Sumter commented upon in such a manner as no doubt produced its effects in the subsequent action of Anderson. Major Anderson next went to Washington and received the personal instructions of Secretary Floyd, and returning thereafter to New York, General Scott in that city gave him on November 15th formal written orders to proceed to Fort Moultrie and take command of the post. End of section. Chapter 21 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Davis. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 21, The Charleston Forts. Major Anderson reached Fort Moultrie and assumed command on the 21st of November, 1860. Having from his several interviews with the President, Secretary of War, and Lieutenant General Scott become fully impressed with the importance of his trust, he proceeded as a first duty to acquaint himself thoroughly with his situation and resources. The great Charleston secession celebration on the 17th had been held while he was on his way. The glare of its illumination was extinguished, the smoke of its bonfires had been dissipated by the fresh Atlantic breezes, and its holiday insurgents had returned to the humdrum of their routine employments. It was, therefore, in uninterrupted quiet that on the 23rd of November, he in company with Captain Foster made a tour of inspection to the different forts, and on the same day rode out and transmitted to the War Department a somewhat detailed report of what he saw, with eyes fresh to the scenes and surroundings, which, as he already felt, were to become the subjects of his most intense solicitude. On the main point, indeed, there was no room for doubt. Agreeing with General Scott, with Colonel Gardner, and with Major Porter, he gave the government its fourth warning that the harbor must be immediately and strongly reinforced. Quote, 
The garrison now in it, that is, Fort Moultrie, is so weak as to invite an attack, which is openly and publicly threatened. We are about sixty, and have a line of rampart of fifteen hundred feet in length to defend. If beleaguered, as every man of the command must be either engaged or held on the alert, they will be exhausted and worn down in a few days and nights of such service as they would then have to undergo. Unquote. Such, in brief, was the condition of the fort he had been sent to hold. Moultrie was clearly the weak point of the situation. Already informed, to some extent at least, by the superior military genius of General Scott in his recent interviews with that distinguished commander, Major Anderson, now more forcibly from personal inspection, comprehended its strong points. What was then perfectly obvious to the trained military insight of Scott and Anderson is now in the light of historical events quite as obvious to the civilian. Look at any good map of Charleston Harbor, and it will be seen that the city lies on the extreme point of a tongue of land between the Ashley and Cooper rivers, every part being within easy range under the guns of Castle Pinckney on a small island three-quarters of a mile distant. Four miles to seaward is the mouth of the harbor, and nearly midway therein stood the more extensive and imposing work of Fort Sumter, its guns not only sweeping all the approaches and ship channels, but the shores and islands on either hand. It needs but a glance at the map to see that with proper garrisons and armaments, Fort Sumter commanded the harbor, and Castle Pinckney commanded the city. If the government could hitherto plead ignorance of these advantages against the rising insurrection, that excuse was no longer left after the report of Major Anderson. In the same report, he calls attention to them in detail. Though not in a complete state of defense, he gives notice that Fort Sumter, quote, is now ready for the comfortable accommodation of one company and indeed for the temporary reception of its proper garrison. Captain Foster states that the magazines, four, are done and in excellent condition, that they now contain 40,000 pounds of cannon powder and a full supply of ammunition for one tier of guns. This work, that is Fort Sumter, is the key to the entrance of this harbor. Its guns command this work, that is Moultrie, and could soon drive out its occupants. It should be garrisoned at once. Unquote. Still more strenuously does he insist upon the value of Castle Pinckney. Quote, Castle Pinckney, a small casemated work, perfectly commanding the city of Charleston, is in excellent condition with the exception of a few repairs, which will require the expenditure of about $500. It is, in my opinion, essentially important that this castle should be immediately occupied by a garrison, say of two officers and 30 men. The safety of our little garrison would be rendered more certain, and our fort would be more secure from an attack by such a holding of Castle Pinckney than it would be from quadrupling our force. The Charlestonians would not venture to attack this place, that is, Fort Moultrie, when they knew that their city was at the mercy of the commander of Castle Pinckney. If my force were not so very small, I would not hesitate to send a detachment at once to garrison that work." Unquote. So full of zeal was Major Anderson that the government should without delay augment its moral and material strength, that in default of soldiers he desired to improvise a garrison for it by sending there a detachment of thirty laborers in charge of an officer, vainly hoping to supply them with arms and instruct them in drill and hold the work until reinforcements should come. Having in detail proposed protective measures, he again in the same letter forcibly presents the main question of the hour to the Secretary of War, whose weakness and treachery were as yet unsuspected. Quote, Fort Sumter and Castle Pinckney must be garrisoned immediately if the government determines to keep command of this harbor. I need not say how anxious I am, indeed determined so far as honor will permit, to avoid collision with the citizens of South Carolina. Nothing, however, will be better calculated to prevent bloodshed than our being found in such an attitude that it would be madness and folly to attack us. 
The clouds are threatening, and the storm may break upon us at any moment. I do then most earnestly entreat that a reinforcement be immediately sent to this garrison, and that at least two companies be sent at the same time to Fort Sumter and Castle Pinckney, half a company under a judicious commandment, sufficing, I think, for the latter work. With these three works garrisoned as requested, and with a supply of ordnance stores, for which I shall send requisitions in a few days, I shall feel that, by the blessing of God, there may be a hope that no blood will be shed and that South Carolina will not attempt to take these forts by force, but will resort to diplomacy to secure them. If we neglect, however, to strengthen ourselves, she will, unless these works are surrendered on their first demand, most assuredly immediately attack us. Unquote. If Major Anderson had added no further word to the clear and straightforward statement and recommendation thus far quoted, his professional judgment and manly sense of duty would stand honorably vindicated before posterity. But his language of loyalty, of wisdom, of humanity, a soldierly devotion, which ought to have elicited a reply as inspiring as a drum roll or a trumpet blast, brought him no kindred echo. There was fear in the executive mansion, conspiracy in the cabinet, treason and intrigue in the War Department. Chilling instructions came that he might employ civilians in fatigue and police duty, and that he might send his proposed party of laborers to Castle Pinckney. Meanwhile, some of his suggestions would be under consideration. Besides, he was cautioned to send his communications to the Adjutant General or Secretary of War, with the evident purpose to forestall and prevent any patriotic order or suggestion which might otherwise reach him from General Scott. Nevertheless, Anderson did not weary in his manifest duty. His letters of November 28th and December 1st, though perhaps not as full and urgent, are substantial repetitions of his former recommendations. The growing excitement of the Charleston populace and the increasing danger to the forts are restated with emphasis. He says that there appears to be a romantic desire urging the South Carolinians to have possession of Fort Moultrie. Various reports come that as soon as the state should secede, the forts would be demanded, and if not surrendered, they would be taken. All rumors and remarks indicate a fixed purpose to have these works. The Charlestonians are drilling nightly and making every preparation for the fight, which they say must take place. Once more, he repeated that the security of Fort Moultrie would be more greatly increased by throwing garrisons into Castle Pinckney and Fort Sumter than by anything that could be done in strengthening its own defenses. He sent a detailed report of his command to force again upon the attention of the department his fatal deficiency in numbers and to show the practical impossibility of repelling an assault or resisting a siege with any reasonable hope of success. His letters reached the same inevitable conclusion. Quote, the question for the government to decide, and the sooner it is done the better, is whether when South Carolina secedes, these forts are to be surrendered or not. If the former, I must be informed of it and instructed what course I am to pursue. If the latter be the determination, no time is to be lost in either sending troops, as already suggested, or vessels of war to this harbor. Either of these courses may cause some of the doubting states to join South Carolina. I shall go steadily on preparing for the worst, trusting hopefully in the God of battles to guard and guide me in my course. Unquote. While Anderson was thus penning the plain issue, as it lay in the clear light of a soldier's conception of right and conviction of duty, Another pen was framing the reply agreed upon by the President and his advisers at Washington. Major Anderson might have faith in the God of battles, but what faith could he have in a government holding one-third of a vast continent peopled by 30 millions of freemen, which could not or would not, in face of the most urgent reiterated appeals and the most imminent and palpable necessity, send him two or three companies of recruits when the possession of three forts, the peace of a city, the allegiance of a state, 
if not the tremendous alternative of civil war, hung in the balance. Quote, it is believed, so ran the reply and apparently the final decision of the government, from information thought to be reliable, that an attack will not be made on your command. And the secretary has only to refer to his conversation with you and to caution you that should his convictions unhappily prove untrue, your actions must be such as to be free from the charge of initiating a collision. If attacked, you are, of course, expected to defend the trust committed to you to the best of your ability. The increase of the force under your command, however much to be desired, would, the Secretary thinks, judging from the recent excitement produced on account of an anticipated increase, as mentioned in your letter, but add to that excitement and might lead to serious results. Unquote. This renunciation by the War Department of the proper show of authority and power, demanded by plain necessity and repeatedly urged by its trusted agents, must have touched the pride of Anderson and his brother officers. But a still deeper humiliation was in store for them. The same letter brought him the following notice. Quote, the Secretary of War has directed Brevet Colonel Huger to repair to the city as soon as he can safely leave his post, to return there in a short time. He desires you to see Colonel Huger and confer with him prior to his departure on the matters which have been confided to each of you. Unquote. Colonel Huger was an ordnance officer of the Army, then stationed for duty in Charleston, of distinguished connections in that city, and having on that account as well as personally, great local influence. What the precise nature of the instructions were, which the department sent him, does not appear from any accessible correspondence. The result of the action which the two officers took thereunder is, however, less doubtful. It appears to have been, in effect, a mission by two army officers of honorable rank, in obedience to direct commands from the Secretary of War, to humbly beg the Charlestonians not to assault the forts. Major Anderson, on his part, dismisses the distasteful mission with a significantly curt report. Quote, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt on the 4th of your communication of the 1st instant. In compliance therewith, I went yesterday to the city of Charleston to confer with Colonel Huger, and I called with him upon the mayor of the city and upon several other prominent citizens. All seemed determined as far as their influence or power extends, to prevent an attack by a mob on our fort. But all are equally decided in the opinion that the forts must be theirs after secession. Unquote. What a bitter confession for a brave and sensitive soldier, who knew that with half a company of artillerymen in Castle Pinckney, as he had vainly demanded, the Charleston mob, with the conspiring governor and insurgent secession convention, would have been compelled to accept from him, as the representative of a forbearing government, the safety of their roof trees and the security of their hearthstones. But his duty was to obey, and so he resigned himself without a murmur to the hard conditions which had fallen to his lot. I shall, nevertheless, adds Anderson, knowing how excitable this community is, continue to keep on the qui viva and, as far as is in my power, steadily prepare my command to the uttermost to resist any attack that may be made. Colonel Huger designs, I think, leaving Charleston for Washington tomorrow night. He is more hopeful of a settlement of impending difficulties without bloodshed than I am. End of chapter 21「Chapter Twenty Two of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, November 2015. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume Two by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 22, The President's Message. 
less than a month intervened between the november election at which lincoln had been chosen and the annual session of congress which would meet on the first monday of december and it was necessary at once to begin the preparation of the annual message a golden opportunity presented itself to president buchanan the suffrages of his fellow citizens had covered his political theories his party measures and his official administration with condemnation in an avalanche of ballots but the charleston conspirators had within a very few days created for him a new issue overshadowing all the questions on which he had suffered political wreck since the sixth of november the campaign of the border ruffians for the conquest of kansas and the wider congressional struggle for the possession of the territories might be treated as things of the past even had they still been pending issues they paled into insignificance before the paramount question of disunion face to face with this danger the adherents of lincoln of douglas of bell and the fraction of the president's own partisans in the free states would be compelled to postpone their discords and as one man follow the constitutional ruler in a constitutional defense of the laws the flag and the territory of the union without change of position without recantation of principle without abatement even of declared party doctrine honestly executing only the high mandate of the constitution he could turn from the old issues and take up the new a single stride and from the flying leader of a discomfited rout he might become the mailed hero of an overpowering host tradition patriotism duty the sleepless monition of a solemn official oath all summoned him to take this step and the brilliant example set by president jackson an incident forever luminous in american history assured him of the plaudits of posterity unfortunately for himself and for his country president buchanan had neither the intellectual independence nor the courage required for such an act of moral heroism of sincere patriotism and of blameless personal rectitude he had reached political eminence by slow promotion through seniority not by brilliancy of achievement he was a politician not a statesman of fair ability and great industry in his earlier life the irresolution and passiveness of advancing age and physical infirmity were now upon him though from the free state of pennsylvania he saw with southern eyes and heard with southern ears and had convinced himself that the south was acting under the impulse of resentment arising from deliberate and persistent injuries from the north the fragment of an autograph diary of john b floyd secretary of war affords the exact evidence of the temper in which president buchanan officially confronted the rebellion of the southern states the following are extracts from entries on several days beginning with november seventh eighteen sixty the day following the presidential election Quote, washington city november seventh eighteen sixty the president wrote me a note this evening alluding to a rumor which reached the city to the effect that an armed force had attacked and carried the forts in charleston harbor he desired me to visit him which i did and assured him that the rumor was altogether without foundation and gave it as my opinion that there was no danger of such an attempt being made we entered upon a general conversation upon the subject of disunion and discussed the probabilities of it pretty fully we concurred in the opinion that all indications from the south looked as if disunion was inevitable he said that whilst his reason told him there was great danger yet his feelings repelled the conviction of his mind judge black the attorney-general was present during a part of the conversation and indicated an opinion that any attempt at disunion by a state should be put down by all the power of the government november ninth a cabinet meeting was held as usual at one o'clock all the members were present and the president said the business of the meeting was the most important ever before the cabinet since his induction into office the question he said to be considered and discussed was as to the course the administration should advise him to pursue in relation to the threatening aspect of affairs in the south and most particularly in south carolina 
after a considerable amount of desultory conversation he asked the opinions of each member of the cabinet as to what should be done or said relative to a suggestion which he threw out his suggestion was that a proposition should be made for a general convention of the states as provided for under the constitution and to propose some plan of compromising the angry disputes between the north and the south he said if this were done and the north or non-slaveholding states should refuse it the south would stand justified before the whole world for refusing longer to remain in a confederacy where her rights were so shamefully violated he said he was compelled to notice at length the alarming condition of the country and that he would not shrink from the duty general cass spoke with earnestness and much feeling about the impending crisis admitted fully all the great wrongs and outrages which had been committed against the south by northern fanaticism and deplored it but he was emphatic in his condemnation of the doctrine of secession by any state from the union he doubted the efficacy of the appeal for a convention but seemed to think it might do well enough to try it he spoke warmly in favor of using force to coerce a state that attempted to secede judge black the attorney general was emphatic in his advocacy of coercion and advocated earnestly the propriety of sending at once a strong force into the forts in charleston harbor enough to deter if possible the people from any attempt at disunion he seemed to favor the idea of an appeal for a general convention of all the states governor cobb the secretary of the treasury declared his very decided approbation of the proposition for two reasons first that it afforded the president a great opportunity for a high and statesmanlike treatment of the whole subject of agitation and the proper remedies to prevent it secondly because in his judgment the failure to procure that redress which the south would be entitled to and would demand and that failure he thought certain would tend to unite the entire south in a decided disunion movement he thought disunion inevitable and under present circumstances most desirable mr holt the postmaster-general thought the proposition for the convention dangerous for the reason that if the call should be made and it should fail to procure redress those states which now are opposed to secession might find themselves inclined from a feeling of honor to back the states resolving on disunion without this common demand and common failure he thought there would be no such danger of united action and therefore a stronger prospect of some future plan of reconciliation mr thompson the secretary of the interior thought well of the plan of calling for a general convention though his state mississippi was equally divided between the union and disunion men he deprecated the idea of force and said any show of it by the government would instantly make mississippi a unit in favor of disunion mr toosey secretary of the navy thought well of the appeal for the convention coincided in an opinion i had expressed that retaliatory state measures would prove most availing for bringing the northern fanatics to their senses i expressed myself decidedly opposed to any rash movement and against the idea of secession at this time i did so because i think that lincoln's administration will fail and be regarded as important for good or evil within four months of his inauguration we are to meet to-morrow at one o'clock november the first november tenth we had a cabinet meeting to-day at which the president read a very elaborate document prepared either as a part of his message or as a proclamation it was well written in the main and met with extravagant commendation from general cass governor toosey judge black cobb thompson and mr holt cobb thompson and myself found much to differ from in it cobb because it inculcated submission to lincoln's election and intimated the use of force to coerce a submission to his rule and because it reprehended the policy of the kansas nebraska bill thompson because of the doctrine of acquiescence and the hostility to the secession doctrine i objected to it because i think it misses entirely the temper of the southern people and attacks the true states rights doctrine on the subject of secession i do not see what good can come of the paper as prepared and i do see how much mischief may flow from it End quote. 
it is an open question whether we may accept these extracts at their full literal import either the words coerce submission use of force and so on are written down by the diarists in a sense different from that in which they were spoken or the president and several of his counsellors underwent an amazing change of sentiment but in a general way they show us that on the fourth day after lincoln's election the buchanan cabinet was already divided into hostile camps cass of michigan secretary of state tusi of connecticut secretary of the navy black of pennsylvania attorney general and holt of kentucky postmaster general were emphatic unionists while cobb of georgia secretary of the treasury thompson of mississippi secretary of the interior and floyd of virginia secretary of war were secessionists the latter yet professing devotion to the union but with such ifs and buts as left sufficiently clear evidence of his inevitable drift to disloyalty all impulses of prudence and patriotism ought to have moved the president to reconstruct his cabinet but instead of some energetic executive act of this character he seemed to have applied himself to the composition of a political essay to teach the north its duty as if his single pen had power to change the will of the people of the united states upon a point which they had decided by their votes only four days previously after six years of discussion in a draft of this document which he read to his cabinet on november the tenth we have the important record that quote, it inculcated submission to lincoln's election and intimated the use of force to coerce a submission to his rule end quote. positions which floyd records were met with extravagant commendations from general cass governor tusi judge black and mr holt this was a true touchstone it instantly brought out not only the open secessionism of cobb and thompson but the disguised disloyalty of floyd it is a strange historic phenomenon that with the president and a majority of the cabinet in this frame of mind the south should have been permitted to organize rebellion the solution seems to lie in the temporizing feebleness of buchanan and in the superior finesse and daring conspiracy of cobb thompson and floyd many indications make it evident that a long factional struggle took place over the preparation of the president's message the telegraph announced several protracted cabinet sessions and as early as the twenty first of november the points under discussion and the attitude of the president and his several official advisers were accurately foreshadowed in the newspapers nor were these momentous deliberations confined to the cabinet proper all the varieties of suggestion and contradictory counsels which were solicited or tendered we may never learn and yet we know enough to infer the highest extremes and antagonisms of doctrine and policy jefferson davis the future chief of the rebellion came on the one hand at the urgent call of his fellow conspirators edward m stanton afterwards buchanan's attorney-general and lincoln's secretary of war was on the other hand called in by mr buchanan himself to help him through the intricate maze of his perplexed opinions and inclinations how many others may have come voluntarily or by summons it is impossible to guess many brains and hands however must have joined in the work since the document is such a heterogeneous medley of conflicting theories irreconcilable doctrines impracticable and irrelevant suggestions for at length the hesitating and bewildered president unable to decide and impotent to construct seems to have made his message a patchwork from the contributions of his advisers regular and irregular with the inevitable effect not to combine and strengthen but to weaken and confuse the warring thoughts and alien systems aside from the mere recapitulation of department reports the message of president buchanan delivered to congress on the fourth of december occupied itself mainly with two subjects slavery and disunion on the question of slavery it repeated the assertions and arguments of the buchanan faction of the democratic party during the late presidential campaign charging the present peril entirely upon the north as a remedy it recommended an amendment to the federal constitution expressly recognizing slavery in states which had adopted or might adopt it and also expressly giving it existence and protection in the federal territories the proposal was simply childish 
precisely this issue had been decided at the presidential election to do this would be to reverse the final verdict of the ballot box on the question of disunion or secession the message raised a vague and unwarrantable distinction between the infractions of law and allegiance by individuals and the infractions of law and allegiance by the commonwealth or body politic denominated a state under the first head it held that the union was designed to be perpetual that the federal government is invested with sovereign powers on special subjects which can only be opposed or abrogated by revolution that secession is unconstitutional and is therefore neither more nor less than revolution that the executive has no right to recognize the secession of a state that the constitution has established a perfect government in all its forms legislative executive and judicial and this government to the extent of its powers acts directly upon the individual citizen of every state and executes its own decrees by the agency of its own officers and finally that the executive cannot be absolved from his duty to execute the laws but continued the president the laws can only be executed in certain prescribed methods through the agency of courts marshals posse comitatus aided if necessary by the militia or land and naval forces the means and agencies therefore fail and the performance of this duty becomes impracticable when as in south carolina universal public sentiment has deprived him of courts marshals and posse present laws being inadequate to overcome a united opposition even in a single state congress alone has the power to decide whether it can be effectually amended it will be seen from the above summary that the whole of the president's rambling discussion of this first head of the disunion question resulted logically in three ultimate conclusions one that south carolina was in revolt two that the constitution the laws and moral obligation all united gave the government the right to suppress this revolt by executing the laws upon and against the citizens of that state three that certain defects in the laws paralyzed their practical enforcement up to this point in his argument his opinions whatever may be thought of their soundness were confined to the legitimate field of executive interpretation and such as in this exercise of his official discretion he might with undoubted propriety communicate to congress but he had apparently failed to satisfy his own conscience in thus summarily reasoning the executive and governmental power of a young compact vigorous and thoroughly organized nation of thirty-five millions of people into sheer nothingness and impotence how supremely absurd was the whole national panoply of commerce credit coinage treaty power judiciary taxation militia army and navy and federal fag if through the mere joint of a defective law the hollow reed of a secession ordinance could inflict a fatal wound the president proceeds therefore to discuss the second head of the disunion question by an attempt to formulate and define the powers and duties of congress with reference to the threatened rebellion he would not only roll the burden from his own shoulders upon the national legislature but he would by volunteer advice instruct that body how it must be borne and disposed of addressing congress he says in substance Quote, you may be called upon to decide the momentous question whether you possess the power by force of arms to compel a state to remain in the union the question fairly stated is has the constitution delegated to congress the power to coerce a state into submission which is attempting to withdraw or has actually withdrawn from the confederacy if answered in the affirmative it must be on the principle that the power has been conferred upon congress to declare and make war against a state after much serious reflection i have arrived at the conclusion that no such power has been delegated to congress or to any other department of the federal government it may be safely asserted that the power to make war against a state is at variance with the whole spirit and intent of the constitution but if we possess this power would it be wise to exercise it under existing circumstances our union rests upon public opinion and can never be cemented by the blood of its citizens shed in civil war congress possesses many means of preserving it by conciliation 
but the sword was not placed in their hand to preserve it by force. End quote. Why did the message thus leap at one bound without necessary connection or coherence from the discussion of executive to those of legislative powers? Why waste words over doubtful theories when there was pressing need to suggest practical amendments to the statute whose real or imaginary defects Mr. Buchanan had pointed out? Why indulge in lamentations over the remote possibility that Congress might violate the Constitution when the occasion demanded only prompt preventive orders from the executive to arrest the actual threatened violation of law by Charleston mobs? Why talk of war against states when the duty of the hour was the exercise of acknowledged authority against insurrectionary citizens? The issue and argument were wholly false and irrelevant. No state had yet seceded, execute such laws of the United States as were in acknowledged vigor, and disunion would be impossible. Buchanan needed only to do what he afterwards so truthfully asserted Lincoln had done. But through his inaction, and still more through his declared want of either power or right to act, disunion gained two important advantages. The influence of the executive voice upon public opinion, and especially upon Congress, and the substantial pledge of the administration that it would lay no straw in the path of peacefulness, organized measures to bring about state secession. The central dogma of the message, that while a state has no right to secede, the Union has no right to coerce, has been universally condemned as a paradox. The popular estimate of Mr. Buchanan's proposition and arguments was forcibly presented at the time by a jesting criticism attributed to Mr. Seward. Quote, I think, said the New York senator, that the president has conclusively proved two things. One, that no state has the right to secede unless it wishes to, and two, that it is the president's duty to enforce the laws unless somebody opposes him. End quote. No less damaging was the explanation put upon his language by his political friends. The recognized organ of the administration said, quote, Mr. Buchanan has increased the displeasure of the Lincoln Party by his repudiation of the coercion theory and his firm refusal to permit a resort to force as a means of preventing the secession of a sovereign state. End quote. Nor were intelligent lookers-on in foreign lands less severe in their judgment. Quote, Mr. Buchanan's message, said the London Times a month later, has been a greater blow to the American people than all the rant of the Georgian governor or the ordinances of the Charleston Convention. The president has dissipated the idea that the states which elected him constitute one people. End, quote. End of section 22. The president's message. Chapter 23 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 23. The Charleston Conspirators. As President Buchanan might have foreseen, his inconsistent message proved satisfactory to neither friend nor foe. The nation was on the eve of rebellion and had urgent need of remedial acts, not of temporizing theories, least of all theories which at the late presidential election had been rejected as errors and dangers. The message served as a topic to initiate debate in Congress. But this debate, resting only on the main subject long enough to cover the chief magistrate's views and recommendations as a whole, with almost unanimous expressions of dissent and even of contempt, passed on to words of mutual defiance and open declarations of revolutionary purpose. The conspirators in the cabinet had done their work. By the official declarations of the President of the United States, the government had tied its own hands had resolved and proclaimed the duty and policy of non-resistance to organized rebellion. Henceforth, disunionists, secessionists, 
nullifiers and conspirators of every kind had but to combine under alleged state action and through the instrumentalities of state legislatures and state conventions cast off without let or hindrance their federal obligations by resolves and ordinances the semblance of a vote a few scratches of the pen a proclamation and a new flag and at once without the existence of a corporal squad or the smell of burnt powder there would appear on the horizon of american politics if not a de jour, at least a de facto state, if there had hitherto been any doubt or hesitation in the minds of the principal secession leaders of the South, it vanished under the declared policy of inaction of the federal administration. The president's message was a practical assurance of immunity from arrest and prosecution for treason. It magnified their grievances specifically pointed out a contingent right and duty of revolution, acknowledged that mere public sentiment might override and nullify federal laws, and pointedly bound up federal authority in narrow legal and constitutional restrictions. It was blind as a mole to find federal power, but keen-eyed as a lynx to discover federal impotence. The leaders of secession were not slow to avail themselves of the favorable situation. Between the date of the message and the incoming of the new and possibly hostile administration, there intervened three full months. It was the season of political activity, the period during which legislatures meet, messages are written, and laws enacted. It afforded ample time to authorize, elect, and hold state conventions. Excitement was at fever heat in the South, and public sentiment paralyzed, despondent, and divided at the North. Accordingly, as if by a common impulse, the secession movement sprang into quick activity and unified effort. Within two months, the states of South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas, in the order named by formal ordinances of conventions, declared themselves separated from the Union. The recommendation of Yancey's scarlet letter had been literally carried out. The cotton states were precipitated into revolution. In this movement of secession, the state of South Carolina was the enthusiastic pioneer. At the date of the president's message, she had already provided by law for the machinery of a convention, though no delegates had been elected. Nevertheless, her legislature at once plunged pell-mell into the task of making laws for the new condition of independent sovereignty, which by common consent the convention was in a few days to declare. Questions of army and navy, postal communication, and foreign diplomacy for the moment eclipsed the baser topics of estray laws or wolf scalp bounties, and the little would-be Congress fully justified the reported sarcasm of one of her leading citizens that the Palmetto State was too small for a republic and too large for a lunatic asylum. But with all their outward fire and zeal for nationality, her politicians were restrained by an undercurrent of prudence. A revolution, even under exceptional advantages, is a serious thing. Therefore, the agitators of South Carolina scanned the president's message with unconcealed eagerness. In that paradox of assertions and denials, of purposes to act and promises to refrain, they found much to assure them, but also something to cause doubt. As I understand the message of the President of the United States, explained Mr. Magrath to the South Carolina Convention, he affirms it as his right and constitutional duty and high obligation to protect the property of the United States within the limits of South Carolina and to enforce the laws of the Union within the limits of South Carolina. He says he has no constitutional power to coerce South Carolina, while at the same time he denies to her the right of secession. It may be, and I apprehend it will be, Mr. President, that the attempt to coerce South Carolina will be made under the pretense of protecting the property of the United States within the limits of South Carolina. I am disposed, therefore, at the very threshold to test the accuracy of this logic and test the conclusions 
of the President of the United States. President Buchanan had indeed declared in his message that the Constitution gave the federal government no power to coerce a state. He had further said that the laws gave him no authority to execute civil or criminal process or suppress an insurrection with the help of the militia or the army and navy. In a state where no judicial authority exists to issue process, and where there is no marshal to execute it, and where, even if there were such an officer, the entire population would constitute one solid combination to resist him. So far as mere political theories could go, this was certainly an important concession to the conspirators. In virtue of these doctrines, they could proceed without danger to life and property to hold conventions, pass secession ordinances, resign and refuse federal offices, repudiate northern debts, and effectively stop all federal mails at the state line. But reading another passage in this paradoxical message of President Buchanan, they found these other propositions and purposes involving a flat contradiction and which, with sufficient reason, excited the apprehensions of Mr. McGrath and his fellow conspirators. Said the message, The same insuperable obstacles do not lie in the way of executing the laws for the collection of the customs. The revenue still continues to be collected, as heretofore, at the Custom House in Charleston, and should the collector unfortunately resign, a successor may be appointed to perform this duty. Then, in regard to the property of the United States in South Carolina, this has been purchased for a fair equivalent by the consent of the legislature of the state for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, etc., and over these the authority to exercise exclusive legislation has been expressly granted by the Constitution to Congress. It is not believed that any attempt will be made to expel the United States from this property by force. But if in this I should prove to be mistaken, the officer in command of the forts has received orders to act strictly on the defensive. In such a contingency, the responsibility for consequences would rightfully rest upon the heads of the assailants. It was, of course, in vain that Mr. McGrath and other South Carolina constitutional expounders protested against this absurd want of logic. It was in vain that they could demonstrate that protecting the property of the Union was but another name for coercion. But if the President could lawfully, from another state, appoint a successor to the federal collector, he could, in the same manner, appoint a successor to the federal judge, district attorney, and marshal. That if he could execute the revenue laws, he could execute the steamboat laws, the postal laws, or the criminal laws. That if, with federal bayonets, he could stop a mob at the door of the custom house, he could do the same at the door of the courtroom. That it would be no more offensive war to employ a regiment to protect a bonded warehouse than a jail, a shipping dock than a post office, a dray load of merchandise passing across a street than a mail car in transitu across a state. That coercing a Charleston bell to pay the custom duties on her silk gown and a palmetto orator to suffer the imposition of foreign tribute on his champagne was in fact destroying the whole splendid theory of exclusive state sovereignty. It followed, therefore, that the issue was not one of constitutional theory, but of practical administration, not of legislation, but of war. The argument of the President's message was palpably illogical and ridiculous. But there, in black and white, stood his intention to collect the revenue and protect the public property. Yonder in the bay were Pinckney, Moultrie, and Sumter. Under the flag of the Union was a devoted band of troops and a brave officer with orders to hold the fort. For the present, then, the wall of Fort Moultrie was the iron collar around the neck of the coveted sovereignty of South Carolina. How to break that fetter was the narrow, simple problem. A half-finished enclosure of brick walls, standing in the midst of sandhills which gave commanding elevations and buildings which effectively masked the approach of an assaulting column, and containing, all told, 
but sixty men to guard fifteen hundred feet of rampart. The street rabble of Charleston could any night clamber over the thinly defended walls, and at least a score of companies of Minutemen, drilled and equipped, could be brought by rail from the interior to, of the state to garrison and hold it. But what then? That would bring Federal troops in Federal ships of war, and in a short, quick struggle, the substantial standing preparations of the government would overcome the extemporized preparations of the state, and the insurrection would be hopelessly quelled. To prevent reinforcement was the vital point, and this had been clearly perceived and acted upon from the beginning. While the preparation of President Buchanan's message was yet under discussion, the cabinet cabal had earnestly deliberated upon the most effective intrigue to be employed to deter the President from sending additional troops to Charleston Harbor. In pursuance of the scheme agreed upon by them in caucus, Trescott wrote a letter to Governor Gist suggesting that the governor should write a letter assuring the President that if no reinforcements were sent, there would be no attempt upon the forts before the meeting of the convention and that then commissioners would be sent to negotiate all the points of difference, that their hands would be strengthened, the responsibility of provoking collision would be taken from the state, and the president would probably be relieved from the necessity of pursuing this policy. Governor Gist acted upon the suggestion and wrote, under date of November 29, back to Trescott, giving him liberty to show the letter to the president. Although South Carolina is determined to secede from the Federal Union very soon after her convention meets, yet the desire of her constituted authorities is not to do anything that will bring on a collision before the ordinance of secession has been passed and notice has been given to the president of the fact, and not then, unless compelled to do so by the refusal of the president to recognize our right to secede, by attempting to interfere with our exports or imports, or by refusal to surrender the forts and arsenals in our limits. I have found great difficulty in restraining the people of Charleston from seizing the forts, and have only been able to restrain them by the assurance that no additional troops would be sent to the forts, or any munitions of war. If President Buchanan takes a course different from the one indicated and sends on a reinforcement, the responsibility will rest on him of lighting the torch of discord, which will only be quenched in blood. Mr. Trescott showed this letter to the President on the evening of Sunday, December 2nd, and while his narrative does not mention any expression by Mr. Buchanan of either approval or dissent, his subsequent acts show a tacit acquiescence in Governor Gist's propositions. They are immediately followed by the leaders in Charleston and their agents and spokesmen in Washington, the daily repetition of threats and complaints, thus originated by the latter, which were continued for nearly three and a half months. The purpose was twofold. First, by alternately exciting the fears and hopes of the government to induce it to withhold reinforcement as a prudential measure of magnanimity and conciliation. Secondly, to make it a cloak to hide, as far as might be, their own preparations for war. Had the federal government been in a condition of normal health and vigor, the farce would not have been effective for even a single day. But with capital alarmed, with parties divided into factions, with three traitors in the cabinet and a timid and vacillating executive, by successive almost imperceptible degrees, the farce produced a policy, and the policy led to an opening drama of civil war. Leaving out of view anterior political doctrines and discussions, the first false step had been taken by the administration in its doctrine of non-coercion, announced in the message the second false step half logically resulting from the first, in its refusal on the first day of December to send Major Anderson the reinforcements he so urgently demanded. To the Charlestonians clung to the concession with a tenacity which demonstrated their full appreciation of its value. Immediately, 
there began to flow in upon Mr. Buchanan and his advisers, on the one hand magnified reports of the daily clamors of the Charleston mob, on the other hand encouraging intimations from the Charleston authorities that they, while adhering to their political heresies and demands, were yet averse to disorder and bloodshed, and to this end desired and invoked the utmost forbearance of the government put in truthful language, their request would have been, help us keep the peace while we are preparing to break the law. Let the government send no ships, men, or supplies to the forts in order that we may, without danger or collision, build batteries to take them. Armament by the federal sovereignty is war. Armament by state authority is peace. And it will forever remain a marvel that a president of the United States consented to this certain process of national suicide. End of chapter 23. Recorded by Sheila Blunt. Chapter 24 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Jay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 24. Mr. Buchanan's Truce. The concession yielded by Mr. Buchanan, instead of tending to conciliate the conspirators, only brought upon him additional demands. It so happened that the principal federal ships of war were absent from the harbors of the Atlantic coast on service in distant waters. But now, as a piece of good fortune amid many untoward occurrences, the steam sloop of war Brooklyn, a new and formidable vessel of 25 guns, which had been engaged in making preliminary surveys in the Cherokee Lagoon to test the practicability of one of the proposed interoceanic ship canals, unexpectedly returned to the Norfolk Navy Yard on the 28th of November, less than a week before the meeting of Congress. She had until recently been under the command of Captain Farragut, afterwards famous in the War of the Rebellion, and was, with trifling exceptions, ready for sea. In the cabinet, where the feasibility of collecting the customs revenue at Charleston on shipboard had already been discussed as a possible contingency, and especially where the forcible protection of the public property had also received serious consideration. This sudden appearance of the Brooklyn must have furnished a conclusive reason in favor of both these propositions. Be this as it may, when the President affirmed these duties in his message, the conspirators realized that he held the means of practical enforcement at instantaneous command. With a ship of war ready at Norfolk, with troops at Fortress Monroe, might not a careless emeute at Charleston bring the much-dreaded reinforcements to Moultrie, Sumter, and Pinckney, precipitate a denouement, and prematurely ruin all their well-concocted schemes? There was urgent need to prevent the sailing of the steamer on such an errand. On Saturday, December 8th, Four of the representatives in Congress from South Carolina requested an interview of President Buchanan, which he granted them, in which they rehearsed their well-studied prediction of a collision at Charleston. One of their number has related the substance of their address with graphic frankness. Mr. President, it is our solemn conviction that if you attempt to send a solitary soldier to these forts the instant the intelligence reaches our people, and we shall take care that it does reach them, for we have sources of information in Washington so that no orders for troops can be issued without our getting information, these forts will be forcibly and immediately stormed. We all assured him that if any attempt was made to transport reinforcements, our people would take these forts, and that we would go home and help them to do it, for it would be suicidal folly for us to allow the forts to be manned. And we further said to him that a bloody result would follow the sending of troops to those forts, and that we did not believe 
that the authorities of South Carolina would do anything prior to the meeting of this convention, and that we hoped and believed that nothing would be done after this body met until we had demanded of the general government the recession of these forts. Here was an avowal to the president himself, not only of treason at Charleston, but of conspiracy in the executive departments at Washington. A demand coupled with a menace, a proposal for a ten days' truce, supplemented by a declaration of intention to proceed to extremities after its expiration. Instead of meeting these with a stern rebuke and dismissal, the President cowered and yielded to their demand. The sanctity of the Constitution, the majesty of the law, the power of the nation, the patriotism of the people, all faded from his bewildered vision. His resolute will shrank from his declared purpose to protect the public property and enforce the revenue laws. He saw only the picture of strife and bloodshed with the glib tongues of his persecutors conjured up and failed to detect the theatric purpose for which it was employed. He hastened to assure his visitors that it was his determination not to reinforce the forts in the harbor and thus produce a collision until they had been actually attacked or until he had certain evidence that they were about to be attacked. Though this was only another concession, much like the first in outward semblance, it was nevertheless in its vital essence a fatal hurt to the rapidly shrinking federal authority. The conspiracy had won the choice of position. When the combat should come, it was in the attitude necessary to deal the first blow. The main point secured, there was an exhibition of abundant diplomatic politeness between the parties. The president suggested that, for prudential reasons, it would be best to put in writing what they had said to him verbally. This they readily promised, and on Monday the 10th gave him, duly signed by five of the South Carolina representatives, this important paper. Washington, December 9, 1860. In compliance with our statement to you yesterday, we now express to you our strong convictions that neither the constituted authorities nor any body of the people of the state of South Carolina will either attack or molest the United States forts in the harbor of Charleston previously to the action of the convention. And we hope and believe not until an offer has been made through an accredited representative to negotiate for an amicable arrangement of all matters between the state and federal government, provided that no reinforcements shall be sent into those forts, and their relative military status shall remain as at present. When President Buchanan came to look at the explicit language of this document, he shrank from the definite program to which it committed him. I objected to the word provided, as it might be construed into an agreement on my part which I never would make. They said nothing was further from their intention. They did not so understand it, and I should not so consider it. There followed mutual protestations that the whole transaction was voluntary, informal, and in the nature of a mediation, that neither party possessed any delegated authority or binding power. They were not frank enough to explain to one another that the true object of each was delay, of the president that time might be gained for reflection of the members, that time might be gained for the unmolested meeting of the convention, for passing the ordinance of secession, for further organizing public sentiment, and pushing forward military preparations at Charleston. The mask of official propriety worn over this pernicious intrigue, the disclaimers, the implications and mental reservations of which it was made up, all became absurd in view of the result it produced. The president indeed explains that it was no pledge or agreement. But I acted, he naively admits, in the same manner as I would have done had I entered into a positive and formal agreement with parties capable of contracting, although such an agreement would have been on my part, from the nature of my official duties, impossible. 
The world knows that I have never sent any reinforcements to the forts in Charleston Harbor, and I have certainly never authorized any change to be made in their relative military status. While the conspirators were thus taking effectual steps to bind the future acts of the executive in respect to the forts in Charleston Harbor, and to make sure that the rising insurrection in South Carolina should not be crippled or destroyed by any surprise or sudden movement emanating from Washington, they were not less watchful to counteract and prevent any possible hostile movement against them on the part of Major Anderson and his handful of officers and troops in Fort Moultrie, undertaken on his own discretion. Their boast of secret sources of information in Washington, coupled with subsequent events, furnish presumptive evidence that Mr. Floyd, Secretary of War, though yet openly opposing disunion, was already in their confidence and counsels, and was lending them such active cooperation as might be disguised or perhaps still excused to his own conscience as tending to avert collision and bloodshed. Shortly before, or about the time of the truce we have described, Secretary Floyd sent an officer of the War Department to Fort Moultrie with special verbal instructions to Major Anderson, which were duly communicated, and the substance of them reduced to writing and delivered to that officer on the 11th of December, the day following the conclusion of the President's unofficial truce at Washington. The importance of this document renders it worthy of reproduction in complete form. Memorandum of Verbal Instructions to Major Anderson, 1st Artillery, Commanding at Fort Moultrie, South Carolina. You are aware of the great anxiety of the Secretary of State that a collision of the troops with the people of this state shall be avoided and of his studied determination to pursue a course with reference to the military force and forts in this harbor which shall guard against such a collision. He has therefore carefully abstained from increasing the force at this point, or taking any measures which might add to the present excited state of the public mind, or which would throw any doubt on the confidence he feels that South Carolina will not attempt by violence to obtain possession of the public works or interfere with their occupancy. But as the counsel and acts of rash and impulsive persons may possibly disappoint these expectations of the government, he deems it proper that you shall be prepared with instructions to meet so unhappy a contingency. He has therefore directed me verbally to give you such instructions. You are carefully to avoid every act which would needlessly tend to provoke aggression. And for that reason, you are not, without evident and imminent necessity, to take up any position which could be construed into the assumption of a hostile attitude. But you are to hold possession of the forts in this harbor, and if attacked, you are to defend yourself to the last extremity. The smallness of your force will not permit you, perhaps, to occupy more than one of the three forts, but an attack on or attempt to take possession of either one of them will be regarded as an act of hostility, and you may then put your command into either of them which you may deem most proper to increase its power of resistance. You are also authorized to take similar defensive steps whenever you have tangible evidence of a design to proceed to a hostile act. D.C. Buell, Assistant Adjutant General, Fort Moultrie, South Carolina, December 11, 1860. This is in conformity to my instructions to Major Buell, John B. Floyd, Secretary of War. Upon mere superficial inspection, these instructions disclosed only the then-dominant anxiety of the administration to prevent collision. But if we remember that they were sent to Major Anderson without the President's knowledge and without the knowledge of General Scott, and especially if we keep in sight the state of public sentiment of both Charleston and Washington and the paramount official influences which had taken definite shape in the President's truce, 
we can easily read between the lines that they were most artfully contrived to lull suspicion while effectually restraining Major Anderson from any act or movement which might check or control the insurrectionary preparations. He must do nothing to provoke aggression. He must take no hostile attitude without evident and imminent necessity. He must not move his troops into Fort Sumter unless it were attempted to attack or take possession of one of the forts of such a design were tangibly manifested. Practically, when the attempt to seize the vacant forts might come, it would be too late to prevent it, and certainly too late to move his own force into either of them. Practically, too, any serious design of that nature would never be permitted to come to his knowledge. Supplement these literal negations and restrictions by the unrecorded verbal explanations and comments said to have been made by Major Buell, by his disapproval of the meager defensive preparations which had been made, such as his declaration that a few loopholes would have a tendency to irritate the people. And we can readily imagine how a faithful officer, whose reiterated calls for help had been refused, felt that under such instructions, such surroundings, and such neglect, his hands were tied, and that he and his little command were a foredoomed sacrifice. End of chapter 24 Recorded by Sheila Blunt Chapter 25 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Jay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 25. The Retirement of Cass. Thus far, Mr. Buchanan's policy of conciliation through concession had brought him nothing but disappointment, and whatever faint hope his loyal cabinet advisers may have had at the outset in its saving efficacy was by practical experiment utterly destroyed. The non-coercion doctrine had been adopted as early as November 20, in the Attorney General's opinion of that date. The fact was rumored, not only in the political circles of the capital, but in the chief newspapers of the country. And the three secession members of the cabinet had doubtless communicated it confidentially to all their prominent and influential Confederates. Since that time, South Carolina had continued her preparation for secession with unremitting industry. Mississippi had authorized a convention and appointed commissioners to visit all the slave states and propagate disunion. Among them, Mr. Thompson, Buchanan's Secretary of the Interior, who afterwards exercised this insurrectionary function while yet remaining in the cabinet. The North Carolina legislature had postponed the election of the United States Senator. Florida had passed a convention bill. Georgia had instituted legislative proceedings to bring about a conference of the southern states at Atlanta. Both houses of the National Congress had rung with secession speeches, while frequent caucuses of the conspirators took place at Washington. Mr. Buchanan's truce with the South Carolina representatives had as little effect in arresting the secession intrigues as his non-coercion doctrine officially announced in the annual message. On the evening of the day, December 8, on which he received the South Carolina pledge, the Secretary of the Treasury, Powell Cobb of Georgia, tendered his resignation, announcing in the same letter his intention to embark in the active work of disunion. It had been generally understood that the non-coercion theories of the message were adopted by the President in deference to the wishes and under the influence of Cobb, Thompson, and Floyd, and undoubtedly they had also been largely instrumental in bringing about the unofficial truce at Charleston. If, 
amid all his fears, Mr. Buchanan retained any sensibility, he must have been profoundly shocked at the cool dissimulation with which Mr. Cobb, everywhere recognized as a cabinet officer of great ability, had assisted in committing the administration to these fatal doctrines and measures, and then abandoned it in the moment of danger. My withdrawal, he wrote to the president, has not been occasioned by anything you have said or done. Whilst differing from your message upon some of its theoretical doctrines, as well as from the hope so earnestly expressed that the Union can be preserved, there was no practical result likely to follow which required me to retire from your administration. That necessity is created by what I feel it my duty to do, and the responsibility of the act, therefore, rests up alone upon itself. Ignoring the fact that the Treasury was prosperous and solvent when he took charge of it, and that at the moment of his leaving it could not pay its drafts, Mr. Cobb, five days later, published a long and inflammatory address to the people of Georgia, concluding with this exhortation, I entertain no doubt either of your right or duty to secede from the Union. Arouse, then, all your manhood for the great work before you, and be prepared on that day to announce and maintain your independence out of the Union, for you will never again have equality and justice in it. The President had scarcely found a successor for Mr. Cobb when the head of the Cabinet, Lewis Cass, Secretary of State, tendered his resignation also, and retired from the administration. Mr. Cass had held many offices of distinction, had attained high rank as a Democratic leader, and had once been a presidential candidate. His resignation was therefore an event of great significance from a political point of view. The incident brings into bold relief the mental reservations under which Buchanan's paradoxical theories had been concurred in by his cabinet. A private memorandum in Mr. Buchanan's handwriting, commenting on the event, makes the following emphatic statement. His resignation was the more remarkable on account of the cause he assigned for it. When my late message of December 1860 was read to the cabinet before it was printed, General Cass expressed his unreserved and hearty approbation of it, accompanied by every sign of deep and sincere feeling. He had but one objection to it, and this was that it was not sufficiently strong against the power of Congress to make war upon a state for the purpose of compelling her to remain in the Union. And the denial of this power was made more emphatic and distinct upon his own suggestion. But this position was probably qualified and counterbalanced in his mind by the President's direct promise that he would collect the federal revenue and protect the federal property. In the nature of things, the execution of this policy must not only precede, but exclude all other theories and abstractions, and the Secretary of State probably waited in good faith to see the President execute the laws. Little by little, however, delay and concession rendered this impossible. The collector at Charleston still nominally exercised his functions as a federal officer, but it was an open secret among the Charleston authorities, and one which must also by this time have been come known to the government at Washington, that he was only holding the place in trust for the coming secession convention. As to protecting the federal property, the refusal to send Anderson troops, the president's truce, the gradual development of Mr. Buchanan's irresolution and lack of courage, and finally, Mr. Cobb's open defection must have convinced Mr. Cass that under existing determinations, orders, and influences, it was a hopeless prospect. The whole question seems to have been finally decided in a long and stormy cabinet session held on December 13. The events of the few preceding days had evidently shaken the president's confidence in his own policy. He startled his dissembling and conspiring Secretary of War with the sudden questions. Mr. Floyd, are you going to send recruits to Charleston to strengthen the forts? 
Don't you intend to strengthen the forts at Charleston? The apparent change of policy alarmed the secretary, but he replied promptly that he did not. Mr. Floyd, continued Mr. Buchanan, I would rather be in the bottom of the Potomac tomorrow than that these forts in Charleston should fall into the hands of those who intend to take them. It will destroy me, sir, and Mr. Floyd, if that thing occurs, it will cover your name with an infamy that all time can never efface, because it is in vain that you will attempt to show that you have not some complicity in handing over those forts to those who take them. The wily secretary replied, I will risk my reputation. I will trust my life that the forts are safe under the declarations of the gentlemen of Charleston. This is all very well, replied the president, but does that secure the forts? No, sir, but it is a guarantee that I am in earnest, said Floyd. I am not satisfied, said the president. Thereupon, the secretary made the never-failing appeal to the fears and timidity of Mr. Buchanan. He has himself reported the language he used. I am sorry for it, said he. You are president. It is for you to order. You have the right to order, and I will consider your order when made. But I would be recreant to you if I did not tell you that this policy of garrisoning the forts will lead to certain conflicts. It is the inauguration of civil war and the beginning of the effusion of blood. If it is a question of property, why not put an ordnance sergeant into them, a man who wears worsted epaulets on his shoulders and stripes down his pantaloons as the representative of the property of the United States? That will be enough to secure the forts. If it is a question of property, he represents it, and let us wait until the issue is made by South Carolina. She will go out of the Union and send her commissioners here. Up to that point, the action is insignificant. Action after this demands the attention of the great council of the nation. Let us submit the question to Congress. It is for Congress to deal with the matter. This crafty appeal to the president's hesitating inclinations, and in accord with his policy hitherto pursued, was seconded by the active persuasions of the leading conspirators of Congress, whom Floyd promptly called to his assistance. I called for help from that bright saladin of the South, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi, and I said, come to my rescue. The battle is a little more than my weak heart can support. Come to me. And he came. Then came that old, jovial-looking, noble-hearted representative from Virginia, James M. Madison. Here came that anomaly of modern times. The youthful Nestor, here came Hunter. From the North, the South, the East, and the West, there came up the patriots of the country, the champions of constitutional liberty, and they talked with the President of the United States, and they quieted his fears and assured him in the line of duty. They said, let there be no force, and the President said to me, I'm content with your policy, and then it was that we determined that we would send no more troops to the harbor in Charleston. Strip this statement of its oratorical exaggeration, and the reader can nevertheless see, in the light of after-occurrences, a vivid and truthful picture of a conspiring cabal, stooping to arts and devices difficult to distinguish from direct personal treachery, flattering, threatening, and coaxing by turns, and finally lulling the fears of the president through his vain hope that they would help him tide over a magnified danger and shift upon Congress a responsibility he had not the courage to meet. Mr. Cass, however, could no longer be quieted. Through all the rhetoric, sophistry, and bluster of the conspirators, he saw the diminishing resources of the government and the rising power of the insurrection. With a last bold effort to rouse the president from his lethargy, he demanded, in the cabinet meeting of the 13th, that the forts should be strengthened. But he was powerless to break the spell, says Floyd. The president said to him in reply, with a beautiful countenance and with a heroic decision that I shall never forget, in the council chamber, I have considered this question. I am sorry to differ from the secretary of state. I have made up my mind. The interests of the country do not demand a reinforcement of the forces in Charleston. I cannot do it 
and I take the responsibility of it upon myself. The letters which were exchanged between the President and his premier set out the differences between them with the same distinctness. Mr. Cass, after premising that he concurred with the general principles laid down in the message, says, In some points which I deem of vital importance, it has been my misfortune to differ from you. It has been my decided opinion, which for some time past I have urged at various meetings of the cabinet, that additional troops should be sent to reinforce the forts in the harbor of Charleston with a view to their better defense should they be attacked, and that an armed vessel should likewise be ordered there to aid, if necessary, in the defense and also should it be required in the collection of the revenue, and it is yet my opinion that these measures should be adopted without the least delay. I have likewise urged the expediency of immediately removing the Custom House at Charleston to one of the forts and in the port, and of making arrangements for the collection of the duties there by having a collector and other officers ready to act when necessary, so that when the office may become vacant, the proper authority may be there to collect the duties on the part of the United States. I continue to think that these arrangements should be immediately made. While the right and the responsibility of deciding belong to you, it is very desirable that at this perilous juncture there should be, as far as possible, unanimity in your councils and with a view to safe and efficient action. To this statement the President replied, the question on which we unfortunately differ is that of ordering a detachment of the Army and Navy to Charleston, and is correctly stated in your letter of resignation. I do not intend to argue this question. Suffice it to say that your remarks upon the subject were heard by myself and the Cabinet, with all the respect due to your high position, your long experience, and your unblemished character but they failed to convince us of the necessity and propriety under existing circumstances of adopting such a measure. The secretaries of war and of the Navy, through whom the orders must have issued to reinforce the forts, did not concur in your views. And whilst the whole responsibility for the refusal rested upon myself, they were the members of the cabinet more directly interested. You may have judged correctly on this important question, and your opinion is entitled to grave consideration. But under my convictions of duty, and believing as I do that no present necessity exists for a resort to force for the protection of the public property, it was impossible for me to have risked a collision of arms in the harbor of Charleston and thereby defeated the reasonable hope which I cherish of the final triumph of the Constitution and of the Union. The other Union members of the Cabinet received the rumor of Mr. Cass's resignation with gloomy apprehensions. Postmaster General Holt, with whom by reason of their kindred opinions he had been on intimate terms, hastened to him to learn whether it were indeed true, and whether his determination were irrevocable. Cass confirmed the report, saying that representing the northern and loyal constituency which he did, he could no longer, without dishonor to himself and to them, remain in such treasonable surroundings. Holt endeavored to persuade him that, under the circumstances, it was all the more necessary that the loyal members of the cabinet should remain at their posts, in order to prevent the country's passing into the hands of the secessionists by mere default. But Cass replied, no, that the public feeling and sentiment of his section would not tolerate such a policy on his part. For you, he said, coming from a border state, where a modified, perhaps a divided, public sentiment exists, that is not only a possible course, but it is a true one. It is your duty to remain, to sustain the executive and counteract the plots of the traitors, but my duty is otherwise. I must adhere to my resignation. In this honorable close of a long public career, General Cass gave evidence of the spirit which was to actuate many patriotic Democrats when the final ordeal came. It was to be regretted 
that he had not taken issue with his chief when his paradoxical message was read to the cabinet, but much is to be allowed to the inertness of a man in his seventy-ninth year. Lifelong placeman and unflinching partisan that he was, there was still so much of patriotic conscience in him that he could not stand by and see premeditated dishonor done to the flag he had followed in his youth and as Jackson, Secretary of War, upheld in his maturer years. If Mr. Buchanan had been capable of amendment, he might have learned a salutary lesson from the manner in which this veteran politician ended his half-century of public service. End of chapter 25. Recorded by Sheila Blunt. Chapter 26 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 26. The Senate Committee of Thirteen. The President's message provoked immediate and heated controversy in Congress. In the Senate, the battle was begun by the radical secessionists, who at once avowed their main plans and purposes. Mr. Clingman of North Carolina, opening the debate, predicted that the same political organization which had elected Lincoln must soon control the entire government, and being guided by a sentiment hostile to the Southern states, would change the whole character of the government without abolishing its forms. A number of states would secede within the next 60 days. Mr. Brown of Mississippi said the accumulating wrongs of years had finally culminated in the triumph of principles to which they could not and would not submit. All they asked was to be allowed to depart in peace. Mr. Iverson of Georgia, invoking not only secession but revolution and assassination, announced specifically the hopes of the conspirators. I am satisfied that South Carolina will resolve herself into a separate sovereign and independent state before the Ides of January, that Florida and Mississippi, whose conventions are soon to meet, will follow the example of South Carolina, and that Alabama will go out of the Union on the 7th of January. Then the Georgia Convention follows on the 16th of that month, and if these other surrounding sisters shall take the step, Georgia will not be behind. I speak what I believe on this floor, that before the 4th of March, five of the southern states at least will have declared their independence, and I am satisfied that three others of the cotton states will follow as soon as the action of the people can be had. Arkansas, whose legislature is now in session, will in all probability call a convention at an early day. Louisiana will follow. Her legislature is to meet, and although there is a clog in the way of the Lone Star State of Texas in the person of her governor, if he does not yield to public sentiment, some Texan Brutus will arise to rid his country of the hoary-headed incubus that stands between the people and their sovereign will. We intend, Mr. President, to go out peaceably if we can, forcibly if we must." Senator Wigfall of Texas took a high revolutionary attitude. We simply say that a man who is distasteful to us has been elected, and we choose to consider that as a sufficient ground for leaving the Union. He said he should introduce a resolution at an early moment to ascertain what are the orders that have gone from the War Department to the officers in command of those forts at Charleston. If the people of South Carolina believed that this government would hold those forts and collect the revenues from them after they had ceased to be one of the states of this union, his judgment was that the moment they became satisfied of that fact, they would take the forts, and blood would then begin to flow. Mr. Mason of Virginia said he looked upon the evil as a war of sentiment and opinion by one form of society against another form of society. The remedy rested in the political society and state councils of the several states, and not in Congress. His state and a great many others of the slaveholding states 
were going into convention with a view to take up the subject for themselves, and as separate sovereign communities to determine what was best for their safety. Senator Jefferson Davis of Mississippi was more reticent than politic, though no less positive and significant in his brief expression. As a senator of the United States, he said he was there to perform his functions as such, that before a declaration of war was made against the state of which he was a citizen, he expected to be out of the chamber, that when the declaration was made, his state would be found ready and quite willing to meet it. The Republican senators maintained for the greater part a discreet silence. To exult in their triumph would be undignified. To hasten forward officiously with offers of pacification or submission and barter away the substantial fruits of their victory would not only make them appear pusillanimous in the eyes of their own party, but bring down upon them the increased contempt of their assailants. There remained, therefore, nothing but silence and the feeble hope that this first fury of the disunion onset might spend itself in angry words and be followed by calmer counsels. Nevertheless, it was difficult to keep entirely still under the irritating provocation. On the third day of the session, Senator Hale of New Hampshire replied to both the President's message and Klingman's speech. Mr. Hale thought, this state of affairs looks to one of two things. It looks to absolute submission, not on the part of our southern friends and the southern states, but of the north, to the abandonment of their position. It looks to a surrender of that popular sentiment which has been uttered through the constituted forms of the ballot box, or it looks to open war. We did not shut our eyes to the fact. It means war and it means nothing else, and the state which has put herself in the attitude of secession so looks upon it. If it is pre-announced and determined that the voice of the majority expressed through the regular and constituted forms of the Constitution will not be submitted to, then, sir, this is not a union of equals. It is a union of dictatorial oligarchy on the one side and a herd of slaves and cowards on the other. That is it, sir. Nothing more, nothing less. While the Southern Democratic Party and the Republican Party thus drifted into defiant attitudes, the other two parties of, to the late presidential contest naturally fell into the role of peacemakers. In this work, they were somewhat embarrassed by their party record, for they had joined loudly in the current charge of abolitionism against the people of the North, and especially against the Republican Party. Nevertheless, they not only came forward to tender the olive branch and to deprecate and rebuke the threats and extreme measures of the disunionists, but even went so far as to deny and disapprove the staple complaints of the conspirators. It must be remembered to the lasting honor of Senator Crittenden that at the very outset of the discussion, he repudiated the absurd theory of non-coercion. I do not agree that there is no power in the president to preserve the union. I will say that now. If we have a union at all, and if, as the president thinks, there is no right to secede on the part of any state, and I agree with him in that, I think there is a right to employ our power to preserve the union. Senator Pugh of Ohio, saying that he lived on the border of the slaveholding and non-slaveholding states, contended that the fugitive slave law was executed every day or nearly every day. It was in constant operation. He would venture to say that the slave states had not lost $100,000 worth of slave property since they had been in the Union through negligence or refusal to execute it. Senator Douglas of Illinois said he supposed the fugitive slave law was enforced with quite as much fidelity as that in regard to the African slave trade or the laws on many other subjects. It so happens that there is the greatest excitement upon this question just in proportion as you recede from the line between the free and the slave states. If you go north, up into Vermont, where they scarcely ever see a slave and would not know how he looked, they are disturbed by the wrongs of the poor slave just in proportion as they are ignorant of the South. When you get down south into Georgia and Alabama, 
where they never lose any slaves, they are disturbed by the outrages and losses under the non-fulfillment of the fugitive slave law just in proportion as they have no interest in it and do not know what they are talking about. Meanwhile, Senator Powell of Kentucky, having given notice on the 5th, had on the 6th of December introduced a resolution to raise a special committee, afterwards known as the Senate Committee of 13, to concert measures of compromise or pacification, either through legislation or constitutional amendments. He said, however, he did not believe any legislation would be a remedy unequivocal constitutional guarantees upon the points indicated in the resolution under consideration were, in his judgment, the only remedies that would reach and eradicate the disease, give permanent security, and restore fraternal feeling between the people, North and South, and save the Union from speedy dissolution. Let us never despair of the Republic, but go to work promptly, and so amend the Constitution, as to give certain and full guarantees to the rights of every citizen in every state and territory of the Union. The Republicans on this resolution generally offered only verbal criticisms or expressed their full approbation of its provisions. Senator King of New York, offering an amendment, explained that while we hear occasionally of a mob destroying property, we also hear occasionally of a mob which assails an individual. He thought the security of person as important as that of property, and would therefore extend the inquiry to all these objects, if made at all. Senator Collamer of Vermont suggested striking out all about the condition of the country and the rights of property, and simply referring that part of the message which relates to the State of the Union to a special committee. Senator Foster of Connecticut said if there was a disposition here to promote the peace and harmony of the country, the resolution was a most appropriate one under which to make the effort. Senator Hale of New Hampshire said he was willing to meet any and everybody and say that if there can be pointed out anything in which the state that he represented had come short of her whole constitutional duty in letter and in spirit, she will do what she never did in the face of an enemy, and that is, take a backward step. She was ready to perform her whole constitutional duty and to stand there. Senator Green of Missouri, while he joined the general cry of northern anti-slavery aggression and neglect of constitutional obligations, deemed it his duty to assist in making a united effort to save the Union. If he believed the present state of public sentiment of the North was to be enduring, he would say it is folly to talk about patching up the Union. But he looked forward to a reaction of public sentiment, amendments to the Constitution, legal enactments, or repeal of personal liberty laws are not worth a straw unless the popular sentiment or the strong arm of the government goes with them. He proposed to employ adequate physical force to maintain existing constitutional rights. He did not want any additional constitutional rights. He offered a resolution to inquire into the propriety of providing by law for establishing an armed police force upon all necessary points along the line separating the slaveholding states from the non-slaveholding states for the purpose of maintaining the general peace between those states of preventing the invasion of one state by the citizens of another, and also for the efficient execution of the fugitive slave law. Senator Jefferson Davis of Mississippi denounced this proposition as a quack nostrum. He feared it was to rear a monster which would break the feeble chain provided and destroy the rights it was intended to guard. Establishing military posts along the borders of states conferred a power upon this federal government which it does not now possess, to coerce a state. It was providing under the name of a union to carry on war against states. From the history and nature of our government, no power of coercion exists in it. Senator Brown, also of Mississippi, was no less emphatic in his condemnation of the scheme. He said that a Southern senator representing a state as much exposed as Missouri should deliberately, in times like these, propose to arm the federal government 
for the purpose of protecting the frontier, to establish military posts all along the line, struck him with astonishment. He saw in this proposition the germ of a military despotism. He did not know what was to become of these armies or what was to be done with these military posts. He feared in the hands of the enemy they might be turned against the South. They would hardly ever be turned against the North. Senator Green, in his reply, justly exposed the whole animus and thinly concealed import of these rough criticisms by retorting that to call that a military despotism amounts to just this. We are going out of the Union right or wrong and we will misrepresent every proposition made to save the Union. Who has fought the battles of the South for the last 25 years and borne the brunt of the difficulty upon the border? Missouri, Kentucky, Virginia, and Maryland, while Mississippi and Louisiana have been secure, and while you have lost but one boxed-up Negro sent on board a vessel that I remember, we have lost thousands and thousands. He knew it was unpopular in some sections to say a word for the Union. He hoped that feeling would react. Means to enforce and carry out the Constitution ought not to be ridiculed by calling it a quack remedy. It is more likely that we may find in the response of Senator Iverson of Georgia the true reason which actuated the cotton state leaders in driving their people into revolution, regardless of the remonstrances of the border states. Sir, the border slave states of this Union complain of the cotton states for the movement which is now in progress. They say that we have no right to take them out of the Union against their will. I want to know what right they have to keep us in the Union against our will. If we want to go out, let us go. If they want to stay, let them stay. They are sovereign and independent states and have a right to decide these questions for themselves. For one, I shall not complain when, where, or how they go. I'm satisfied, however, that they will go when the time comes for them to decide. But, sir, they complain of us that we make so much noise and confusion on the subject of fugitive slaves when we are not affected by the vitiated public sentiment of the northern states. They say that we do not lose fugitive slaves, but they suffer the burden. We heard that yesterday. I know that we do not suffer in this respect. It is not the want of good faith in the northern people, so far as the reclamation of fugitive slaves is concerned, that is causing the southern states around the Gulf of Mexico and the southern Atlantic coast to move in this great revolution now progressing. Sir, we look infinitely beyond this petty loss of a few Negroes. We know what is coming in this union. It is universal emancipation and the turning loose upon society in the southern states of the mass of corruption which will be made by emancipation. We intend to avoid it if we can. These border states can get along without slavery. Their soil and climate are not appropriate to white labor. They can live and nourish without African slavery, but the cotton states cannot. We are obliged to have African slavery to cultivate our cotton, our rice, and our sugar fields. African slavery is essential not only to our prosperity, but to our existence as a people. I understand one of the motives which influence the tardy action of these two states, Virginia and Maryland. They are a little afraid of the opening of the African slave trade and the cheapening of Negroes. Now, sir, while I state here that I am opposed to the opening of the African slave trade, because our Negroes will increase fast enough, God knows, for our interest and protection and security. And while I believe that the great masses of the Southern people are opposed to it, yet I will not stand security that if the cotton states alone form a confederacy, they will not open the African slave trade. And then, what will become of the great monopoly of the Negro market, which Virginia and Maryland and North Carolina now possess? The disunion senators while indulging in the violent and uncompromising language already quoted, had nevertheless here and there interjected phrases indicating a willingness to come to an understanding and adjustment, but their object in this seemed to be twofold. For a few days longer it would serve as a partial screen to their more active conspiracy, 
and in the possible event, which they evidently did not expect, of a complete surrender and abdication of their political victory by the Republican Party, it would leave them in the advantageous condition of accepting triumph as a fruit of compromise. Thus, Senator Klingman said, if gentlemen on the other side have anything to propose of a decisive and satisfactory character, I have no doubt the section from which I come would be willing to hear it. Senator Davis said, If we are mistaken as to your feelings and purpose, give us substantial proof that here may begin that circle which hence may spread out and cover the whole land with proofs of fraternity, of a reaction in public sentiment, and the assurance of a future career in conformity with the principles and purposes of the Constitution. Senator Brown said he never intimated they would not listen to appeals. He never said this case could not be adjusted. But he said there was no disposition on the Republican side to do it. Senator Wigfall said, What is the use of our discussing on this side of the chamber what we would be satisfied with when nothing has been offered us? It requires a minute's search to find the scattered words of moderation in the torrent of defiance which characterizes the speeches of the extreme disunionists during the first ten days of the session of Congress, and indications were not lacking that even these were wholly insincere and meant only to mislead their opponents and the public. Strong proof of this is found in the careful speech of Senator Jefferson Davis, in which he lays down the issue without reserve, at the same time dealing in such vague and intangible complaints as showed intention and desire to remain unanswered and unsatisfied. He said he believed the danger to be that a sectional hostility had been substituted for the general fraternity, and thus the government rendered powerless for the ends for which it was instituted. The hearts of a portion of the people have been perverted by that hostility, so that the powers delegated by the compact of union are regarded not as means to secure the welfare of all, but as instruments for the destruction of a part, the minority section. How, then, have we to provide a remedy? By strengthening this government? By instituting physical force to overawe the states, to coerce the people living under them as members of sovereign communities, to pass under the yoke of the federal government? Then where is the remedy? The question may be asked. In the hearts of the people is the ready reply, and therefore it is that I turn to the other side of the chamber, to the majority section, to the section in which have been committed the acts that now threaten the dissolution of the Union. These are offenses such as no people can bear, and the remedy for these is in the patriotism and the affection of the people, if it exists. And if it does not exist, it is far better, instead of attempting to preserve a forced and therefore fruitless union, that we should peacefully part and each pursue his separate course. States, in their sovereign capacity, have now resolved to judge or of the infractions of the federal compact and of the mode and measure of redress. I would not give the parchment on which the bill would be written, which is to secure our constitutional rights within the limits of a state where the people are all opposed to the execution of that law. It is a truism in free governments that laws rest upon public opinion and fall powerless before its determined opposition. To all that had so far been said, Senator Wade of Ohio made on the 17th day of December a frank and direct as well as strong and eloquent reply, which was at once generally accepted by the Republican Party of the Senate and the country as their well-considered and unalterable position on the crisis. Said he, I have already said that these gentlemen who make these complaints have for a long series of years had this government in their own keeping. They belong to the dominant majority. Therefore, if there is anything in the legislation of the federal government that is not right, you and not we are responsible for it. You have had the legislative power of the country, and you have had the executive of the country, as I have said already. You own the cabinet, you own the Senate, 
and I may add, you own the President of the United States, as much as you own the servant upon your own plantation. I cannot see then very clearly why it is that Southern men can rise here and complain of the action of this government. Are we the setters forth of any new doctrines under the Constitution of the United States? I tell you nay. There is no principle held today by this great Republican Party that has not had the sanction of your government in every department for more than 70 years. You have changed your opinions. We stand where we used to stand. That is the only difference. Sir, we stand where Washington stood, where Jefferson stood, where Madison stood, where Monroe stood. We stand where Adams and Jackson and even Polk stood. That revered statesman Henry Clay, of blessed memory, with his dying breath asserted the doctrine that we hold today. As to compromises, I had supposed that we were all agreed that the day of compromises was at an end. The most solemn compromises we have ever made have been violated without a whereas. Since I have had a seat in this body, one of considerable antiquity that had stood for more than 30 years, was swept away from your statute books. We nominated our candidates for president and vice president, and you did the same for yourselves. The issue was made up, and we went to the people upon it. And we beat you upon the plainest and most palpable issue that ever was presented to the American people, and one that they understood the best. There is no mistaking it. And now, when we come to the Capitol, I tell you that our president and our vice president must be inaugurated and administer the government as all their predecessors have done. Sir, it would be humiliating and dishonorable to us if we were to listen to a compromise only by which he who has the verdict of the people in his pocket should make his way to the presidential chair. When it comes to that, you have no government. If a state secedes, although we will not make war upon her, we cannot recognize her right to be out of the Union, and she is not out until she gains the consent of the Union itself. And the chief magistrate of the nation, be he who he may, will find under the Constitution of the United States that it is his sworn duty to execute the law in every part and parcel of this government, that he cannot be released from that obligation. Therefore, it will be incumbent on the chief magistrate to proceed to collect the revenue of ships entering their ports precisely in the same way and to the same extent that he does now in every other state of the Union. We cannot release him from that obligation. The Constitution, in thunder tones, demands that he shall do it alike in the ports of every state. What follows? Why, sir... If he shuts up the ports of entry so that a ship cannot discharge her cargo there or get papers for another voyage, then ships will cease to trade. Or if he undertakes to blockade her and thus collect it, she has not gained her independence by secession. What must she do? If she is contented to live in this equivocal state, all would be well perhaps. But she could not live there. No people in the world could live in that condition. What will they do? They must take the initiative and declare war upon the United States. And the moment that they levy war, force must be met by force. And they must, therefore, hew out their independence by violence and war. There is no other way under the Constitution that I know of, whereby a chief magistrate of any politics could be released from this duty. If this state though seceding, should declare war against the United States, I do not suppose there is a lawyer in this body, but what would say that the act of levying war is treason against the United States? That is where it results. We might just as well look the matter right in the face. I say, sir, I stand by the union of these states. Washington and his compatriots fought for that good old flag, it shall never be hauled down, but shall be the glory of the government to which I belong, as long as my life shall continue. It is my inheritance. It was my protector in infancy, and the pride and glory of my riper years. 
and although it may be assailed by traitors on every side, by the grace of God, under its shadow I will die. The Senate Committee of Thirteen was duly appointed on December 20 as follows. Lazarus W. Powell and John J. Crittenden of Kentucky, R. M. T. Hunter of Virginia, William H. Seward of New York, Robert Toombs of Georgia, Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois, Jacob Collimer of Vermont, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi, Benjamin F. Wade of Ohio, William Bigler of Pennsylvania, Henry M. Rice of Minnesota, James E. Doolittle of Wisconsin, and James W. Grimes of Iowa. It was a strong and representative committee chosen from the four great political parties to the late presidential election and embracing recognized leaders in each. We shall see in a future chapter how this eminent committee failed to report a compromise, which was the object of its appointment. But compromise was impossible because the conspiracy had resolved upon disunion, as already announced in the proclamation of a Southern Confederacy, signed and published a week before by Jefferson Davis and others. End of chapter 26. Recorded by Sheila Blunt. Chapter 27 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2 by John Jay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 27. The House Committee of 33. While this discussion was going on in the Senate, very similar proceedings were taking place in the House of Representatives, except that declarations of revolutionary purpose were generally of a more practical and decisive character. The President's message had no sooner been received and read, and the usual formal motion made to refer in print, than the Friends of Compromise, representing here, as in the Senate, the substantial sentiment of the border slave states, made a sincere effort to take control and bring about the peaceable arrangement and adjustment of what they assumed to be the extreme differences between the South and the North. Mr. Boteler of Virginia, seizing the momentary leadership, moved to amend by referring so much of the message as relates to the present perilous condition of the country to a special committee of one from each state. The Union being at that time composed of 33 states, this committee became known as the Committee of 33. Several other amendments were offered but objected to, and the previous question having been ordered, the amendment was agreed to and the committee raised by a vote of 145 yeas to 38 nays, the negative vote coming in the main from the more pronounced anti-slavery men. Though this was the first roll call of the session, the disunion conspirators, one after another, made haste to declare the treasonable attitude of their states. Pending the vote, Mr. Singleton declined recording his name for the reason that Mississippi had called a convention to consider this subject. He was not sent here for the purpose of making any compromise or to patch up existing difficulties. Mr. Jones of Georgia said he did not vote on this question because his state, like Mississippi, had called a convention to decide all these questions of federal relations. Mr. Hawkins of Florida said his people had resolved to determine, in convention in their sovereign capacity, the time, place, and manner of redress. It was not for him to take any action on the subject. His state was opposed to all and every compromise. The day of compromise was passed. Mr. Clopton of Alabama declined voting because the state of Alabama is proceeding to consider in a convention what action is required to maintain her rights, honor, and safety. Believing that a state has the right to secede and that the only remedy for present evils is secession, he would not hold out any delusive hope 
or sanction any temporizing policy, Mr. Miles of South Carolina said, the South Carolina delegation have not voted on this question because they conceive they have no interest in it. We consider our state as already withdrawn from the Confederacy in everything except form. Mr. Pugh of Alabama said, As my state of Alabama intends following South Carolina out of the Union by the 10th of January next, I pay no attention to any action taken in this body. These proceedings occurred on the second day of the session, December 4. Two days later, the Speaker announced the committee, placing at the head, as chairman, Thomas Corwin of Ohio, and appointing such members from the different states as to make it of marked influence and ability. The disunion faction being distinctly recognized by several extreme representatives. The names were announced on Thursday, December 6. And at the close of the day's session, the House adjourned to the following Monday, the 10th, on which day the general discussion was fairly launched on the request of Mr. Hawkins of Florida to be excused from serving on the committee. He said he had asked the opinions of many Southern members, and with one or two exceptions, they most cordially agreed with the course he had taken. To serve on the committee would place him in a false position. Florida had taken the initiative. Her legislature had ordered an election to choose members to a convention to be convened on the third day of January, 1861. The committee was a Trojan horse to gain time and demoralize the South. He regretted that it emanated from a Virginia representative. He would tell the North that Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina were certain to secede from the Union within a short period. Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas were certain to follow within the ensuing six months. Three Democratic representatives responded to this outburst, the Republican members of the House, as in the Senate, remaining discreetly silent. These Democratic speakers alleged an unfair composition of the committee and joined in denouncing the Republican Party. But upon the vital and practical question of disunion, their utterances were widely divergent, as the name of each of them will assume a degree of historical prominence in the further development of the rebellion. Short quotations from their remarks made at that early period will be read with interest, Daniel E. Sickles of New York said. The city of New York will cling to the Union to the last, while she will look upon the last hour of its existence as we would upon the setting sun if we were never to see it more, Yet, when the call for force comes, let it come when it may, no man will ever pass the boundaries of the city of New York for the purpose of waging war against any state of this union, which, through its constituted authorities and sustained by the voice of its people, solemnly declares its rights, its interests, and its honor, demand that it should seek safety in a separate existence. The city of New York is now a subjugated dependency of a fanatical and puritanical state government that never thinks of the city except to send its tax gatherers among us or to impose upon us hateful officials alien to our interests and sympathies to eat up the substance of the people by their legalized extortions. Nothing has prevented the city of New York from asserting her right to govern herself except that provision of the federal constitution which prohibits a state from being divided without its own consent. When that restraint shall no longer exist, when the obligation of those constitutional provisions which forbid the division of a state without its own consent shall be suspended, then I tell you that Imperial City will throw off the odious government to which she now yields a reluctant allegiance. She will repel the hateful cabal at Albany, which has so long abused its power over her, and with her own flag, sustained by the courage and devotion of her own gallant sons, she will, as a free city, open wide her gates to the civilization and commerce of the world. Doubtless, the secessionists drew hopeful auguries and fresh inspiration from this and other visionary talk frequent amid the unsteady political thought of that day. But if so, it would have been wiser to ponder deeply the significance of the following utterances, coming from a different quarter, 
and representing a more persistent influence, a more extended geographical area, and a greater numerical force. Clement L. Vallandigham of New York said, I speak now as a Western man, and I thank the gentleman from Florida heartily for the kindly sentiments toward that great West to which he has given utterance. Most cordially, I reciprocate them, one and all. Sir, we of the Northwest have a deeper interest in the preservation of this government in its present form than any other section of the Union. Hemmed in, isolated, cut off from the seaboard upon every side, a thousand miles and more from the mouth of the Mississippi, the free navigation of which under the law of nations we demand and will have at every cost, with nothing else but our other great inland seas, the lakes and their outlet too, through a foreign country. What is to be our destiny, sir? We have 1,500 miles of southern frontier and but a little narrow strip of 80 miles or less from Virginia to Lake Erie, bounding us upon the east. Ohio is the isthmus that connects the south with the British possessions and the east with the west. The Rocky Mountains separate us from the Pacific. Where is to be our outlet? What are we to do when you shall have broken up and destroyed this government? We are seven states now, with 14 senators and 51 representatives, and a population of nine millions. We have an empire equal in area to the third of all Europe, and we do not mean to be a dependency or province either of the east or of the south, nor yet an inferior or secondary power upon this continent, and if we cannot secure a maritime boundary upon other terms, we will cleave our way to the sea coast with the sword. A nation of warriors we may be, a tribe of shepherds never. No less outspoken were the similar declarations of John A. McLernand of Illinois, who said the question of secession disclosed to his vision a boundless sea of horrors. Peaceable secession, in my judgment, is a fatal, a deadly illusion. If I am asked, why so, I retort the question, how can it be otherwise? How are questions of public debt, public archives, public lands, and other public property, and above all, the questions of boundary to be settled? Will it be replied that, while we are mutually unwilling now to yield anything, we will be mutually willing, after a while, to concede everything, that while we mutually refuse to concede anything now for the sake of national unity, we will be mutually ready to concede everything by and by for the sake of national duality. Who believes this? What, too, would be the fate of the youthful but giant Northwest in the event of a separation of the slaveholding from the non-slaveholding states? cut off from the main Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico on one hand, or from the eastern Atlantic ports on the other, she would gradually sink into a pastoral state and to a standard of national inferiority. This the hardy and adventurous millions of the Northwest should be unwilling to consent to. This they would not do. Rather would they, to the last man, perish upon the battlefield. No power on earth could restrain them from freely and unconditionally communicating with the Gulf and the Great Mart of New York. No further noteworthy discussion occurred for a time, except the declaration of Mr. Cobb of Alabama that if anything were done to save his state, it must be done immediately. The election for delegates to the convention would take place on the 24th of that month, and the convention would meet on the 7th of the next month his state would not remain in the Confederacy longer than the 15th of January unless something were done. The House refused to excuse the several objecting members from serving on the committee, and the temper in which they proceeded to the discharge of their duty is perhaps best illustrated by the remarks of Representative Reuben Davis of Mississippi. He said he could but regard this committee as a tub thrown out to the whale to amuse only until the 4 of March next, and thus arrest the present noble and manly movements of the southern states, to provide by that day for their security and safety out of the Union. With these views, I take my place on the committee for the purpose of preventing it being made a means of deception by which the public mind is to be misled and misguided. 
yet intending honestly and patriotically to entertain any fair proposition for adjustment of pending evils which the Republican members may submit. On Wednesday, December 12, the morning hour was by agreement set apart for receiving all bills and resolutions to be submitted to the Committee of 33. They were duly read and referred without debate to the number of 23. They came principally from Northern members, Though all four parties of the late presidential campaign were represented, the attitude of which they mainly reflected. In substance, therefore, they embodied the same medley of affirmations and denials, of charges and countercharges, of evasions and subterfuges, which party discussion had worn threadbare. These 23 propositions, which were by subsequent additions increased to 40 or 50, exhibit such a variety of legislative plans that it is impossible to subject them to any classification. They give us an abstract of the divergent views which members of Congress entertained concerning the cause of the crisis and its remedy. They range in purport from a mere assertion of the duty of preserving and administering the government as then existing, in its simple form and symmetrical structure, to proposals to destroy and change it to a complex machine, fantastic in proportion and impracticable in its workings. They afford us evidence of the bewilderment which beset Congress as well as the outside public, and not so much the absence of reasonable political principles as the absence of a simple and direct political will, which would resolutely insist that recognized principles and existing laws should be respected and obeyed. Among the propositions submitted then and afterwards were several wild and visionary projects of government. Thus, Mr. Jenkins, a Virginia member, proposed an arrangement requiring separate sanctions of the slaveholding interest to each and every operation of government. A dual executive, a dual senate, or dual majority of the Senate, or other advisory board or council. Mr. Noel of Missouri proposed to abolish the office of president, create an executive council of three members from districts of contiguous states, give each member the veto power, and establish equilibrium between the free and the slave states in the Senate by voluntary division of some of the slave states. Stronger minds were not entirely free from the infection of this mania for innovation and experiment. On the 13th of December, 1860, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, afterwards President of the United States, submitted to the Senate a proposal to amend the Constitution in substance as follows. That the presidential election should take place in August, that a popular plurality of, in each district should count as one vote, that Congress should count the votes on the second Monday of October, that the president chosen in 1864 be from a slaveholding state, and the vice president from a free state, and in 1868 the president be from a free state and the vice president from a slave state, and so alternating every four years, senators to be elected by vote of the people, federal judges to be divided so that one-third of the number would be chosen every fourth year, the term of office to be twelve years. Also, all vacancies to be filled, half from free and half from slave states, the territories to be divided, establishing slavery south and prohibiting it north of a fixed line, and providing that three-fifths representation and interstate slave trade shall not be changed. Perhaps the most complicated project of government was that gravely suggested in the House on the 7th of February, 1861, by Clement L. Vallandigham of Ohio, who, not content with the clogs of a dual form, proposed the following absurd quadruple machinery. The Union to be divided into four sections, North, West, Pacific, and South on demand of one-third of the senators from any section for any action to which the concurrence of the House of Representatives may be necessary, except on adjournment, a vote shall be by sections, 
and a majority of senators from each section shall be necessary to the validity of such action. A majority of all the electors in each of the four sections to be necessary to choice of president and vice president. They should hold the office six years, not to be eligible to re-election except by vote of two-thirds of the electors of each section or of the states of each section whether the choice devolved upon the legislature. Congress to provide for the election of president and vice president when electors failed. No state might secede without consent of the legislatures of all states of that section. The president to have power to adjust differences with seceding states, the terms of agreement to be submitted to Congress. Neither Congress nor territorial legislatures should have power to interfere with citizens immigrating on equal terms to the territories nor to interfere with the rights of person or property in the territory, new states to be admitted on an equal footing with old ones. The adoption of any or all of the legislative nostrums, which were severally suggested, presupposed a willingness on the part of the South to carry the matter be governed thereby. The authors of these projects lost sight of the vital difficulty that if the South refused obedience to laws in the past, she would equally refuse obedience to any in the future when they became unpalatable. It was not temporary satisfaction, but perpetual domination which she demanded. She did not need an amendment to the Fugitive Slave Act or a repeal of personal liberty bills, but a change in the public sentiment of the free states. Give her the simple affirmation that slaves are property to be recognized and protected like other property, embody the proposition uh, in the Constitution, and secure its popular acceptance, and she would snap her fingers at an enumeration of other details. Fugitive slave laws, interstate slave laws, a congressional slave code, right of transit and sojourn in the free states, compensation for runaways, new slave states, and a majority in the United States Senate would follow as inevitably as that the well-planted acorn expands by the forces of nature into roots, trunk, limbs, twigs, and foliage. This was what Jefferson Davis formulated in discussing his Senate resolutions of February 1860, and the doctrine for which Yancey rent the Charleston Convention in twain. This is what Jefferson Davis would again demand of the Senate Committee of Thirteen, and knowing the North would never concede it, he would, even prior to the demand, join in instigating and proclaiming secession. End of chapter 27. Chapter 28 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, November 2015. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 28. The Conspiracy Proclaimed. To a great majority of the people, the hopes and chances of a successful compromise seemed still cheering and propitious. There was indeed a prevailing agitation in the southern part of the Union, but it had taken a virulent form in less than half a dozen states. In most of these, a decided majority still deprecated disunion. Three of the great political parties of the country were by the voice of their leaders pledged to peace and order. The fourth, apparently controlled as yet by the powerful influences of official subordination and patronage, must, so it seemed, yield to the now expressed and public advice of the President in favor of union and the enforcement of the law, especially in view of the forbearance and kindness he was personally exercising towards the unruly elements of his faction. Throughout the northern states, the folly and evils of disunion appeared so palpable that it was not generally regarded as an imminent danger, but rather as merely a possible, though not probable, event. 
the hasty and seemingly earnest action of the people and authorities of south carolina was looked upon as a historical repetition of the nullification crisis of eighteen thirty one to thirty two and without examining too closely the real present condition of affairs men hoped rather than intelligently expected that the parallel would continue to the end some sort of compromise of the nature of that eighteen fifty was the prevailing preoccupation in politics this was the popular view of the situation but it was an erroneous view because it lacked the essential information necessary to form a correct and solid judgment the deep estrangement between the sections was imperfectly realized the existence of four parties a very unusual occurrence in american politics had seriously weakened party cohesion and more than quadrupled party prejudice and mistrust there was a strong undercurrent of conviction and purpose not expressed in speeches and platforms but the most serious ignorance was in respect to the character and fidelity of the high officers of the government of the timidity of mr buchanan of the treachery of three members of the cabinet of the exclusion of general scott from military councils of the president's refusal to send troops to anderson of his stipulation with the south carolina members of the intrigue which drove general cass from the head of the state department and from the cabinet the people at large knew nothing or so little that they could put no intelligent construction upon the events the debates of congress shed the first clear light upon the situation but the very violence and bitterness of the secession speeches caused the multitude to doubt their sincerity or placed their authors in the category of fanatics who would gain no followers while therefore the republicans in congress and in the country maintained as a rule an expectant and watchful silence the conservatives made up for the greater part of supporters of bell and everett were active in setting on foot a movement for compromise in the final success of which they had the fullest confidence and it is but justice to their integrity and ability to add that this confidence was warranted by the delusive indications of surface politics highly patriotic in purpose and prudent in act their leading men in congress had promptly opposed secession had moved a senate committee of thirteen and secured the appointment and the organization of the house committee of thirty-three already some twenty-three different propositions of adjustment had been submitted to this committee and under the circumstances it actually seemed as if only a little patience and patriotic earnestness were needed to find a compromise perhaps an amendment to the constitution which the feverish unrest and impatience of the nation would compel congress to enact or propose and the different states and sections willing or unwilling to accept and ratify superior political wisdom and more thorough information as well as a finer strategy a quicker enthusiasm and a more unremitting industry must be accorded to the conspirators who now labored night and day in the interest of disunion they discerned more clearly than their opponents the demoralization of parties at the north the latent revolutionary discontent at the south the influence of brilliant and combined leadership and the social commercial and political conditions which might be brought into action they recognized that they were but a minority a faction but they also realized that as such they had a substantial control of from six to eleven states whenever they chose to make that control effective and that for present uses at least the president was under their influence but as clay in the hands of the potter better than the republicans from the north or even the conservatives from the border states they knew that in the cotton states a widespread chance of popular sentiment was then being wrought and might very soon be complete except upon the extreme alternative of disunion the people of the border states were eager to espouse their quarrel and join them in the contest for alleged political rights nearly half the people of the north were ready to acknowledge the justness of their complaints the election of lincoln was indeed a flimsy pretext for separation but it had the merit of universal publicity and of rankling irritation among the unthinking masses of the south agriculture was depressed commerce was in panic manufacturing populations were in want the national treasury was empty the army was dispersed the navy was scattered 
the national prestige was humbled the national sentiment despondent the national faith disturbed meanwhile their intrigues had been successful beyond hope the government was publicly committed to the fatal doctrine of non-coercion and was secretly pursuing the equally fatal policy of concession reinforcements had been withheld from charleston and must from motives of consistency be withheld from all other forts and stations an unofficial stipulation with the president and a peremptory order to anderson secured beyond chance the safe and early secession of south carolina and the easy seizure of the government property the representatives of foreign governments were already secretly coquetting for the favor of a free port and an advantageous cotton market friendly voices came to the south from the north in private correspondence in the public press even in the open debates of congress promising that cities should go up in flames and the fair country be laid waste before a single northern bayonet should molest them in their meditated secession upon such a real or assumed state of facts the conspirators based their theory and risked their chances of success in dismembering the republic and it must be admitted that they chose their opportunity with a skill and foresight which for a considerable period of time gave them immense advantages over the friends of the union one vital condition of success however they strangely overlooked or rather perhaps deliberately crowded out of their problem the chance of civil war without foreign intervention for the present their whole plan depended on the assumption that they could accomplish their end by means of the single instrumentality of peaceable secession and with this view they proceeded to put their scheme into prompt execution the house committee of thirty-three had been organized by the selection of thomas corwin as its chairman and had entered hopefully upon the task confided to it a caucus of active conspirators was said to have been held the week previous to intimidate the members from the cotton states and induce them to refuse to serve on the committee but this coercive movement only partly succeeded the committee of thirty-three held a long meeting on december twelfth and now on the morning of the thirteenth was once more convened for work the informal propositions and discussions of the day previous were renewed but resulted only in calling out views and schemes too vague on the one hand and too extreme on the other the subject was about to be laid over to the following saturday when albert rust of arkansas startled the committee with the information that the extremists were obtaining signatures to a paper to announce to the south that no further concession was expected from the north and that any adjustment of pending difficulties had become impossible he therefore offered a resolution to meet this unexpected crisis but accepted the following substitute offered by william mckee dunn of indiana Quote, resolved that in the opinion of this committee the existing discontent among the southern people and the growing hostility among them to the federal government are greatly to be regretted and that whether such discontent and hostility are without just cause or not any reasonable proper and constitutional remedies and effectual guarantees of their peculiar rights and interests as recognized by the constitution necessary to preserve the peace of the country and the perpetuation of the union should be promptly and cheerfully granted End quote. other amendments were voted down and this proposition was adopted by a vote of twenty two to eight and thus in good faith a tender of reasonable concession and honorable and satisfactory compromise was made by the north to the south but the peace offering was a waste of patience and good will caucus after caucus of the secession leaders had only grown more aggressive and deepened and strengthened their inflexible purpose to push the country into disunion the presence of general scott who after a long illness had come from new york to washington on december the twelfth to give his urgent advice to the work of counteracting secession by vigorous military preparation did not disconcert or hinder the secession leaders his patriotic appeal to the secretary of war on the thirteenth naturally fell without effect upon the ears of one of their active confederates neither the temporizing concession of the president nor the conciliatory and half apologetic resolution of the committee of thirty-three for one instant changed or affected the determination to destroy the government and dissolve the union 
friday december fourteenth eighteen sixty was a day of gloom and despondency in mr buchanan's office bringing to his mind more forcibly than he had ever before realized the utter wreck into which he had guided his administration to the jubilant secessionists it was not only a day of triumph achieved but also of apparently assured successes yet to come the hitherto official organ of the administration in its issue of the following morning contained two publications which gave startling notice to the country of the weakness of the right and the strength of the wrong in the swiftly approaching struggle for national existence the first of these documents was a proclamation from the president of the united states saying that in response to numerous appeals he designated the fourth day of january proximo as a day of humiliation fasting and prayer the dangerous and distracted condition of our country was therein thus set forth. Quote, the union of the states is at the present moment threatened with alarming and immediate danger. Panic and distress of a fearful character prevail throughout the land. Our laboring population are without employment, and consequently deprived of the means of earning their bread. Indeed, hopes seem to have deserted the minds of men all classes are in a state of confusion and dismay and the wisest counsels of our best and purest men are wholly disregarded humbling ourselves before the most high let us implore him to remove from our hearts that false pride of opinion which would impel us to persevere in wrong for the sake of consistency rather than yield a just submission to the unforeseen exigencies by which we are now surrounded an omnipotent providence may overrule existing evils for permanent good End quote. the second manifesto was more practical and resolute as the first public and combined action of the conspirators it forms the hinge upon which they well nigh turned the fate of the new world republic it was a brief document but contained and expressed all the essential purposes of the conspiracy it was signed by about one-half the senators and representatives of the states of north carolina south carolina georgia alabama mississippi louisiana florida texas and arkansas it precedes every ordinance of secession and is the official beginning of the subsequent confederate states just as governor gist's october circular was the official beginning of south carolina secession Quote, Address of certain Southern members of Congress to our constituents. Washington, December 14, 1860. The argument is exhausted. All hope of relief in the Union through the agency of committees, congressional legislation, or constitutional amendments is extinguished, and we trust the South will not be deceived by appearances or the pretense of new guarantees in our judgment the republicans are resolute in the purpose to grant nothing that will or ought to satisfy the south we are satisfied the honor safety and independence of the southern people require the organization of a southern confederacy a result to be obtained only by separate state secession that the primary object of each slaveholding state ought to be its speedy and absolute separation from the union with hostile states j l pugh of alabama David Clopton of Alabama, Sydenham Moore of Alabama, J. L. M. Curry of Alabama, J. A. Stallworth of Alabama, J. W. H. Underwood of Georgia, L. J. Gartrell of Georgia, James Jackson of Georgia, John J. Jones of Georgia, Martin J. Crawford of Georgia, Alfred Iverson, U. S. Senator, Georgia, George S. Hawkins of Florida, T. C. Hindman of Arkansas, Jefferson Davis, U. S. Senator, Mississippi, A. G. Brown, U. S. Senator, Mississippi, William Barksdale of Mississippi, O. R. Singleton of Mississippi, Reuben Davis of Mississippi, Burton Cragg of North Carolina, Thomas Ruffin of North Carolina, John Slidell, U. S. Senator, Louisiana. J. P. Benjamin, U. S. Senator, Louisiana, J. P. Landrum of Louisiana, Louis T. Wigfall, U. S. Senator, Texas, John Hemphill, U. S. Senator, Texas, J. H. Reagan of Texas, M. L. Bonham of South Carolina, 
William Porcher Miles of South Carolina, John McQueen of South Carolina, John D. Ashmore of South Carolina. This proclamation of revolution, when analyzed, reveals with sufficient clearness the design and industry with which the conspirators were step by step building up their preconcerted movement of secession and rebellion. Every justifying allegation in the document was notoriously untrue. Instead of the argument being exhausted, it was scarcely begun so far from congressional or constitutional relief having been refused the southern demand for them had not been formulated not only had no committee denied hearing or action but the democratic senate at the instance of a southern state had ordered the committee of thirteen which the democratic and southern vice president had not yet even appointed and when the names were announced a week later jefferson davis one of the signers of this complaint of non-action was the only man who refused to serve on the committee a refusal he withdrew when persuaded by his co-conspirators that he could better aid their designs by accepting on the other hand the committee of thirty-three raised by the republican house appointed by a northern speaker and presided over by a northern chairman had the day before by more than a two-thirds vote distinctly tendered the southern people quote, any reasonable proper and constitutional remedies and effectual guarantees end quote outside of congressional circles there was the same absence of any new complications any new threats any new dangers from the north since the day when abraham lincoln was elected president there had been absolutely no change of word or act in the attitude and intention of himself or his followers by no possibility could they exert a particle of adverse political power executive legislative or judicial for nearly three months not only was executive authority in the hands of a democratic administration which had made itself the peculiar champion of the southern party but it had yielded every successive demand of administrative policy made by the conspirators themselves the signers of this address to their southern constituents had not one single excuse end of chapter twenty eight the conspiracy proclaimed Chapter 29 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Jay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 29. The Forty Muskets. Like the commandant, of Fort Moultrie, the other officers of the garrison keenly watched the development of hostile public sentiment and the steady progress of the secession movement. Some had their wives and families with them, and to the apprehensions for the honor of their flag and the welfare of their country was added a tenderer solicitude than even that which they felt for their own lives and persons. Hostility from the constituted authorities of South Carolina or a tumultuary outbreak of the Charleston rabble was liable to bring overwhelming numbers down upon them at any hour of the day or night. The special study of this danger, or rather of the means to meet and counteract it, fell to Captain J.G. Foster of the Engineer Corps, who had been assigned to the charge of these fortifications on the 1st of September. But his services were also in demand elsewhere, and for more than two months afterwards, the works of Baltimore appeared to have claimed the larger part of his time. On the day after the presidential election, he was directed to give the Charleston forts his personal supervision, and he arrived there on the 11th of November, remaining thenceforward till the surrender of Sumter. In time of peace, the administration of military affairs in the United States is somewhat spasmodic resulting directly and unavoidably from the fact of our maintaining only the merest skeleton of a standing army compared to the vast territorial extent of the Union. As an incident of this system, Fort Moultrie had been allowed to become defenseless. A child ten years old can easily come into the fort over the sandbanks, wrote an officer June 18, 1860, and the wall offers little or no obstacle. The ease with which the walls can now be got over without any assistance renders the place more of a trap 
in which the garrison may be shot down from the parapet than a means of defense. To persons looking on it appear strange, not to say ridiculous, that the only garrisoned fort in the harbor should be so much banked in with sand that the walls in some places are not one foot above the tops of the banks. By the 14th of November, Captain Foster had removed the sand which had drifted against the walls, repaired the ladder, and supplied certain expedients in the way of temporary obstructions and defenses which were suggested by his professional skill and available within his resources. I have made these temporary defenses as inexpensive as possible, he writes, and they consist simply of a stout board fence ten feet high, surmounted by strips filled with nail points, with a dry brick wall two bricks thick on the inside, raised to the height of a man's head, and pierced with embrasures and a sufficient number of loopholes. Their immediate construction has satisfied and gratified the commanding officer, Colonel Gardner, and they are, I think, adequate to the present wants of the garrison. Of what avail, however, all the resources of engineering, science, where forts were absolutely soldierless, and their walls without even a solitary sentinel? This was the condition of Fort Sumter and Castle Pinckney after weeks of warning and positive entreaty to the government at Washington by engineer, inspectors, and commandants alike, all without having brought one word of encouragement or a single recruit. But though the President and Secretary of War neglected their proper duty, Captain Foster did not remit his efforts. The exposed condition of these two priceless forts was the daily burden of his thoughts. Under Colonel Gardner, he had asked for 40 muskets to arm his workmen to defend Sumter. The Engineer Bureau at Washington, seconding the suggestion, had obtained the approval of the Secretary of War and had issued the order to the storekeeper of the Charleston Arsenal. But when the matter was brought to the notice of Colonel Gardner, he objected. He was unwilling that this expedient of doubtful utility at best should serve as an excuse to the Secretary of War to refuse to send him the substantial reinforcement of two regular companies and fifty drilled recruits which he had requested. It has already been stated how Colonel Gardner, instead of obtaining his reinforcements, lost his command, and as a consequence, Captain Foster's order for the forty muskets was duly put to slumber in a pigeonhole at the arsenal. When Major Anderson arrived and assumed control, he not only, as we have seen, repeated the demand for additional troops, but recognizing at a glance the immense interests at stake had himself renewed to Captain Foster the suggestion about arming some engineer workmen. Captain Foster promptly made the application to the department for permission, and soon after for arms. Permission came in due course of mail, but by this time Secretary Floyd would issue no order for the hundred muskets asked for. Nevertheless, the working party of thirty was quartered in Castle Pickney as quietly as possible, in order not to irritate the sensitive Charlestonians, and the officers and overseers in the two forts were instructed to sound and test the loyalty and trustworthiness of the mechanics and laborers. Those in Sumter had been brought from Baltimore, and in them Captain Foster placed his greatest hopes, but they disappointed him. On December 3rd, his overseer informed him that while they professed a willingness to resist a mob, they were disinclined to fight any organized volunteer force, and he was reluctantly compelled to abandon the scheme, at least as to Fort Sumter. But he still clung to the hope that the thirty men sent to Castle Pickney, having been chosen with more care, might prove of some service in the hour of need. He gave orders to his officers to resist to the utmost any demands or attempts on the works. Having done thus much, he wrote to the department, which is all I can do in this respect, I feel that I have done my duty, and that if any overt act takes place, no blame can properly attach to me. I regret, however, that sufficient soldiers are not in this harbor to garrison these two works. The government will soon have to decide the question whether to maintain them or to give them up to South Carolina. If it be decided to maintain them, troops must instantly be sent and in large numbers. 
Though neither Major Anderson nor Captain Foster could obtain any official replies to distinct and vital questions involving the issue of peace or war, a trivial episode soon furnished them a very broad hint as to what the Secretary of War would ultimately do about the forts. On the same day on which the South Carolina Secession Convention met at Columbia, the state capital, Captain Foster had occasion to go to the United States arsenal in the city of Charleston to procure some machinery used in mounting heavy guns. While there, he remembered that two ordnance sergeants, respectively in charge of Fort Sumter and Castle Pickney, had applied to him for the arms to which they were by regulations entitled. He therefore asked the military storekeeper in charge of the arsenal for two muskets and accoutrements of those two sergeants. The storekeeper replied that he had no authority for the issue of two muskets for this purpose, but that the old order for forty muskets was on file, and the muskets and accoutrements were ready packed for delivery to him. Foster received them, and after issuing two muskets to the ordnance sergeants at Fort Sumter and Castle Pinckney, placed the remainder of the magazines of those two forts. Whether the vigilance of a spy or the subservient fear or zeal of the storekeeper gave the Charleston authorities information of this trifling removal of arms cannot now be ascertained. The muskets had scarcely reached their destination when Captain Foster was astonished by receiving a letter from the military storekeeper saying that the shipment of the forty muskets had caused intense excitement, that General Schneerly, the governor's principal military officer had called upon him with a declaration that unless the excitement could be allayed, some violent demonstration would be sure to follow, that Colonel Huger had assured the governor that no arms should be removed from the arsenal. He, Captain Humphreys, had pledged his word that the forty muskets and accoutrements should be returned by tomorrow night and he therefore asked Captain Foster to make good his pledge. Captain Foster wrote a temperate reply to the storekeeper, which, in substance, he embodied in the more vigorous and outspoken report he immediately made to the Ordnance Department at Washington. I have no official knowledge or positive personal evidence either that Colonel Huger assured the governor that no arms should be removed from the arsenal, nor that, if he did so, he spoke by authority of the government. But, on the other hand, I do know that an order was given to issue to me forty muskets, that I actually needed them to protect government property and the lives of my assistants, and the ordnance sergeants under them at Fort Sumter and Castle Pinckney, and that I have them in my possession. To give them up on a demand of this kind seems to me as an act not expected of me by the government, and as almost suicidal under the circumstances. It would place the two forts under my charge at the mercy of a mob. Neither of the ordnance sergeants at Fort Sumter and Castle Pinckney had muskets until I got these, and Lieutenants Snyder and Meade were likewise totally destitute of arms. I propose to refer the matter to Washington, and am to see several gentlemen, who are prominent in this matter, tomorrow. I am not disposed to surrender these arms under a threat of this kind, especially when I know that I am only doing my duty to the government. According to his promise, Captain Foster went to the city on the 19th to hold an interview with General Schneerly and several other prominent citizens of Charleston. On the subject of the alleged intense excitement, which was again paraded as a menace to induce him to return the arms. If he was originally surprised at the reported excitement, he was now still more astonished to find that it did not exist, except in the insurrectionary zeal of those who were performing this farcical role purely for its theatrical effect. A majority of the prominent citizens who had been convoked as a part of the stage retinue to intimidate him by the threat of a mob, had not yet even heard of the affair. Detecting readily the sham and pretense of the performance, he seems to have at least accorded them the merit of an honest delusion. He quietly and politely explained to them 
the regularity of his order and proceedings, and the good faith of himself and his brother officers. But he firmly declined to return the muskets until he should be directed to do so by the government, yet willing to go to the verge of his discretion to allay irritation, he agreed to appeal immediately by telegraph to the Ordnance Bureau for a decision. He had not long to wait for a solution to the question. The government was, in all appearance, deaf to the advice of its Secretary of State, General Cass, of its General-in-Chief, Lieutenant General Scott, of its Charleston commander, Major Anderson, of its engineer, Captain Foster, so long as the problem was the safety of three great forts. But when the question became the possession of forty muskets and the arming of two ordnance sergeants, men with worsted epaulots on their shoulders and stripes down their pantaloons, in the language of the Secretary of War, that eminent functionary could sacrifice his rest and slumber to the crisis. Captain Foster, who had returned from the city to Fort Moultrie, was awakened a little after midnight to receive the following peremptory instruction. I have just received a telegraphic dispatch informing me that you have removed 40 muskets from Charleston Arsenal to Fort Moultrie. If you have removed any arms, return them instantly. John B. Floyd, Secretary of War. It was probably in no hopeful mood, nor with enviable feelings, that this brave officer returned by telegraph the strict, routine answer of a loyal subordinate. I received 40 muskets from the arsenal on the 17th. I shall return them in obedience to your order. The necessary consequence he embodied in his report to the department on the next day. The order of the Secretary of War of last night I must consider as decisive upon the question of any efforts on my part to defend Fort Sumter and Castle Pinckney. The defense now can only extend to keeping the gates closed and shutters fastened, and must cease when these are forced. End of chapter 29, recorded by Sheila Blunt. End of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John Jay.